Preface of Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burden. Preface. An interest in history and a love of historical reading will be mostly readily acquired by those children who approach this rich field of literature through the medium of stories of the great figures of the past. Such stories, if properly selected and told, give children those vivid concrete pictures of men and of events which are vitally essential to any real understanding of bygone days. At the same time, such history stories may be so selected as to hold up bright ideals of conduct and of character moreover by their appeal to the emotions which lie very near to the springs of conduct they move to action tales of gentleness of honor of justice of courage of fortitude in suffering of intrepidity in danger of dauntless resolution of iron will inspire children to an emulation of those virtues these hero tales from history have been written in the faith set forth in this paragraph through these stories the author aims to inculcate the fundamental virtues just named, and at the same time to acquaint children with the names and achievements of some of those great men and women whose lives and characters are a part of our racial and national inheritance. In the selection of the tales in this book, the author has drawn upon all ages. Here are mighty men of the ancient world and makers of modern America. Some of the characters chosen as the heroes of these stories are great figures in world history, but the greater part of them were selected because they are among the foremost heroes of our own country and of our own culture. Of course, in a book of this size, many valuable stories had to be omitted, but it is believed that all the tales included are typical and representative. These hero tales are not biographies of the men about whom they are told, neither has any attempt been made to join them into a connected historical narrative. They are just stories from the past, told with constant thought of the stage of mental development of the children for whom they are intended. Each story has a hero, each is full of action, and the author has tried to tell each one in clear and simple language. The author has also tried to make each story teach its intended lesson without any moralizing on his part. The history of the past can never become a vital thing to us until the men of the past are live flesh and blood men. It is the author's hope that these hero tales from history will help to make threescore great figures from our past something more than names to the children who may enjoy this book. Smith Burden End of Preface Chapter One of Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burden. Moses, the Greatest Lawgiver and the Meekest Man. Long ago in the land of Egypt, there lived as slaves to the Egyptians, a race of white people called the Hebrews. There were so many of them that the Egyptians began to be afraid that they would overrun the land. So the cruel king, or the Pharaoh, as he was called, commanded that all the baby boys of the slave race should be thrown into the river Nile. But one little child escaped this fate, for his poor slave mother disobeyed the king and hid her baby in the hut. When he was three months old, his mother was afraid she could not keep him quiet any longer. So she made a basket and plastered it inside with pitch so that it would be watertight and float like a boat. Into this basket boat she put her baby. The mother set the strange little boat on the edge of the river Nile, among the tall reeds called bulrushes, very near the palace where she knew the king's daughter came every day to bathe. It was a cool spot well guarded and safe from the terrible crocodiles that lived in the Nile. After making sure that the little boat would not sink, the mother went back to her work, leaving her daughter Miriam to see what became of her baby brother. Just as the wise mother had planned, the princess soon came with her ladies in waiting, and spied the cradle-basket rocking on the waves near the shore. 
she told one of her maidens to bring it to her the king's daughter knew too well of her father's command to drown or kill all the boy babies of the hebrew slaves so when she found a baby crying there she pitied the poor mother who had obeyed the king by putting him in the river still fondly hoping to save his life when the pharaoh's daughter saw the babe she said this is one of the hebrews children there was a pleading look in the face of the little child he seemed to ask the princess to take him in her arms the princess herself was married but she had no children that baby smiling through his tears touched her mother heart how could she help saving this little life from her father's cruel law by claiming him as her own just then sister miriam bowed before the princess and said shall i go and call to thee a nurse of the hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee the king's daughter was pleased pleased and said yes go so the happy sister ran and brought her mother to the great stone palace of the pharaohs then the princess said as if the mother were only a child's nurse take this child away and nurse it for me and i will give thee thy wages so besides saving his life that mother was royally paid for taking care of her own son instead of working as a slave out in the hot sun besides she had a good chance to tell him as he grew up of the one true god what if her boy should save his father's people from slavery when he became a man in the palace of the pharaohs in due time the daughter of the king adopted the young hebrew as her own son and named him moses which means saved because she had rescued him out of the river when moses was old enough he went to live with his royal mother where he was educated in all the wisdom of the egyptians who at that time nearly four thousand years ago were the most learned people in the world although he studied in the college of the priests who believed in the sun and moon and many other gods moses never forgot what his mother had taught him about the true god young prince moses had a great deal to do while he was growing to manhood he is said to have become commander-in-chief of the egyptian army that conquered the black and savage race living a thousand miles up the nile in the bible story are these words and it came to pass in those days when moses was grown that he went out into the brethren and looked on their burdens and he spied an egyptian smiting an hebrew one of his brethren and he looked this way and that way and when he saw there was no man he slew the egyptian and hid him in the sand now when pharaoh heard this he sought to slay moses but moses fled from the face of pharaoh and dwelt in the land of midian this pharaoh was not the father of moses foster mother who was now dead it is said that this king was afraid moses would drive him from the throne and become pharaoh himself for forty long years the exiled prince lived in midian studying planning and writing it was during this time that he made the great decision of his life he resolved to save his own people the million hebrews who were slaves to the egyptians at last moses and his brother aaron appeared before the pharaoh and announced that god had demanded that the king should let the children of israel go free it was a hard thing to ask for the egyptians still needed the great army of slave men to build great pyramids and temples the king refused and consented and refused again until plague after plague was sent upon the land of egypt at last when the king's son and the oldest child of every egyptian family in the whole country had died in one night the terrified and heartbroken king called for moses and aaron by night and said rise up and get you forth from among my people both ye and the children of israel and go and the people took up their dough before it was leavened their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders this going out of the hebrew people bound for the promised land nearly four thousand years ago is called the exodus to this day it is celebrated by the jews every year as the passover when the pharaoh realized that the great stone temples and pyramids of egypt might never be finished he was afraid because he had let the slave people go so he ordered out his horses and chariots and drove hard after them till he caught them in camp beside the red sea the frightened hebrews began to cry and accused moses of deceiving them and leading them out into a great trap to be killed like a million helpless sheep by pharaoh's army but moses told the wailing crowds not to be afraid 
before the king's horses and men caught up with them a strong east wind came up and kept the tide from running in thus leaving a bare sandbar right in front of them across the arm of the red sea moses commanded the people to march over as on dry land an order which they lost no time in obeying then the pharaoh and his horsemen came up behind and drove harder after them upon the sandbar but the heavy chariot stuck in the mud beneath the sand and when the egyptians reached the middle the wind changed and the tide which had been held back so long rushed in and drowned pharaoh and his army then miriam and moses and aaron led these million freed slaves in a grand victory course of song about their hairbreadth escape but the people were always scolding and complaining against moses the dear gentle leader who had saved them from their cruel bondage it was his patient love for his thankless people while through forty years they wandered in the wilderness that gave moses the name of being the meekest man that ever lived at mount sinai moses received from god and gave to the people the ten commandments written on two tablets of stone he spent his time during the long years of wandering in the wilderness in planning the laws and religion for his beloved people he himself never entered the promised land but died in the wilderness somewhere on a mountain called nebo the bible makes this statement of his death so moses the servant of the lord died there and he buried him in a valley but no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day End of chapter 1chapter two of hero tales from history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson hero tales from history by smith burnham david the giant killer king nearly three thousand years ago a bright handsome hebrew lad was playing a harp while watching his father's sheep on the hills of bethlehem one dark night there was a great stir among the sheep and david saw a bear making off with one of the lambs there were no guns in those days but david had a sling and he could fling a pebble almost as swift and straight as a boy can shoot a bullet today so david ran and killed the bear by driving a stone through the big brute's eye into its brain when he took the trembling lamb back to its mother what should he see but a lion starting off with a sheep in his huge jaws there was no time to gather pebbles grabbing a jagged rock in one hand david seized the great beast by the mane with the other and aimed quick blows at the lion's eyes breaking his skull before the lion could drop his prey and fight back that was a great night's work for one lone lad after quieting his frightened flock david took his harp and made up a song of thanks to the god of israel for saving him alive from the jaws of the lion and the paws of the bear not long after this david's old father sent out to the hills for him when the youth came down to the house he found samuel prophet of god and judge of israel waiting for him david's seven older brothers stood around eyeing him strangely as the prophet said this is he and baptized him by pouring oil on his head what did the prophet anoint me for david asked his father to be king of israel instead of saul but i am only a boy and king saul is so big and strong head and shoulders taller than other men why did not the prophet anoint our iliab he is almost as tall as the king himself the lord seeth not as man seeth for man looketh on the outward appearance but the lord looketh on the heart after that david went back and herded his father's sheep but his brothers were jealous of him because he had been anointed to be king as had often happened in the days of the judges the heathen philistines came up and made war against the people of israel and the eldest three of david's brothers were in the king's army many weeks went by but no word came from the camp so the father sent david down with provisions for the brothers and a present for their captain the shepherd boy found the two armies in camps opposite each other across a narrow valley every one was excited over goliath a giant who came down every day into the valley from the army of the philistines and challenged the king of israel and all his men goliath was nearly eleven feet tall he wore a bronze helmet about as big as a bushel measure 
and his spear was like a weaver's beam. Even King Saul and David's tall brother Eliab were much too small to fight with the Philistine giant. David could not bear to hear Goliath calling the king and his soldiers cowards and repeating wicked words about the God of Israel. So he went and told Saul he would like the chance to go down and fight the insulting giant. The soldiers laughed at this, and Eliab told his young brother to go home and mind his few sheep in the wilderness. But David would not be put off. He told how God had helped him kill a lion and a bear in one night. The lad was so earnest that the king consented to let him try. The only weapon David took were his staff and his sling. On his way to meet the giant, he stopped at the brook and picked up five smooth pebbles. Both armies looked on breathless at the strange combat. Great Goliath laughed at little David, as if the king of Israel were playing a joke on him. He cursed David by all the gods of the Philistines and yelled, Am I a dog that thou shouldst come to fight me with a stick? For this I will feed thy little carcass to the birds. Then David shouted back to Goliath, I come in the name of the God of Israel, whom thou hast defied. All the Israelites and Philistines saw the boy make a quick motion with his sling, and heard a thud. The giant dropped his heavy spear, threw up his huge hands, and fell with a groan and a great clatter of armor, face downward on the ground. David's first pebble had done the work. It had gone swift and straight through the eye hole in Goliath's brass helmet, and sunk deep into his low, brutal forehead, killing him almost instantly. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they arose and fled. The children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled or looted their tents. King Saul was so thankful that his own life had been saved, that the people were spared from being slaves to the Philistines, that he made David come and live in his palace as a younger brother to his son Jonathan. This prince was not jealous like David's own brothers. David and Jonathan became such good friends that though this happened nearly 3,000 years ago, people say yet that two boys or men who are very friendly with each other are like David and Jonathan. After a time, Saul and Jonathan were both killed in a battle with the Philistines. Then David became king of Israel. He proved to be one of the best rulers. He wrote many of the Bible Psalms and played his harp as he sang them, he planned to build a great house of worship for the God of Israel in Jerusalem. But because he had been a man of war, he felt unworthy to do such sacred work. So he left the temple to be built by his son Solomon, the wisest king that ever ruled over Israel. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Hero Tales from History this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Watson. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Homer, the Hero Poet of Ancient Greece. Long, long ago, when the world was young, and before men began to write books, a kind of men called bards used to wander about the land of Greece from town to town and from court to court, playing the harp and singing of the deeds of the heroes of Greece. As years went on, there came to be very many such tales sung by the bards and handed down from father to son. At last there came a day when men learned to write. Then the person whom we call Homer, the earliest and greatest poet in the history of the world, gathered together these hero tales and wrote them in beautiful poetry. This work of collecting these scattered stories of the exploits and adventures of the Greek gods and heroes and making them into one great hero poem called an epic was done nearly 3,000 years ago. Although nobody really knows anything surely about the life of this ancient Homer, the story goes that he was blind and that he was very poor as poets often are. After his death, when his two great poems had made him famous, seven different cities in Greece claimed each to have been his home. But the facts of his life matter very little when compared with the wonderful stories that he left for all the world to read. 
His epics were imitated by the greatest poets of Rome, Italy, and England, and have been translated many times into both poetry and prose. There were two of these epics, the Iliad, picturing the siege and downfall of ancient Ilium, or Troy, and the Odyssey, describing the ten years' wandering of Odysseus, or Ulysses, on his way back home after the destroying of Troy by the Greeks. The war against Troy, which lasted ten years, was started because Paris, son of Priam, the old king of Troy, carried off from her home Helen, the lovely wife of one of the Grecian kings. The Iliad tells of the bold deeds of many heroes on both sides. The strongest fighter in Troy was Hector, another son of King Priam. Achilles was the greatest hero on the side of the Greeks. One of the most beautiful scenes in art as well as in poetry is that of Hector saying goodbye to his wife and baby boy, and one of the best-known examples of friendship is that of Achilles for his friend Patroclus. The great gods and goddesses, for the early Greeks believed in many gods, all took sides in the struggle for Troy. Apollo, Minerva, and Juno helped the Greeks. Mars and Venus helped the Trojans. They chose the side of the people who had especially served and worshipped them, using their mighty power to help and direct in the long war. After nine years, the Greeks pretended that they were going to give up the struggle and sail away to their homes. They built a huge wooden horse to leave as a peace offering, telling the Trojans that it was a gift for them to offer to their gods. The Trojans were only too willing to think that the Greeks were giving up the fight, they would not listen to the princess Cassandra, who warned them of danger, saying, I fear the Greeks, even when they bring gifts. In spite of her words, the city fathers accepted the strange present and trundled the big horse within their walls. That night, some Greek soldiers, who were hidden inside the hollow wooden figure, jumped out of their hiding place, opened the six gates of Troy, and led in the Grecian army. The great warriors waiting outside swarmed in and soon captured the city. Helen, the stolen queen, sailed back home and lived there in her little Grecian kingdom for many years after her rescue by her royal husband and his brother, another king, with the help of the Greek heroes and the gods who sided with them. Among the Greeks who fought at Troy was Ulysses. His journeyings on the way from Troy to Ithaca the rocky island where he was king, form a wonder story of ancient life and travel. Ulysses' ships were driven about to many strange places. First he came to the land of the lotus eaters, where some of his men ate the lotus flowers and forgot their homes and friends. The rest of them came next to the country of the Cyclops, giant monsters with only one eye in the middle of their foreheads. The chief Cyclops caught the Greeks, shut them up in the cave where he kept his sheep, and ate two of them for his supper every day. Ulysses was clever enough to think of a way by which he and his men might escape. While the giant was out of his cave, he sharpened a stake by burning it in the coals, and when the Cyclops fell asleep after his hearty supper, Ulysses and four of his men drove this sharp stake into his one eye, blinding him. Then the leader tied each of his men under one of the cyclops' sheep and himself clung to the long hair beneath the largest ram. When the sheep crowded out of the cave, the giant did not know that they were carrying his prisoners with them. Before he discovered the trick, the Greeks were safe on their ship. After another voyage, Ulysses and his men landed on the island of Circe, a beautiful witch who turned the men all into swine and made them stay with her a long time. But Apollo and Minerva helped Ulysses undo the spell of the charmer. Circe warned Ulysses against the sirens, who would tempt them by their singing only to destroy them all, and against Scylla and Charybdis, a risky place for a ship to pass between a great rock and a dangerous whirlpool. The wife of Ulysses also was beset with many trials and dangers. She was surrounded by neighboring princes, each of whom wished to marry her and become king of Ithaca. She kept on with her weaving, putting these suitors off by telling them she would give them her answer when she finished her weaving, 
but each night she unraveled all the weaving she had done in the daytime. During the twenty long years of Ulysses' absence, Penelope's young son grew to manhood and started out to find his father. He reached home after a vain search, just at the time when Ulysses came back. The king of Ithaca was disguised by the goddess Minerva as an old beggar, so that no one recognized him but his good old dog. Ulysses arrived at his palace at the very moment when, the suitors having become too urgent, Penelope brought out Ulysses' bow and agreed to marry the man who could bend it and shoot an arrow through six rings placed in a long line, as her heroic husband had been known to do. The feeble-looking beggar was allowed to look on, while the princess tried frantically to win the hand and the throne of the fair Penelope. One after another failed in the desperate attempt. Then the seemingly aged stranger asked them to let him try to bend the great stiff bow and shoot the heavy arrow. They laughed at and insulted him, but he took the bow, bent it with ease, and shot the long arrow straight through all the rings, just as Ulysses used to do. Penelope gave a cry of joy, for she knew then that the stranger was none other than her long-lost husband. Ulysses's disguise suddenly disappeared, and with his son's aid he shot the impudent suitors who had tormented his wife all those years. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Hero Tales from History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4 Socrates, the Grand Old Man of Greece Socrates was the son of a sculptor of Athens in the days of Pericles, a ruler who encouraged art and culture and made his city famous for its learning and beauty. As a boy, Socrates was taught by his father to carve statues. Nearly a thousand years afterward, a traveler in Greece described a group of figures called the Graces, carved by the youthful Socrates. But the young man was not satisfied with being a sculptor. While he was working at his carving, his active mind kept trying to find out the reason for everything. In Athens at this time, there were not only many painters and sculptors, but numbers of men called philosophers, who gave all their time to thinking out the meaning of what they saw in the world around them, and trying to teach that meaning to such people as would listen to them. These philosophers differed widely from one another in their views. Some of the things they thought would seem very queer to us today, but they were doing their best to find out the truth. A group of philosophers who held the same views was called a school. The schools of philosophy were not like the schools of today. They were simply gathering places in someone's house or on a street corner or in a public porch or in a grove where men who liked to think came together for talk and debate. Instead of children sitting quietly at desks, a school was made up of grown men walking about and talking a great deal. Socrates found that he was much more interested in listening to what the philosophers thought than he was in carving statues. So he gave up his work with his father and went out to visit the schools. But as he went from one school to another, he could see that no one of them was right in every way. He decided that he could not learn the real truth from them. So he resolved to walk the streets and ask questions of the people he met there. He was so anxious to know that he could learn from anyone he talked with, whether man, woman, or child. He met many men who thought they were philosophers when they were not, for it was considered a great thing to be known as a famous thinker, and all men aimed at it. When Socrates met a man who claimed to be wise, he would ask questions as if he himself did not know anything and he would thus lead on from one thing to another, till sometimes he made the man say the very opposite of what he had said before, making him ashamed of himself. This way of drawing out the truth by questions and proving the wrongness of some ways of reasoning is known today as the Socratic method. The Greeks were great believers in beauty. They thought whatever is beautiful must be right. But Socrates saw handsome men and beautiful women leading wrong lives and he made such people angry by saying so. Socrates himself was far from handsome. He was short and thick-set. His head was bald, and his eyes bulged out in a comical way. His nose was broad and flat, 
His lips were thick, and his ears stood out, making him look like the clowns the Greeks laughed at in their great outdoor theaters. More than this, Socrates was poor. He had learned, while a young man, that those who had most of the so-called good things of life were the most unhappy. So he made up his mind that the best kind of wealth lay in not wanting much. He did not care for good things to eat. He went barefoot and wore the same thin garment both summer and winter. The Greeks were fond of art for the sake of art, but Socrates believed in right living and loved art only for heart's sake, for the sake of doing good and making people happy. He also believed that to know is to live, and that in order to live right one must first know what is right. He claimed to have a certain force or voice within which showed him what was right. He was the first of all the wise men of the heathen world to believe that this inner light should be a correct moral guide to right living. Even the gods the Greeks worshipped did things of the worst kind. They were spiteful, cruel, and wicked. So the people did not think it wrong to act as their gods did. They did not understand what Socrates meant when he said he had a voice within himself which told him what he should or should not do. So they thought he was trying to make them believe in a strange god when they had too many already. Socrates was a great lover of his country. When the Greeks went to war, he went in the ranks as a private soldier and fought like a hero. In one battle, he saved the life of a rich, handsome, brilliant young man who was very popular in Athens. This youth soon learned to love the homely old philosopher and studied with him. Two other great men were pupils of Socrates. One of these became one of the greatest historians and the other a great philosopher. They were both authors, and they wrote all that is known today about Socrates, who did not leave any writings to show what he believed and taught. Of course, most people failed to understand Socrates, and so they made him the laughing stock of the town. Yet many young men, led by the youth whose lives Socrates had saved, came to him to learn how to live and be useful and happy. But the people who were jealous of his influence over the young men of the city accused the old philosopher of teaching them of other gods and thus corrupting their minds. They had him arrested, but his students followed him to the prison, where he kept on teaching them the right way to live. Socrates was tried by a law court of citizen judges and defended himself very ably. The story of his bold defense is told in a book called The Apology of Socrates by a famous Greek writer named Plato. He spoke of his aim to show people how little they knew so that they might learn more, and told his judges that he intended to go on in the same way if they spared his life. He was condemned to die, however, and thirty days after the trial they gave him a cup of poison called hemlock to drink. After he had taken this, he went on talking to his students of the hope of a happier life beyond the grave. This was four hundred years before the birth of Christ. Socrates came nearer the Christian belief than any other philosopher of that ancient time who had no knowledge of the Bible and its teachings. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Hero Tales from History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Watson. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Alexander, the Boy Who Conquered the World Alexander was the son of Philip, king of Macedon, a country to the north of Greece. His father was a great general as well as a king. Young Alexander was a strong, active, handsome lad. A story is told of his breaking a wild horse which had been presented to Philip by a neighboring king. This horse was named Bucephalus, the Greek word for bull-headed. He reared, bit, snorted, and pawed the air if anyone tried to mount him. King Philip was indignant at being given such a present, and was about to send back the bull-headed beast as too dangerous to the life or limb of anyone who attempted to ride him. But Alexander noticed that the horse was frightened even at his own shadow. He begged his father to let him conquer such a splendid animal. The lad was so much in earnest that the king decided to let him try. The young prince showed no fear as he walked up beside Bucephalus and patted him on the neck. 
He wanted to keep the horse from being frightened, as his fright was the cause of his wildness. By degrees, the boy managed to turn the great brute's head toward the sun so that he could not see his shadow. Throwing off his velvet mantle, Alexander suddenly sprang on the horse's back. Instead of trying to restrain or guide the frightened steed, the boy let him go as fast as he would across the plain. When Bucephalus grew tired, the shrewd rider began to turn his head this way and that, while speaking kindly and patting him soothingly. When they returned from their long run, Bucephalus obeyed the prince's word and touch as a gentle, well-trained horse should. It is said that the huge beast learned to kneel for Prince Alexander to mount, and that he carried his young master proudly through many a battle. The king was so pleased with the courage and wisdom Alexander displayed in conquering Bucephalus that he said to his son, You should have a larger kingdom than Macedon to rule. As if to fulfill this wish, Philip went to war with several of the neighboring kings and left his sixteen-year-old son to rule over Macedon while he was absent. Then Alexander was allowed to command certain companies of the Macedonian army, and this he showed wonderful courage and wisdom. Philip was murdered when Alexander was twenty. Then the kings whom the father had conquered tried to throw off the rule of Macedon. They said, This new king is only a boy. But Alexander answered when he heard it, They think I am a boy. I will show them that I am a man. And he did, not only by defeating the kings and armies his father had beaten, but by conquering the other states around Macedon, whose kings had turned in to help Alexander's enemies. At this time, the greatest monarch in Asia was Darius, king of the Persians. He sent several nobles of his realm to seek the friendship of Alexander, king of Macedon. These men were surprised when they saw that the young ruler was not interested in their stories of the wealth and splendor of the vast countries of Darius. Instead, Alexander wished to hear about the extent of their kingdom, about its different peoples, and about the location of the rivers, roads, and cities. The men from Persia said to members of the court of Macedon, Our old king is rich, but your young king is great. Alexander, both king and general, had a strange thirst for power. He left a true friend to control his kingdom in Europe and started east, with only a small army, to conquer the vast countries on the continent of Asia. King Darius laughed at the very idea of a mere boy with so few soldiers coming to conquer him and the greatest and richest empire in the world. He came to meet the Macedonian army with an armed host about ten times as large as Alexander's. That boy soon routed and scattered the hosts of the Persians, and King Darius had to fly for his life, leaving his wife and her mother behind as Alexander's prisoners. The young conqueror was kind to these and to all other prisoners of war. This was wholly different from the custom then, for ancient conquerors killed or made slaves of those whom they defeated in battle. Alexander gained two great victories over Darius and captured other kingdoms and walled cities after long sieges and hard-fought battles. While in Asia, he came to a temple where there was a puzzle which no one had solved. This was a strange knot in a long leather strip. This knot, it had been prophesied for centuries, could never be undone except by the one who was to conquer Asia. Alexander felt that he must unloose this terrible tangle in some way or other. So when he was brought into the temple, which was at a place named Gordium, he took his sword and cut the strangely knotted thong in pieces. Ever since then, when anyone meets and solves in a surprising way what seems to be an impossible problem, he is said to have cut the Gordian knot, as Alexander did in the temple at Gordium. The young conqueror marched down into Africa and not only took possession of Egypt, the greatest kingdom of that vast region, but built near one of the mouths of the wide river Nile, a city to which he gave his own name. That city, Alexandria, is still one of the largest cities on the continent of Africa. It became necessary for Alexander to lead his army farther eastward into Asia. After his great successes, he began to indulge his appetites in eating and drinking and in other harmful ways. Once, in a fit of drunken anger, he killed his best friend. This made him ashamed and sad when he came to himself and realized what he had done. Because of his many victories, Alexander is called the Great. When he was only twenty-six, he had conquered all the important nations in the world of his day. 
It was because he had now nothing to strive after that he gave way to evil passions. He is said to have wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. He became ill and died as a result of his excesses, leaving no child or relative to rule over the great kingdoms he had acquired. Although Alexander the Great had conquered the world, he could not govern himself. Hundreds of years before his day, Solomon, the wise, rich king, wrote in his Proverbs, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Watson. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Four Familiar Sayings of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was born at Rome more than 2,000 years ago, about 100 years before Christ. His family belonged to a noble clan of the patricians. The people of Rome were divided into three classes. Of these, the patricians were highest in rank and fewest in number. There were many more in the middle class, which at that time was largely made up of free men who could vote and hold office. The lowest class, and by far the largest number, were the slaves. More than half of the Roman slaves were white, many having blonde hair and blue eyes. These had been brought as captives from the northern countries and sold in Rome. Some of the slaves, especially those who came from the Greek lands in the east, were more refined than the ignorant, brutal Roman masters for whom they had to do the hardest and dirtiest kinds of work. Worse than this, the Roman law allowed cruel masters to whip, torture, and even kill these educated men and women. By right of the might of her wonderful armies, Rome made herself mistress of the world. So the patricians and the freemen looked with contempt upon other nations and said to themselves, To be a Roman is greater than to be a king. The patricians were the proudest Romans, and the Caesars were among the haughtiest patricians. Their family belonged to the rich, ruling class when little Julius was born. Of course, there was no such thing as the Christian religion in Julius Caesar's day. The only believers in the one true God were the Jews, who lived in the little, far-off country now called the Holy Land. The best educated Romans believed in Jupiter, Juno, Apollo, Venus, and many other deities who, they imagined, were ruling over them and who were as selfish and cruel as the Romans themselves. There were no public schools for children in Rome. Instead of millions of printed books, there were a few rolls of parchment on which Latin words were printed very slowly by hand. Instead of using paper to write on, the Romans scratched their letters and messages on tablets of wax with large needles. As there were no newspapers then, the people learned what was going on in the world by word of mouth from speakers in the forum, an open city square with a stone platform around which crowded thousands of listeners. The highest ambition of the youthful Julius Caesar was to speak well to the people in the forum and to win their friendship. He grew to be a tall, handsome, brilliant young man. He was not rich, and while his friends led lives of ease and pleasure, this young Caesar studied hard. He learned to read and speak Greek, because then the greatest poems, orations, and plays were in that language. He traveled thousands of miles to Greece and Asia Minor to learn to be a good speaker and writer, and though he was a patrician, his real sympathy lay with the poor and the middle class, whose side he took almost from boyhood. The Romans governed themselves, in some ways, as the people of the United States do today. That is, their consuls, or governors, were elected by the patricians and the free men. Sometimes the patricians were in power, at other times the people of the middle class succeeded in electing their leaders, but in those cruel times the winning party sometimes killed the chiefs on the other side and treated them all as if they were enemies at war. The uncle of Julius Caesar had been one of the chiefs overthrown in such a civil war, and the young man inherited his uncle's love for the cause of the common people. The first deed of Caesar that brought him into public notice took place while he was traveling in the east. A crew of pirates, or sea robbers, captured him and held him prisoner until a large sum of money, or a ransom, should be paid. 
Julius Caesar succeeded in raising the amount and paid it to them to set him free. But before he left the pirates, he told them that if he ever caught them, he would have his revenge. Then he went and collected men and ships, caught his former captors, won back his ransom money, and ordered the ringleaders crucified. Crucifixion was the Roman penalty for pirates and other thieves. From the time Julius Caesar was thirty years old, he was constantly in one office or another in the Roman Republic. One early position was that of director of shows and sports. The Romans had theaters, with seats of stone rising one behind another from the central space, like the seats in a circus or college stadium. Here, thousands of people could see and hear actors, poets, orators, and debaters. One of these theaters was so large that 80,000 people could witness the games at one time. Instead of football and baseball, the Romans had running races and wrestling matches by athletes and fighters who came from all parts of the world. Most of them were slaves. Among them were men called gladiators, who fought each other with swords until one or the other was killed. The cruel Romans liked this part of the sport best. Julius Caesar provided such splendid shows and games that he made himself very popular with the people. He was elected to one office after another, and finally, after being sent as a kind of governor to Spain, was chosen one of the two consuls. The office of consul was the highest in Rome and was somewhat similar to our president. When his term expired, Caesar was made governor over the Gauls, a half-savage people who lived in the country that is now northern Italy, Switzerland, and France. During the nine years while Caesar was in Gaul, he had to fight many battles and conquer many dangerous tribes. Besides that, he crossed to the island of Britain, now called England. But Caesar was kind to his enemies and prisoners. His journal, which tells of his wars in Gaul, is read today as one of the simplest and best books ever written. His wonderful victories and great kindnesses made Caesar the idol of the people. But he had enemies at home and a rival, another great general named Pompey. The Senate were on the side of Pompey, and at last they decreed that if Caesar did not give up his command and dismiss his army by a certain day, he would be called an enemy of the country. Pompey and the Senate were against the poorer classes, and Caesar knew that if he yielded to this command, the common people, whose friend he was, would lose their freedom. So instead of disbanding his army, he marched it to the borders of Italy. He stopped on the bank of a little river called the Rubicon. Anyone who crossed that river with an army was considered an enemy of Rome. When Caesar decided to cross the river and advance with his army against the city, he exclaimed, the die is cast. His words meant that he could no more go back than a die, once thrown out of the dice box, can be taken back. Nowadays, when a man decides to do something which may bring great loss to him if he does not win, and from which he cannot draw back once he has begun, he is said to have crossed the Rubicon. Caesar's fortunes, however, did not desert him, and he succeeded in driving Pompey away and finally conquering him. Within three years, after many victorious battles in Greece and Egypt and Asia Minor, he returned to Rome in triumph. By this time, the Senate were willing to do anything for him that he wanted, and the adoring people chose him dictator for ten years. That meant that although he was not called king, he had almost the same power as a king. Two of Caesar's sayings are often quoted. Once when he was pursuing Pompey, he started on a voyage when a storm seemed to be coming up. The sailors were afraid to cross the sea, but he said to them, You carry Caesar and his fortunes. They set sail at once and reached the other side in safety. At another time he caught an escaping army in Asia. He announced this victory in three words, Vene, Vide, Vici, the meaning of which was, I came, I saw, I conquered. By his policy of kindness to the people as dictator, Caesar so won their love that they came even to worship him as one of their gods. The month and the year in which he was born was at this time named in his honor, for our word July is a shortened form of Julius. He governed Rome well and made many useful changes. One thing that he did was to arrange the calendar, which before this time was very clumsy. It was he who divided the year into months of so many days each, very much as it is divided now. The climax of Caesar's popularity was reached when he was offered a crown to show that the people of Rome wished him to be their king. 
He refused this honor three times in public. But not all the men of Rome shared in this admiration of Caesar, for one party, some of whom had been his friends, felt that his growing power was not good for Rome. They wanted their country to be a republic and not to be ruled by a king, so they began to plot against Caesar. On the 15th of March, 44 BC, just as Caesar was about to take his seat in the presence of the Roman Senate, a group of men gathered round and began plunging their daggers into his body. Among them was Marcus Brutus, for whom Caesar had done many kindnesses. When Caesar saw Brutus with his dagger raised to stab him to the heart, he exclaimed with a sad smile, And thou too, Brutus? Then, covering his face with his mantle, he fell down and died. Of the twenty-three knife wounds that were found in Caesar's body, Shakespeare wrote that the stab of Brutus was the most unkindest cut of all. Although Caesar was murdered to keep him from bearing the name of king, the mightiest monarchs of modern times took the name of Caesar as the highest title a king could have, as the Kaiser of Germany and the Tsar of Russia. When these two recent Caesars were put down, there remained no ruler in Europe who believed in governing by the cruel Roman law that might makes right. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Watson. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. The Christmas Crowning of Charlemagne. About twelve hundred years ago, thousands of Saracens, who were among the followers of Mohammed, crossed the narrow strait from Africa into Spain. The world was then coming out of those centuries of ignorance and fear which are known as the Dark Ages. The dark-skinned people, Arabs and Africans, who followed Mohammed, went about converting people by making them prostrate themselves with their faces turned toward the east and repeat the Mohammedan creed. Those who refused to bow down and repeat this creed were killed. Of course, everyone was very much afraid of missionaries who used such methods as these, and large parts of Asia and Africa had come under Mohammedan control. When they reached the shores of Spain, they thought they were going to convert and conquer Europe, too. The Saracens marched north through Spain and into the country of the Franks, whose great-great-great-grandchildren are the French people of today. Here the victory of the invaders ceased to be so easy for they were met by a certain Duke Charles, who beat them in a great battle near Tours and drove them back. For his bravery in saving Europe from these dark-skinned enemies, Duke Charles was named Martel, the Frank's word for hammer. Charles the Hammer had a son, Pepin, who was called the Short because he was not a tall man, but though he was small, Pepin had a big brave heart. He fought for his country against the Lombards, a savage people in North Italy, and he was rewarded for his valor and success by being made king of the Franks. When Pepin was crowned by the Pope, he had a son, Charles, twelve years old. This Charles was so ambitious that, even while a boy, he began to dream of conquering other nations and becoming king not only of France but of other lands as well. All through his boyhood he dreamed of what he would do if he were king. It was not many years after his father's death, when he became king, in fact, before Charles Martel's grandson had conquered so many nations in the south and so many savage tribes in the north of Europe that he became a king of kings or emperor and received the title of Charlemagne, which means Charles the Great. Perhaps the best thing that Charlemagne ever did was to keep Alcuin, a scholar from Britain, at his court as a trusted friend and teacher. In those days, such men in other kings' palaces were merely chaplains or religious teachers, but Alcuin taught the king, the queen, and the princes grammar, spelling, arithmetic, and other common branches. This palace school proved to be such a good thing that the emperor ordered that not only any child of a nobleman but even of the poorest peasant could come to it if the boy showed talent for learning. The books in the palace school were printed very slowly with a pen, sometimes in bright inks and gold. As there were no public libraries in those days, 
Alcuin searched the world for books for his pupils. These parchments were rare and very costly. Instead of Charles's children going to school, the palace school went with the children as the emperor moved from place to place and from palace to palace. Charlemagne's armies were led by brave knights called paladins. The foremost of these paladins were Roland and Oliver, who fought in combats and tournaments. They were both of heroic size, eight feet tall, and performed the same feats, so that one could not be distinguished from the other. A story is told of these two having fought five days on an island in the river Rhine without either of them gaining the least advantage over the other. So now, when two people are equal in some great struggle, people exclaim, A Roland for an Oliver. Roland, also called Orlando, was the chief hero, and Oliver seemed to have been his reflection or shadow. Roland was a nephew of Charlemagne. He is described in the Song of Roland as having a wonderful horse a miraculous sabre, and a magic horn, which he blew so that it could be heard thirty miles. The greatest story told of him is that he commanded the rear guard of Charlemagne's army as they were returning from Spain through a pass in the Pyrenees Mountains. Set upon by a hundred thousand Saracens, Roland blew his magic horn so that his uncle the emperor heard it eight miles away. In the advancing guard with Charlemagne, however, lurked an evil genius, who told the anxious emperor that Roland's horn was not a signal of distress, but that his nephew was hunting stags in the mountains. Roland fought until the one hundred thousand Saracens were slain, and he had only fifty of his twenty thousand soldiers left. Then fifty thousand more Saracens came out of the mountains and killed the brave paladin and his fifty men. While Roland was dying of his wounds, this legend goes on, he threw his magic sword into a poison stream. Another version of the story is that Roland died of starvation while trying to find his way, wounded and alone, through the mountains to catch up with the army. Charlemagne and his valiant paladins rode and fought in all parts of Europe, beating the savage Germans beyond the Rhine and conquering tribes and peoples all over Europe almost as far as Constantinople, the great capital of the Eastern Empire. At last the dream of the twelve-year-old lad at his father's crowning came true, when Charlemagne himself was crowned at Rome, the city of the Caesars, as emperor of the Western world, on Christmas Day in the year of our Lord 800. It is written that the crowning of Charlemagne was prepared as a surprise to him by the Pope and his people in Rome. While Charles and his sons were kneeling before a shrine very early on that Christmas morning, Pope Leo appeared in the great church with a crown of gold set with many precious gems and placed it on the head of the kneeling king, thus proclaiming him emperor of the western world. In an instant the pope, the cardinals, the priests, and the people rose from their knees and chanted these words, To Charles the Augustus, crowned of God, the great and pacific emperor, long life and victory. Charlemagne was a wise and good emperor who did many things to help his people. He built a lighthouse at Boulogne to guide ships to port, encouraged farming and made wise laws. He was kind to scholars, and his favorite recreation was talking to them. He spoke several languages very well and wrote a great deal. Among his writings were a grammar, poems in Latin, and many letters. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Hero Tales from History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Like Many Waters Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham Alfred, the greatest of the Saxon kings. Over one thousand years ago, the king of the West Saxons on the island of Britain, now England, had four sons. Alfred, the youngest of these, was his father's favorite. When his boy was only five, his royal father sent him to Rome to be confirmed by the Pope. After Alfred came back, his queen mother died, and his father made a pilgrimage or religious journey to Rome taking young Prince Alfred, 
with many court gentlemen, soldiers, and servants. On their way, the king and his train were given a royal welcome by the king of France. Alfred's father fell in love with the beautiful young daughter of the French king, and asked her hand in marriage. Her father consented, so the royal wedding took place on the Saxon king's return from Rome. Alfred's new mother soon became very fond of him. Young as he was, he had learned to play the harp, but when he was twelve years old, Alfred had not been taught to read. Saxon kings and princes thought that most kinds of learning were for priests and lawyers. When gentlemen made contracts or signed law papers, they did not write their names, but set their signs and seals thereunto, as is done today in legal documents. All the books were written on parchments in Latin. One day Alfred saw his French stepmother reading a roll of parchment on which Latin words were printed by hand in many colors. As the lad admired it, the queen told him she would make him a present of the scroll as soon as he learned to read and understand it. He went right out and coaxed a monk or priest to teach him Latin, and he soon became the happy owner of the beautiful parchment. Learning to read opened a new world to Prince Alfred. He wrote verses and songs for his harp, and began to compose both words and music of hymns to be sung in the cathedral near his father's palace. When Alfred was fourteen his father died. Each of his three older brothers became king, one after another, and died within a few years. Alfred was twenty-two when the last brother died and left him to be king. Some rough people, called Danes, from the north countries across the sea, had landed on the island of Britain, and the Saxons were compelled to give battle to them, so as not to be killed or made slaves to those rough northmen. So Alfred had to fight to keep on being king. When he began to reign, he ruled like all the other kings he had known. His father and brothers had treated people as if they were made only to work and pay their way, like cattle, so Alfred did the same at first. The fierce Danes kept coming over in larger numbers. In a hard-fought battle, Alfred was defeated and most of his army was slain. Flying for his life, the young king found a hiding place in the hut of a swineherd, a man who tends hogs. This man knew who Alfred was, but kept the king's secret from his wife who thought the stranger was a poor soldier from the Saxon army. Many stories are told of what the king did while he lived in the hut of this swineherd. These tales have changed so much, all the hundreds of years which have passed since Alfred's time, that they are called legends. The best known of these is the story of the king and the cakes. Once, when the housewife was going out to do some work, she asked him, while he was fixing his bows and arrows, to mind the cakes she had left baking in the ashes of the fireplace. The distracted king's mind was on higher things than coarse meal cakes. When the woman came in she found them burning. She was so angry that she called Alfred a good-for-nothing beggar, and added that if he could not pay for what she gave him to eat, he ought to at least look after her cakes a little while. Alfred had the good sense to see his own conduct through the poor woman's eyes, so instead of being angry or telling her who he was, he said gently, I am sorry I was so careless, I will try not to forget again. A soft answer turneth away wrath. Alfred had read in the roll of Proverbs in his Latin Bible. It may have been during the long months he spent in the home of this shepherd that the humble king decided to translate the best parts of the Bible into the Saxon language so that the people could read it. Another story is that Alfred stayed in the hut alone while the family were away fishing. He had only a loaf of bread to last until their return. A beggar came and asked for bread. Alfred broke his little loaf in two, gave the man half, and ate his half with the beggar. The swineherd returned that day with fish enough for a family feast. In the night the beggar of the day before appeared as an angel to the captive king, and said that God had seen how Alfred had humbled his heart so that he was now fitted to rule his people wisely and well. The Danish army was now encamped not far from the king's hiding place. Encouraged by the vision of the shining pilgrim, Alfred started out to see for himself how strong the enemy were and what they were going to do. So he disguised himself as a wandering musician playing a harp. He played and sang for the Danish soldiers, and was soon taken before their fierce leader, like David, with his harp, before King Saul. 
The Danes were so pleased with him and his music that they asked him to stay with them. As soon as he had found out all he wanted to know, he took up his harp and left the camp of the enemy. The Danes invited him to come again. Hurrying back to the swineherd's hut, Alfred sent word to the leaders among his people that he was alive and ready to go on with the war against the Danes. The people had been in despair, for they had believed that their brave young king was dead. The Saxon chiefs came at once and knelt to King Alfred. When the poor woman realized who her guest was, she fell on her knees and begged him to forgive all she had said to him. Alfred lifted her tenderly from the ground and told her he would reward her and her loyal husband when he was safe on his throne again. The Danish army was astonished early one morning to hear three trumpet blasts and to see a great army of Saxon soldiers marching to meet them, led by that wandering minstrel. Of course the Saxons gained the victory and made the Danes promise not to come and attack them again. They agreed but did not keep their word long. After that, Instead of waiting for the Danes to land in Britain, King Alfred fitted up a fleet of ships so that he could go out and fight them on the sea. This has been called the beginning of the British Navy. Then Alfred improved the years of peace by making laws which allowed the people more rights and privileges. He invented a simple clock of candles by which the people could tell the time of day. He rebuilt the towns that had been destroyed in the war and trained his people not only to fight, but to till their farms. He made wise laws and did much to educate his subjects by having books translated from Latin into Anglo-Saxon, the language of the Saxons. Best of all, he translated the Bible into the language of the people. Because of all the acts which taught the people how to make their lives better and happier, he is known in history as Alfred the Great. In one of his histories, King Alfred wrote what he tried to do in his own life. My will was to live worthily as long as I lived, and, after my life, to leave them that should come after my memory in good works. End of chapter 8、Chapter、nine of Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wayne Cook. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. How William of Normandy Conquered a Kingdom. When the first son was born to Robert, Duke of Normandy, and Arlette, the daughter of a tanner, the nurse laid the day old baby on the straw carpet of the castle. In those days, most of the floors of the houses, whether huts or castles, were of earth or stone, covered with straw which could be cleared out, as from a modern stable, to allow fresh straw to be laid down. When placed on the floor in his little blanket, baby William reached out and clutched some of the straw so tightly in his small pink fists that one of those who noticed smiled and said, He will take fast hold on everything he lays his hands on when he grows up. When William was seven, Duke Robert, his father, being about to make the voyage to the Holy Land, called some of his nobles together and said, I am resolved to journey to the place where our Lord Christ died and was buried. But because I know this journey is full of dangers, I would have it settled who should be Duke if I should die. The nobles and knights took an oath that they would stand by his son William and not let anyone keep him from being Duke of Normandy. Then Duke Robert sailed away and died during the long voyage. William was away hunting in a Norman forest when his faithful fool, as they called a sort of clown kept by a king to amuse the court, broke in where he lay asleep and shouted, Fly! Oh, you will never leave here a living man! The young duke jumped up, dressed in haste, and mounted his horse, riding through the forest in the moonlight and fording rivers till he came to the castle of a friend who was sure to be faithful to him. This knight and his three sons rode with William to his own castle. It turned out that a number of the Norman lords who had taken the oath to satisfy Duke Robert. Were now declaring that they would not serve under the low born 
grandson of a tanner. The fool had learned that they were plotting rebellion and the death of his young master. William, who was now twenty years old, gathered an army of loyal knights and men and waged fierce warfare against the traitors, who retreated within the walls of a Norman town. The young duke soon captured the town and proved to these rebels, as well as to the men of the neighboring kingdom of France, that the grandson of a tanner might be a greater general than the son of a king. At the beginning of a great battle of brave knights against braver knights, a champion of heroic size came out from the ranks of the enemy and threw down his gauntlet or glove, challenging any knight of Normandy to come and fight him with the sword. William himself took up the gauntlet and drove his sword through an open place in the big knight's armor so that he fell from his horse, dead. Then, like the Philistines of old, when David slew their giant, the duke's enemies fled in all directions. Many of them were slain in battle. Others, while running away, were cut down by the battle axes of Norman knights, and many more perished in the flooded river. Those were brutal days, when the people thought that whatever a great king or noble might do was all right if he only had the power to put it through. An example of such high-handed dealing is William's conquest of England. He had once paid a visit to Edward the Confessor, the priestly king of England. The duke claimed, on his return to Normandy, that Edward had promised to leave the kingdom to him as a relative. It happened that Harold, an English earl, was shipwrecked on the coast of Normandy. William seized Harold, shut him up in prison, and kept him there till he promised to do his best to make William King of England at the death of Edward. Two years later, when Edward the Confessor died, it was found that, in spite of his promise to William, he had advised in his will that Harold be elected king by the Witten, an assembly of English freemen. This body of men took the good old king's advice, chose Harold king, and saw that he was crowned at once. Harold excused himself for breaking his word to William because King Edward had decided in his favor instead of William's, and because the oath he had made had been forced from him while he was a prisoner. William, however, was very angry when he heard that Harold had allowed himself to be crowned King of England. Getting together as large an army as he could in Normandy, he sailed across the channel. In leaping ashore from his boat, he tripped and fell forward with his hands upon the ground. Realizing that his soldiers would think this a bad sign, he clutched both hands full of earth, and rising, he held them up, exclaiming, See, I have taken possession of this land of England. The Normans took position in the village of Hastings. Harold went into a camp on top of Selnick Hill, now called Battle, about six miles from Hastings, and dug trenches around. Here a great battle began at four o'clock in the morning of the 14th of October, 1066. In advance of the Norman lines rode a knight in armor, bearing the Duke's colors, singing the Song of Roland. The great paladin in the army of Charlemagne who had lived and fought nearly three hundred years before. It was a brave combat, with many knights and nobles on each side. The Norman found the Englishman a foeman worthy of his steel. The Saxons, entrenched on Battle Hill, held their ground so well that William saw he could not gain the day unless he drew them away from that point of vantage. So he ordered a retreat and the honest Saxons chased the flying Normans, expecting to catch and slay them. But to their great surprise, the Normans turned and fought harder than before. Harold was killed by an arrow shot into his eyes. The Saxon army, without a commander, was thrown into confusion, and thus the day was won by strategy. William, Duke of Normandy, became William, the Conqueror of England. No one now had a better claim to the throne of England than William, so, in the new Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day, 1066, he was crowned and took his proud place in history as William I of England. He had to fight four years longer to break down all the opposition from the northern counties. 
and rewarding the Norman knights and nobles who had helped him gain possession of England, the king gave them great estates scattered over the kingdom. William brought to the island many scholars and bishops, and did much to establish the Church of England. Though he had been rough and cruel, he was both shrewd and wise in proving his own rights and in strengthening his kingdom. William ruled England with a strong hand for twenty-one years. He forbade the buying and selling of slaves, yet he reduced the Saxon farmers to serfs almost as low as slaves. He ordered a record like a census made, and a survey of the kingdom which was recorded in what is called the Domesday Book. It was terribly hard for the good, honest Anglo-Saxon people to see the Normans move into their homes and force them to work like slaves on the very places they themselves had owned. But the Normans had the power, and the Saxons could not help themselves. For hundreds of years the Normans spoke the French language, and the Saxons the English. The very names of the meats on your table at home are signs of the Norman conquest nearly nine hundred years ago. The animals in the pastures and stables of England were called by the names the Saxons gave them, as cow, calf, sheep, swine. But the meats of those animals, when cooked and served upon the tables of the masters, are still known by their Norman French names, as beef, Norman name for cow, veal, Norman for calf, mutton, Norman for sheep, pork, Norman for hog or swine. Milk is a Saxon word, but cream is from the French because the Saxons had to milk the cows and drink only milk while they served their Norman lords the cream. The Norman traits of keenness, tact, and worldly wisdom have been mingling for many centuries with the honest, sturdy integrity of the Anglo-Saxons. Little by little, as the races grew together, the nobles became less haughty and cruel and the poor people were lifted up out of their poverty. But it took many centuries for men to learn the lesson that kind hearts are more than coronets, and simple faith than Norman blood. End of chapter 9、chapter、10 of Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Lion hearted Richard and Wolf hearted John. The great grandson of William the Conqueror was Henry the Second of England, a great and powerful king. At his death in 1189, he left two sons, Richard and John. As Richard was the older, he was at once proclaimed king and duly crowned in Westminster Abbey. He was also Duke of Normandy and thought this a greater honor than to be king of England. About a hundred years before the time of Richard, great armies had begun to sail from several of the countries of Western Europe to the Holy Land in Syria. The rock hewn tomb of Jesus near Jerusalem was in possession of the followers of Mohammed, Turks, Arabs, and Saracens. Who controlled the country. The Christian people of Europe thought it very wrong that the Saracens owned the holy city of Jerusalem and could keep Christians from coming to worship at the tomb of their Lord. So throngs of soldiers went to the Holy Land to rescue the Holy Sepulchre or tomb. The wars which they fought for this cause were known as the Crusades. In the First Crusade, the Christian knights captured not only the Holy Sepulchre but also the city of Jerusalem. In the Second Crusade, about fifty years later, the Crusaders were beaten back by the Saracens. Two years before Richard became king, the Mohammedans again captured Jerusalem and the sacred tomb. Young King Richard was fired with a holy zeal to win back the holy city and the sepulchre, and, if possible, to find the cross upon which Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. This relic was believed to have been hidden by the Saracens. King Richard made many sacrifices to raise money for a third crusade. His brother John was glad to have Richard go away on such a distant and dangerous mission, leaving the younger brother to rule over England during the king's long absence. 
john was as cowardly as richard was brave and down in his heart he hoped the turk would kill his brother so that he could have the throne because of the king's knightly courage he was given the title of richard lionheart if john had been named for the animal he was most like he would have been called john wolfhart richard was joined by king philip of france and the two kings with their armies and those of the archduke of austria reached the holy land in due time they attacked the walled city of Acre, called Acca by the arabs and captured it after a long hard fight and the loss of many thousands of soldiers but richard was as overbearing as he was brave he ordered other kings and dukes about and his manner was so masterful that he made philip and the archduke of austria very angry after several bitter quarrels the king of france left richard to fight on without him the french king sailed away home with most of his army and plotted with prince john to injure the absent brother and make john king of england while richard was still alive many tales are told of the struggle between richard king of england and saladin the sultan of the saracens for hundreds of years after richard lionheart's campaign in the holy land arab mothers would frighten their children by warning them that richard would get them if they were not good sir walter scott's great novels ivanhoe and the talisman are stories of life in england at this time and of knightly tournaments which took place between richard and saladin during this crusade while the crusaders were trying to capture ascalon it became necessary for them to work like stonemasons in rebuilding certain walls richard went to work with a royal will and most of the nobles and knights followed his example but the archduke of austria said he was the son neither of a carpenter nor of a mason and flatly refused to help this made king richard so angry that he struck the archduke a blow with his mailed fist and gave him a resounding kick with his heavy iron boot with all his holy zeal to take the holy city richard lionheart had not learned that he that ruleth his spirit is better than he that taketh a city then the archduke and his austrian army also left richard to fight on alone with his few remaining soldiers what richard had found hard enough with the help of the king of france and the archduke of austria was impossible without them but lionheart was not only a very brave man but a fine general he defeated the army of saladin in a great battle at arsuf and twice led the christian forces within a few miles of jerusalem quarrels among the crusaders however made it impossible to continue the war king richard also received bad news from home that his brother john was plotting against him aided by king philip of france so he and saladin made a truce to stop fighting for three years three months three weeks and three days then the brave king of england started for home richard sent his army the long way round by water while he and a few knights disguised as pilgrims tried to go the short way by land across austria and germany in spite of his disguise richard was recognized by an austrian soldier when the archduke heard that richard was crossing his dukedom he sent soldiers at once to capture the king who had insulted him richard was a prisoner in a great castle for two years a story is told of a young troubadour or wandering minstrel who started out to find his royal master by playing a lute and singing songs of love and hymns of the crusaders after months of wandering he sang under a castle wall a favorite song of richard's and heard to his great joy a deep bass voice within the german fortress joining in the hymn he well knew that the voice was none other than richard lionheart's saying nothing he hurried away and told some english friends where their lost king was they rushed to richard's rescue and paid the emperor of germany who was over the archduke in rank and power a royal ransom to have their brave king set free when philip of france heard that richard was out of prison he sent word to john who had been making believe that his brother the king was dead take care of yourself the devil has broken loose when richard reached london john pretended to be very glad to receive his dear brother back as from the dead richard reigned only a few years after that 
for he was killed in one of his wars with philip of france while he was as brave as a lion richard was also as fierce and cruel as the king of beasts he was not a good man as people to-day regard manhood but he was much better than his cowardly brother john who became king after richard's death End of chapter 10chapter eleven of hero tales from history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org hero tales from history by smith burnham joan of arc and the lilies of france five hundred years ago a little french peasant girl was working outside the stone hut where her father's large family lived when she heard or thought she heard a voice saying to her joan be a good child go often to church this joan of arc was so kind-hearted and so thoughtful for others that her friends made fun of her and said she was not like other girls and her parents feared that she was growing too good to live but joan only wondered and smiled said her prayers and went often to church when she was twelve or thirteen she began to see visions and hear what she called the voices saying over and over joan trust in god for there is great sorrow in the kingdom of france it must be st catherine and st margaret joan said to herself as she sat spinning for hours at a time what was the sorrow in france and how could she make things better just by being good she even doubted whether the visions she had seen and the voices she had heard were anything but her own half-waking dreams one day she overheard the parish priest of don remy where she lived telling of the troubles of france for almost a hundred years the kings of england had claimed and fought for the right to rule over france and lately under their soldier king henry v had defeated the french and driven their armies into the southern part of their own land henry v had died but his son still claimed the french throne and the french prince or dauphin as he was called had not been crowned king because the english held the city of reims where all the french kings were crowned the english armies were pushing southward to lay siege to the french city of orleans joan heard the good priest and her father and mother sighing over the sad day that had come when foreigners were fighting to make slaves of the french people and the dear dauphin whom god had given them for their king was now flying from place to place before the armies of england after that day the voices grew more earnest and definite go to the governor they urged her go and ask him to give you soldiers and send you to the help of the king poor little joan's heart sank within her and she protested i am only a young girl i don't know how to ride or to fight they will only laugh at me but the voices kept on insisting go 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 and we will help you save france joan told her parents what the voices were telling her to do her father laughed and threatened to punish her if he heard any more of such talk and her mother was afraid her strange little daughter was going to die joan's brothers and sisters made fun of her and asked if she wished to marry the dauphin and be queen of france but joan had a kind uncle who loved and sympathized with her her mother let her go visit uncle durant hoping her poor little girl might forget the voices when joan told her uncle what she kept seeing and hearing he promised to help her all he could so he went with his anxious little niece to the governor of that part of france and stood by her as she told the great man about the voices and repeated the latest command they had given her for him send and tell the dauphin to wait and not offer battle to his enemies because god will give him help before the middle of lent the kingdom belongs not to the dauphin but to my lord but my lord wishes that the dauphin shall be king and hold it in trust in spite of his enemies he shall be king of france and i will lead him to be crowned and who is your lord demanded the governor with a sneer the king of heaven said joan of arc proudly the governor who was a rough military man 
laughed loud and long at the faith of the little peasant girl in a white cap red petticoat and wooden shoes instead of doing as she asked he told her uncle to give her a good whipping to beat the foolishness out of her head and send her home to her father baffled and discouraged joan went home with her uncle but the voices kept saying in her ears go go back to the governor she went but he treated her as badly as before then they found another man to whom she told her story and added god in heaven has told me to go to the dauphin with his help i must do it even if i have to go on my knees this friendly gentleman was deeply touched by her earnest words the people in the country who knew and believed in joan of arc pleaded with the men of influence in the neighborhood and it was at last arranged that joan should go and tell her story to the young king of france to see if god were guiding her as she claimed the king changed places with a noble in his court but instead of going up to the pretended king who sat in the seat of honor joan walked straight to the prince where he stood behind some men of the court it is easy to believe what we will the dauphin listened to the burning words of the peasant girl with the pure madonna-like face after she had won the king's approval it was not so hard for joan to go on obeying the voices dressed in a suit of armor which shone like silver she led a french army to the relief of orleans she carried everywhere a beautiful white banner embroidered with lilies the english laughed at that silly girl trying to be a man and called her insulting names but joan did not mind for she felt safe under the protection of the saints in heaven one day in an attack upon a fort held by the english the maid as the french army now called her was wounded in the foot but she would not stop fighting she mounted her horse again and led the charge as though nothing had happened the english then thought she was a witch that is a woman working for the devil in another battle an arrow was shot clear through her shoulder so that the barb stuck out five inches then the enemy raised a shout of triumph the maid can be wounded and killed they yelled she is not a witch so we are not afraid of her but one of joan's company pulled out the arrow and she led them fiercely in the assault the english soldiers were frightened for in those days everyone believed in witches joan drove the enemy from one place to another until all the south country was cleared of the english forces then the maid of orleans as she was now called led the king with his court and the french army to the old city of rheims where he was crowned with great joy and splendor as charles the seventh the maid had put the lilies on her banner as the symbol of purity and of god's love and care over france the french lily or fleur-de-lis has been the emblem of france through all the centuries since the days of joan of arc the maid of orleans now the maid who had done all that the voices had commanded was ready to return home to spin and to tend the sheep on the hills of Domremy but the weak-hearted king charles begged her to stay long enough to drive all the english out of france against her wish joan yielded while fighting outside the walls of a town not far from paris she was surrounded by armed men of the enemy by mistake or through fear some french people shut the gate in such haste that the maid was left outside fighting a dozen soldiers single-handed she was captured and put in a dark damp prison here the poor girl then only nineteen was frightened and tortured to make her sign a paper confessing that she was a wicked witch and that all she had done was by the help of the devil after waiting a long time in vain for the ungrateful prince whom she had made king of france to come and save her with his army or to pay a large sum of money to ransom her she was compelled to stand an unjust trial during which she was many times abused and insulted this wicked trial was conducted by a false bishop who condemned that sweet heroic young girl to be burned at the stake in the market-place of rouen on the twenty fourth of may fourteen thirty one twenty-five years after her death the pope reversed the decision of the corrupt bishop in nineteen twenty 
nearly five hundred years after the maid was burned to death high and holy men in the ancient church to which she belonged took the great step of declaring joan of arc the peasant girl of domremy one of the noble army of martyrs in the communion of saints End of chapter 11chapter twelve of hero tales from history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org hero tales from history by smith burnham shakespeare the greatest maker of plays perhaps there is no one who has done so much for the world yet about whose life so little is known as william shakespeare his father was a farmer and market man and his mother was mary arden a prosperous farmer's daughter the father was so highly respected that he was made high bailiff or mayor of stratford-upon-avon where the shakespeare family lived it was one of the father's duties to give out licenses to players or actors who went from town to town performing their plays sometimes they gave their shows out of doors and when theatres were built they were galleries around a space of ground the people who paid the most stood or sat in the galleries and the poor people saw the play from the ground called the pit strolling players were looked upon in those days almost as tramps are today. they had to have licenses like street bands nowadays they often gave their shows in a town square and took up a collection for their pay john shakespeare was fond of these shows and there is no doubt that his son william was taken to see them before he went to the stratford grammar school when he was seven years old here the boy is said to have studied latin writing and arithmetic judging from the specimens that are still to be seen of william shakespeare's penmanship it was not a great success one of the great playwriters of shakespeare's time wrote that will had learned small latin and less greek at school but latin was the chief study in the schools of that time it was sung and spoken in church and it was thought necessary for even a farmer's son to study that language when william was thirteen his father was unfortunate in business and the boy had to leave school to earn his living there is a legend that he started in to learn the butcher's trade but it seems more likely that he worked as a lawyer's boy and clerk if all accounts are true he must have been a mischievous lad for the story goes that he was once taken up for poaching or shooting a deer in the park of one of the great men in the county when he was eighteen will shakespeare married a farmer's daughter eight years older than himself by the time he was twenty-one the young father had three children two of these hamnet and judith were twins hamnet died before he grew to manhood and about all that is known of judith shakespeare is that she like her mother never learned to read it was not thought necessary then for farmers wives and daughters to read and write a lawyer's clerk with five mouths to feed could hardly find enough to do in stratford to earn a living so william shakespeare went to london to seek his fortune it is said that he began life in the great city by holding horses in front of one of the theatres as they did not have hitching posts in shakespeare's days then he was promoted to be the prompter's boy one of his duties was to tell the actors when it was time for them to go on the stage and play their parts nothing is really known of what the young man from stratford was doing for six or seven years he made his living in one way or another in connection with the theatres at the end of that time a dying actor left some bitter lines about will shakespeare but another actor at this time called shakespeare a good man a graceful actor and a witty writer of plays shakespeare seems not to have been a leading actor it is said that he took the part of the ghost in his own play of hamlet he became so successful as a writer that he was commanded to bring his company and produce a play before queen elizabeth in one of her palaces it is recorded that shakespeare was paid from thirty to seventy-five dollars for one of his plays while it is true that thirty dollars would buy as much then as three hundred dollars today, yet that was a very small price to pay for the greatest dramas ever written but the real value of the greatest things of the world cannot be measured by money 
everyone is said to have at least one great chance in life shakespeare's door of opportunity was the door of a theatre he did not wait for it to open he opened it himself shakespeare's life showed that poets are born not made he had the keenest insight into the human heart and life of all the writers who ever lived End of chapter 12、Chapter、13 Chapter Thirteen: How Cromwell Changed Places with the King. In Shakespeare's day, Queen Elizabeth came first in the thoughts of all the people of England. She was almost worshipped by the men of wealth and genius whom she gathered at her court, and by the people at large. By her cleverness and wisdom, she kept England peaceful and prosperous all through her reign. But she never married, so when she died. Her cousin James Stuart, King of Scotland, became King of England. James had been brought up to think that because he was king, everybody must bow to him as the Lord's anointed. It was he and his counsellors who drove the Pilgrim Fathers out of England because they would not worship God as James wished them to, in the Church of England, of which he was the head. On his way down to London to be crowned, James stopped at the beautiful estate of Sir Oliver Cromwell. In the royal company was the king's eldest son, Charles, called by the Scottish people the Bonny Prince. The little Scotch boy, only six years old, already thought that the world was created for him, and that no other boy had any rights which he, Prince Charles. Was bound to respect. The story goes that Sir Oliver Cromwell sent for his nephew, whose name was Oliver Cromwell also, to play with the prince. When little Noll, as they nicknamed Oliver, came in, his uncle presented him to the boy prince. Young Oliver tried to shake hands with Charles. Old Oliver, who wanted the boy to bow and kiss the prince's hand, said. Pay your duty to Prince Charles. I owe him no duty," said Noll Cromwell. "Why should I kiss that boy's hand?" King James only laughed at the Cromwell lad's spirit, and Charles and Noll were left to play together. The prince soon struck the other boy, as he was in the habit of doing, but naughty Noll struck back. And sent the bonny prince howling to the king, with royal blood streaming from his little freckled nose. Sir Oliver and the members of the royal party looked with holy horror at the boy who had laid hands on the Lord's anointed. Some of them thought young Oliver ought to be imprisoned in the Tower of London, or even beheaded for his wickedness. But King James had sense enough. To see that it was well for the prince to get tit for tat once in a while, so he only looked hard at little Oliver and said, "Thou art a bold lad, and if thou live to be a man, my son Charlie would do wisely to be friends with thee." Then he turned to Sir Oliver and the frightened friends standing there, saying, "Harm not the lad; he has taught my son a good lesson." If heaven do but give him grace to profit by it, if he be tempted to play the tyrant over the stubborn English, let him remember little Oliver Cromwell. Young Oliver went to free school, and then to a Puritan college in Cambridge University, but he had to leave school on account of the death of his father. Before he was thirty, Cromwell was elected to Parliament. Of which his cousin John Hampton was also a member. Meanwhile, King James died, and his son, the prince with whom Oliver had quarrelled when a boy, became King Charles the First. 
King James had been so sensible at times, and so foolish at others, that he has been called the wisest fool in Europe. But Charles had even less sense than his royal father. He tried to abolish Parliament, thus setting up his own will against the will of the people of all England and Scotland. Parliament, led by such men as Cromwell and Hampton, stood up for the rights of the people against tyranny. All lovers of liberty and human rights are greatly in debt to these two brave men who risk their lives to save their country from the selfish willfulness of kings. Englishmen now were divided into two parties. The king's party were the Cavaliers, or Church of England men, who wore wigs or long curls and dressed in velvets, silks, and laces like grown-up Lord Fauntleroy's. The parliamentary party were called Roundheads, so named because they cut their hair short, as men do today. Oliver Cromwell, who never saw an army until he was forty, was suddenly found to be a great general. Because of their stern, unyielding courage, Cromwell's soldiers were called Ironsides. They often went into battle with a prayer on their lips, or, in a grand chorus, sang a psalm of David while striking valiantly for the right. At last it became necessary to sacrifice King Charles in order to secure the victory for Parliament, which stood for the freedom of Englishmen against the tyranny of kings. So a court set up by Parliament voted to put the king to death, and Oliver Cromwell was one of the signers of the death warrant. As James the king's father had driven the pilgrims out of the country, so now the Puritans in Parliament forced the king's sons to leave the country for their country's good. During the few years in which Oliver Cromwell was Lord Protector of England, he did much to strengthen the nation and to repair the great harm brought upon it by the foolish whims of its extravagant kings. It was then that England learned the terrible lesson which Europe had to be taught almost three hundred years later, that no king has a divine right to do wrong to the people. End of chapter 13. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 14 of Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Chapter 14 Napoleon, the Corsican Boy Who Ruled Europe. Though Napoleon Bonaparte was the greatest soldier of his time, he was small in body. His fullest height was a little above five feet. The story of his strange career shows how a poor, puny little lad made himself emperor of France and master of Europe, so that kings, generals, and prime ministers bowed like so many servants to his imperial will. He began while he wore petticoats to wish to be a soldier. He threw away his baby rattle for a brass cannon, and his first playthings were little iron soldiers. When he was old enough to play with other boys, he always chose to be a soldier, and, small as he was, he was the one who told the bigger boys just what to do. Even then, if his mother gave him a piece of cake, he would go out to the edge of the little town and trade it to an old soldier for some coarse black army bread. As he grew older, the soldier longing became his ambition. His health was never very good. He was often nervous, willful, and hard to manage. But he had a keen sense of honor and always despised a coward. Napoleon's home was the rugged island of Corsica. While he was still a little boy, he found between some rocks near the shore a cave which he claimed for his own. This is still pointed out to thousands who come to visit the boy's birthplace as Napoleon's grotto. At that time, 
there was a feud between the boys of the town and the shepherd lads on the hills around napoleon told the other town boys that if they would do as he said he would make those big country boys stop throwing stones at them whenever they met the town lads agreed to this so napoleon told them to gather stones and pile them in a row a little distance below the fortress which the shepherds had chosen behind some rocks on top of their hill the pale bonaparte boy led his young army up till the country youths fired a valley of stones at them then he turned and ran down the hill followed by his company the enemy came out and gave chase pell-mell this was just what napoleon expected when the little leader got down to the piles of stones he shouted halt his soldiers obeyed stones each boy gathered up as many as he could carry about face fire before the astonished shepherds could stop they were met by a shower of rocks the big fellows broke and scattered in all directions and two of them were taken prisoner captain bonaparte would not let them go till the other country boys pledged themselves not to touch his men again thus eight-year-old napoleon became the leader of the boys in his home town before he was ten he was sent to a military school in france where sons of noblemen were educated some of those french boys were wayward mean and savagely cruel they made fun of the shy country lad for his rough Corsican ways and speech and because he was small and sallow napoleon had entered this school on a hot scholarship and so they sneered at him as the charity boy he could not speak french at first and pronounced his name so that it sounded like the french words for nose of straw as napoleon's nose was long straight and thin they laughed and shouted his nickname mr straw nose all this made the proud sensitive lad speechless with rage he kept himself away from the rest a garden plot was assigned for each cadet to tend a few of the others were too idle to take care of theirs so they gave them to napoleon and he kept them in order as his own in the centre of this little kingdom he built an arbour where he could stay alone to study his plan as he had done in his little cave in corsica and woe to those who entered there without his permission he had suffered this sort of life nearly four years before his father and mother managed to visit their boy who was almost a prisoner in military school napoleon worded the shock the visit gave his mother when she came to see me at the brienne she was frightened at my thickness i was indeed much changed because i employed the hours of his creation in working and often passed the nights in thinking about the day's lessons my nature could not bear the idea of not being the first in my class after finishing at this academy napoleon went to the military college at paris father bonaparte's death about this time left the family poorer than ever sometimes napoleon did not have enough to eat but that did not prevent him from studying hard his great ambition kept him from starving some time after his graduation he was assigned to a small command in paris red revolutionists were trying to destroy the city young napoleon thought it high time to stop them a mob gathered in a public square threatening to kill people and burn their houses he opened fire on the mob and cleared that square in a short order it was said afterward bonaparte stopped the french revolution with a whiff of his grape shot from being the man of the hour napoleon went on until he became the man of destiny he was raised to the highest rank and his general bonaparte became commander-in-chief of the french army in italy where he gained brilliant victories over the austrians but the austrians would not stay beaten and while napoleon was away in egypt austria started in to win back its control of northern italy when napoleon returned to paris he was the idol of the people they elected him 
consul, a kind of president of the French Republic. The Austrians were pleased at this, as it would keep the little corporal, as the soldiers called Napoleon, in Paris. He would have to send another commander to Italy, and the Austrians had gotten such a start that they could win the victory before the French forces could go around the Alps. Austria was already crowing over its triumph, and all Europe was laughing because General Bonaparte had been caught napping. When one May morning, Council Napoleon and a great army came tobgaining down the mountainsides into the plains of Italy, as if they had fallen from the sky. In a letter to his or older brother, Napoleon wrote of this, We have dropped here like a thunderbolt, and the enemy didn't expect it and hardly believe it yet. He had made his soldiers climb up the Alps mountain in the highest, steepest place, dragging heavy cannon and army supplies after them. By his wonderful feat of crossing the Alps, Napoleon won by surprise the victory at Marengo, just as he had beaten the shepherd lads when he was a boy of eight. The people now made their hero consul for life. After that, it was easy for him to make himself emperor of the French. At his coronation, Napoleon snatched the crown out of the hands of the Pope and placed it on his own head, to show that he was emperor by the right of his own might. Yet Emperor Napoleon kept on leading his armies in person. He still had to fight with other nations to hold his place as master of Europe. He gained even more brilliant victories as Emperor Napoleon than he had won as General Bonaparte. Not content with his record as a great conqueror, he gave the French people the Code Napoleon, a set of laws which proved him to be also wise a statesman and lawgiver. The kings and nobles of Europe always hated Napoleon. They said he was vulgar, and called him the Corsican upstart. But the French people loved him as one of themselves. No general or emperor ever had more devoted followers than Napoleon Bonaparte. Millions of men gave their lives willingly to fight his battles. He waged war after war till there were but few fighting men left in France. Then the people began to think that Napoleon loved them because they could not help him win victories to give him more power and fulfill his high ambition. They began to say among themselves, he's sacrificing us for his own glory. While at the height of his power, Napoleon exclaimed, what are a million lives to a man like me? When the people lost their faith in him, Napoleon began to lose instead of his win his battles. Generals and nobles stopped flattering him and began to fight him. His own brothers and sisters, whom he had made kings and queens, deserted him. Even his wife forsook him, taking with her his only son, the idol of his heart. Napoleon's last battle was at Waterloo, in Belgium. Because this loss brought him ruin to him, the name of the place became a kind of proverb. When overwhelming defeat comes to a great man, people say, he has met his Waterloo. The conquered conqueror was taken prisoner and sent thousands of miles away as a captive to the bleak island of St. Helena. He made the best of his hard lot as the fortunes of war. But the years of loneliness endured by this friendless conqueror while his life had been selfish and merciless, and suggested by a well-known picture, which shows Napoleon on the shore of that far-off rock in the southern sea, standing with hands clasped behind him, looking off across the ocean to where France lay. End of chapter 14 Read by Elijah Fisher Chapter 15 of Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Chapter 15 Nelson, the Hero of Trafalgar. A small English boy. Straight away from his grandmother's house, after she had warned him, 
that gypsies encamped nearby might carry him off. When the old lady found the little fellow sitting beside a stream too wide for him to cross, she exclaimed, Why did you run away, Horatio? I was half dead with fear. Fear? demanded the little fellow, still in petticoats. What is that? I never saw a fear. The boy's father's name was Nelson. He was a clergyman of the Church of England. His wife had died when this boy was a baby, leaving eight children for the invalid father to care for. Once while the father was away for his health, young Horatio heard that his mother's brother had been appointed to the command of a British man-of-war. Horatio said to an older brother, Do, William, write to my father and tell him that I should like to go to sea with Uncle Maurice. Thinking the Navy might be a good place for the boy and a benefit to his health, Dr. Nelson wrote to his brother-in-law. The bluff sea captain wrote right back. What has poor Horatio done? Who is so weak that he above all the rest should be sent to rough it out at sea? But let him come, and the first time we go into action a cannonball may knock off his head and provide for him at once. Thus young Horatio Nelson entered the Royal Navy. One of his first trips was as coxswain on a voyage to the Arctic regions. While dragging the ship's boats over the ice, the sailors had to fight with walruses and polar bears. Coxswain Nelson killed a big white bear and carried home the skin for his father. When Horatio was fifteen, he made a voyage on the warship Seahorse to the East Indies. A year and a half in that hot climate made the frail lad so ill that he had to go home. Of his thoughts while sailing home on sick leave, he once said, After a long and gloomy reverie, in which I almost wished myself overboard, a sudden glow of patriotism was kindled within me and presented my king and country as my patrons. My mind exalted in the idea. Well then, I exclaimed, I will be a hero, and trusting in God, I will brave every danger. Young Nelson had too much pluck to be sick long. England was then at war with France and Spain, and he fought his country's enemies in malarial regions where hundreds of his fellows died from the poisoned air and serpent bites. When Horatio was twenty-two, his health again failed, and he had to spend months in Brighton to recover it. When peace was signed between England and France in 1783, Nelson was twenty-five. He was presented at court in that year, as he was a favorite with the Duke of Clarence, who afterward became King William the Fourth. The next year, Captain Nelson was placed in command of the battleship Boreas. He was very kind to the thirty midshipmen on board. When a boy was afraid to climb a mast, Nelson would say to him with a winning smile, I am going to race to the masthead and beg that I may meet you there. Once, when he was invited to dinner with the governor of Barbados, Nelson said, Your Excellency must excuse me for bringing one of my midshipmen. I make it a rule to introduce them to all the good company I can, as they have few to look up to besides myself while they are at sea. It is not surprising that men under his command exclaimed, in comparing him with other men, Nelson was the man to love. The wars of Great Britain with Napoleon kept the young Navy officer in active service. During a siege, a shell burst and destroyed the sight of his right eye. In another attack, he was wounded in the arm. He shouted to those who wished to remove him from the fray, Let me alone. I have yet my legs and one arm. Tell the surgeon to make haste and get the instruments. I know I must lose my right arm, so the sooner it is off, the better. 
in seventeen ninety eight when napoleon started out with the french fleet for an unknown port to surprise and lay waste to the countries of people friendly to great britain these instructions were issued to admiral nelson take sink burn and destroy the french fleet with his battleship nelson set out to search the mediterranean but for a long time he was unable to find the french fleet at last it was found at anchor in abacar bay at the mouth of the nile the french were caught in a trap though nelson had not eaten or slept much for many days and nights he invited his officers to dinner on his flagship the vanguard to discuss the coming battle if we succeed what will the world say asked one of the officers there is no if in the case replied the admiral sharply we are to succeed but who may live to tell the story is a very different question admiral nelson had the colors flying from six different places on his flagship when they went into battle that very night that engagement now known as the battle of the nile was one of the greatest naval combats in history the french flagship l'orient on which napoleon had sailed to carry war into egypt was blown up and the french admiral killed with all on board the battle raged from seven in the evening until three in the morning though the french had thousands more men than the british most of them were killed nelson sent boats to rescue them from the burning french ships but they preferred to go on fighting through the flames amidst bursting shells and exploding powder magazines nelson's fleet was utterly destroyed nelson wrote on that night's work victory is not a name strong enough for such a scene it is a conquest the whole world which had suffered in dread of that monster napoleon went wild over the news england made nelson a baron and voted him a pension of ten thousand dollars a year other nations rulers and corporations showered upon him great sums of money gold boxes filled with diamonds jeweled swords and gem encrusted souvenirs the queen of naples a sister of queen marie antoinette who had lately been beheaded by the french people was beside herself with joy the poor people of italy expressed their gratitude when nelson's fleet was anchored in the bay of naples bringing cages of birds to the shore they opened the doors and let the birds out to fly about the flagship and light on the beloved admiral's shoulders three years later the conquering hero was called to strike another blow against napoleon near copenhagen denmark admiral nelson opened the attack on the allied fleet but the admiral higher in command thinking it might be well to give nelson a chance to withdraw a little signaled him to retire to repair several disabled ships nelson hearing of this put his spyglass to his blind eye and winked as he said i really do not see the signal keep on flying mine for closer battle that's the way i answer such signals the men of both fleets fought with undaunted courage for five long terrible hours the enemy lost eighteen hundred men and six thousand prisoners but the british had only two hundred fifty killed and six hundred eighty wounded of the battle of copenhagen nelson wrote i have been in one hundred and five engagements but this has been the most terrible of all for the victory at copenhagen nelson was made a viscount but there was no time for celebrations after this for napoleon was now waging war to the death lord nelson seemed to realize that the next fight must be the end either of france or of england at last the day came off cape trafalgar spain on the twenty first of october eighteen o five it is told of admiral lord nelson that as he walked the deck of his flagship victory that morning 
His knees trembled, more with excitement than fear. The one-eyed, one-armed hero looked down and shook his fist at his legs, saying, Shake away there. You would shake worse than that if you knew where I was going to take you today. Then he gave the order for that immortal signal. England expects every man to do his duty. Trafalgar was the greatest of all Nelson's victories. It broke the power of Napoleon and paved the way for Wellington at Waterloo. At a shot from the mizzenmast of a French ship, the Lord Admiral fell. Captain Hardy of the Victory knelt beside him. They have done for me at last, Hardy, he gasped. Nelson lived for hours giving his last directions, then died in the moment of his greatest triumph. Now I am satisfied, were his last words. Thank God I have done my duty. End of chapter 15. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 16 of Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcus Miller Zufle. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Columbus, the map maker who found a new world. In a tall, narrow house in the midst of a block on a narrow street in Genoa, Italy, lived a poor wool worker named Columbus. This slender house was only two windows wide and seven stories high. In the lowest story, in which there were a wide door and a grated window, Signor Columbus stored the bales of wool, which he washed and carded, using a tool somewhat like the curry comb for cleaning horses. He thus prepared the wool to be spun into yarn, which would later be woven and made up into clothing and blankets. A small boy named Christopher went in and out of this foul-smelling place to play and work. Very little is known of the boyhood of Columbus. As Genoa was a large seaport town, it is supposed that he spent much of his time on the wharves, watching the boats galleys from Venice, with gay-colored sails and strange-looking craft from Asia and Africa with long, slim, latine wings veering about the swallows of the sea. There were pirates or highway robbers of the sea in those days. Little Christopher was sure to hear thrilling stories of how they fought hand-to-hand -hand with sabers and axes and of how the wicked but powerful pirates murdered the men on merchant ships and carried off the women and children to be slaves in distant lands. Young Columbus seems to have been fired with a boyish longing for a life on the ocean wave, a home on the rolling deep. For the next that is known of him is that he narrowly escaped from drowning in a shipwreck by swimming six miles to shore on a boat oar. He landed near a town in Portugal, and soon found work in a mapmaker's shop. Here he had a chance to learn all the geography that was known 400 years ago. Most of the maps he made were drawn as if the world were flat. But there were curious charts with lands and seas outlined on the six sides of a cube, and others drawn as if the world were shaped like a huge section of stovepipe. Young Columbus found the maps very interesting. But what seemed most wonderful of all was the idea that the world was round, as every child now knows. In those days, a man was not allowed to believe anything different from what everyone else thought. So when young Columbus began to claim that the earth was round, people laughed at him. They thought he was crazy. Of course, a few astronomers and scientists knew how to prove the roundness of the Earth by the shadow it casts on the moon in an eclipse, but most people could not understand such things. Columbus himself could notice that the surface of the ocean, within the short distance he could see, was slightly curved. 
he resolved to miss no chance to prove his theory by learning all he could about newly found lands and even began planning to sail around the earth to India and Far Cathay as China was called in the old days. Travelers had been overland to the Far East and back. Daring sailors had sailed along the coast of Africa, but the great body of water to the west of Portugal was called the Sea of Darkness. People believed that terrible sea monsters haunted its dark waters and that if men were to sail far enough westward, their ship would go beyond the brink of the world as over a giant waterfall and fall down, down through space forever. So when Christopher Columbus tried to persuade the king of Portugal and the princes of other countries to fit out a few ships and let him prove the roundness of the earth by sailing west to the far east, no one would listen to him seriously. But the poor man could not give it up, though he spent many years wandering from country to country to persuade someone rich and powerful enough to supply the ships and men for such a dangerous voyage. Queen Isabella of Spain and her husband, King Ferdinand, listened to him. But when the matter was referred to the royal council, those grave men shook their heads and said such a thing was absurd and unfit for a queen even to think about. Columbus was in despair. His wife was now dead and he had his little son Diego with him. The two were tramping across the country and came, about sunset, to a monastery on the border of Spain, where the boy asked for a drink just as the monk in charge happened to be passing. This monk spoke to Columbus and, seeing what an interesting man he was, invited the strangers in. Columbus told his strange, sad story. This monk had been a friend and advisor to Queen Isabella. Also, he knew two sailors who might be a help in such an undertaking. He wrote at once to the queen, urging her to let Columbus come and talk over the matter once more. She wrote back that she would like to hear what her friend, the monk, might have to say about it. He started the very night he received the queen's letter and talked with her about converting to the Christian faith the people of the new lands Columbus might discover. As a result of this talk, the good monk wrote to Columbus, who, with his young son, was waiting at the monastery. Our Lord has heard his servant's prayers. My heart swims in a sea of comfort and my spirit leaps with joy. Start quickly, for the queen awaits you, and I yet more than she. Commend me to the prayers of my brethren and of the little Diego. The grace of God be with you. The queen received Columbus this time with sympathy and kindness. She is said to have pledged her jewels to raise money enough to fit out three ships for his great voyage. Columbus was to command one of these, and the monk's friends were to be captains of the other two. But after making the little fleet ready, they could not induce sailors to man the vessels for their ghastly voyage across the sea of outer darkness. Sailors were always superstitious. Even today they will not start out on Friday, and many seafaring men will refuse to sail with a ship if the flag should happen to be raised union down, or wrong side up, no matter how quickly it may be set right. At last, Columbus had to take convicts out of prison and condemn them to hard labor as sailors for the terrible trial trip. Some of these men were desperate criminals. The unknown western sea was far wider than Columbus had thought. This showed that the world must be much larger than he supposed. As they sailed on and on, day after day and week after week, across the untraveled sea, the superstitious convict sailors were half dead with fear. They planned to murder the admiral as Columbus was now called, and his two captains, 
in order to turn the ship about and go back before they were engulfed in some great whirlpool of disaster. Columbus kept himself well guarded and coaxed and flattered the frightened creatures, promising them all kinds of wealth and pleasures if they would only keep on a day or two longer. He offered an extra prize to the man who first caught sight of land. On the night of the 11th of October, 1492, one of the sailors saw a glimmering light to the west. On the morning of the 12th, the admiral was an early riser. There lay a tropical island with gardens of the most beautiful trees I ever saw, he said afterward. The sea was as deep blue as that along the shores of his native Italy. He and his two captains went ashore with well-armed men in boats from all three ships. The water was clear and the bottom was white with sand and shells, while strange bright fish darted about as they paddled along. On the island were parrots and other birds of gay plumage flitting from tree to tree as if startled by the coming of the first white men into their world. Columbus did not need his armed soldiers. After looking a long while, he saw naked red men peering at them from behind the strange tropical plants. After he made signs of friendship, the natives were no longer afraid. Christopher Columbus was first to set foot on the newfound shore. Falling on his knees, his eyes filled with tears of joy, he bowed his face and kissed the sand of the new world. The happy company repeated prayers and sang a hymn of praise. The naked natives looked on with wonder to see the leader, who was dressed in rich red velvet, set up a red, white and gold banner, the combined flag of Ferdinand and Isabella, and go through a long ceremony. They did not know that those white strangers were claiming the country in the name of a king and queen far across the sea. Columbus named this island, one of the group now called Bahamas, San Salvador or Holy Savior. He still thought he had reached the Far East. Admiral Columbus returned to Spain to report upon his reaching eastern India by sailing west. With him went ten of the red men he had found, whom he called Indians. He made several voyages after that, only once landing on the continent of South America. Some of his Spanish followers were jealous of their Italian admiral, and Columbus died in a prison in Spain, after all he had done for that country, without even knowing that it was America, not India, that he had discovered. End of chapter 16「among the lads in many lands who were thrilled by the stories of Columbus and his discoveries was 12-year-old Ferdinand Magellan, a Portuguese boy. Like thousands of youths all over Europe, he then made up his mind to sail the seas and seek his fortune. Portugal, though a small country, was the home of many men of great energy and daring. A Portuguese explorer, Vasco da Gama, had sailed around the Cape of Good Hope at the southern point of Africa and discovered that way to India and the Moluccas, or Spice Islands. On these voyages, the Portuguese had landed, traded and taken possession of important parts of Africa. Others had followed in the wake of Columbus, discovering and claiming vast regions in South America. So young Magellan formed a partnership with another adventurer and started out on voyages of discovery. 
For nearly 10 years, he journeyed to and fro between his little homeland and various points in East Africa, India, the Malay Peninsula, and the islands beyond. Frequently, he had to fight battles with savage native tribes. In one battle, he received a wound that made him lame for life. When Magellan came home, he suggested to the king of Portugal that it would be a great thing for Portugal if a passage across or around America could be discovered, which would shorten the distance, time and expense of going from Europe to the Spice Islands. He hoped the king would equip a fleet for such a voyage of discovery, but the king refused and he set out for Spain to get help for his great undertaking. At this time, he received a letter from a friend who had settled in the Spice Islands, saying that he had discovered another new world larger than that found by Vasco da Gama. Magellan wrote to this friend that he would soon be visiting those islands himself, if not by way of Portugal, then by way of Spain. After a long wait, the Spanish king consented to furnish five ships with 234 officers and sailors and to stock them with provisions to last through a two-year voyage. It was agreed also that Magellan and his partner should receive one-twentieth of the profits of their undertaking and that they should be governors of the islands they discovered. At last, after two long years of waiting, Magellan's fleet was ready to sail. Crossing the Atlantic seemed an easy matter then, 27 years after the first voyage of Columbus. The first land they reached was the mainland of South America. The natives along the northern coast were friendly and ready to exchange enough fish for 10 men for a looking glass, a bushel of sweet potatoes for a bell, and several fowls or even one of their own children, for a butcher knife. Those people lived in huts and went almost naked, except for aprons of parrot's feathers. There were many birds of bright plumage and plenty of monkeys in those regions. Some of the natives were cannibals, cooking and eating the flesh of men they captured or killed in battle. The little Spanish fleet coasted along toward the south. The wide mouth of the La Plata deceived them, so that they sailed in until they found that it was only a river. As they drew nearer to the South Pole, it grew intensely cold. The men on the ships begged Magellan to turn round and go home. Some of their number died of exposure and want, and the rest were afraid they could not live through such a winter. Not only did they suffer from the bitter cold, but their ships had been damaged by storms on the way down the coast. They stayed several weeks at a port in the country now called Patagonia without seeing a person. But one day, an Indian giant strode in upon them. He was so tall that the white man's heads barely came up to his waist. His hair was dyed white, his face colored red, and he had painted wide yellow circles around his little black eyes. When they let him see himself in a big steel mirror, he was so astonished that he jumped backward and knocked down four of the Spaniards standing around him. When he understood that it was himself he saw in the looking glass, he was pleased and they made him a present of a small metal mirror. They found the Patagonians to be savages of a very low and brutal type, who ate raw meat and even rats like beasts of prey. If they felt sick, they stuck arrows down their throats and gashed their foreheads with shell knives when their heads ached. Many of Magellan's men now turned against him, planning to murder him and those who stood by him, and then sailed back to Spain. Though they were the larger number, the energetic shipmaster beat them at their own game. He executed one ringleader and sailed away leaving another rebel on the shore, where he was, no doubt, soon killed or eaten by the cannibals. 
As July and August are the coldest months near the South Pole, the weather began to moderate in October, which is a spring month. January and February are the hot season in that climate. On the 21st of October, 1520, they saw an opening like onto a bay, and after sailing through its winding ways, they found to their great joy that it led out at the other end into a vast expanse of water. At last, they had discovered the only natural passage from sea to sea through the American continents. Some of their ships had been lost and their provisions were eaten. Most of the men backed to turn back, now that they could report that they had found a great ocean beyond South America. No one knows, they said, how wide this open sea is, and we may all starve before we reach the Moluccas. But Ferdinand Magellan would not turn back. He accused them of having faint hearts, and said that even if they had to eat the leather on the ship's yards, he would still go on and discover what he had promised the king of Spain. One dark night, the commander of the largest ship deserted the others and went back to Spain with the greater part of their provisions. The other ships were 38 days winding their way through the straits to which the great leader's name was afterward given, the Straits of Magellan. They saw so many fires in the land away to the south of them that they named it Terra del Fuego, Land of Fire. Brave Magellan's threat had to be carried out. All their provisions had either been eaten or were wholly unfit to eat. So all they had to live on for a long time was the leather on the ship's yards. They hung it over the sides of the ship to soak several days in the salt water as they sailed along. Then they cooked it over a coal fire. The wide sea they were now crossing was so free from storms that Magellan named it the Pacific Ocean. After three months of hunger and thirst, risking their lives and their devotion to leader and country, they discovered a group of islands now named the Marianne or Ladrone Islands. Here, they enjoyed the luscious fruits and reveled in plenty of fresh water to drink. From the Ladrones, they sailed on and discovered the Philippines, where the natives were friendly and brought them coconuts, oranges, bananas, fowls, and palm wine, which they gladly exchanged for metal-looking glasses, rat caps, beads, and trinkets. Besides his wish to sail around the globe and take possession of new islands for Spain, Magellan's great desire was to make the savage people Christians. He had the happiness of seeing thousands of dusky islanders kneeling before the crosses he had set up. But in his zeal to show those heathen the power of the Christian's God, he led the warriors of one island in a fight against some unconverted savages and lost his life. In three years, lacking twelve days from the time they started out, the ship Victoria returned to the Spanish port from which it had sailed after making the first voyage around the world. This vessel was loaded with spices from the Moluccas as Magellan had planned. A faithful lieutenant represented their deported leader at the court of King Charles of Spain who rewarded the few survivors with high honors and liberal pensions. End of chapter 17。Chapter 18 of Hero Tales from History。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcus Miller-Zuffle. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Cortes the Conqueror. Among the millions of people who wondered at the strange stories of the new lands discovered by Columbus was Hernando, a seven-year-old son of a Spanish noble family named Cortes. His young mind was filled with longing for adventure. As soon as he was old enough, 
Hernando left home to seek his fortune on the island of Santo Domingo in the New World. The governor of this island was pleased with the manner, pluck, and energy of Cortes, and offered to sell him a large estate on easy terms. But the young Spaniard answered haughtily, I did not come here to plow like a field laborer. I came to get gold. It was not long before young Cortes saw a chance for adventure. He went with a Spanish governor to settle the island of Cuba. He soon became a favorite with this governor also. An adventurer returned from the part of the mainland now called Central America and Mexico with tales of the great wealth of the people called Aztecs and of the gold mines there. The governor of Cuba decided to send ships and men to conquer that country and offered the command to Cortes, who worked like a hero to get ready for the campaign. He equipped 11 vessels with 600 men. A hundred or more of these were sailors and workmen, and the rest soldiers, some of whom were armed with muskets and some with crossbows. There were 14 small cannon and 16 horses in the outfit. As Cortes was about to sail, the governor of Cuba changed his mind and sent an order to Havana giving the command of the expedition to another officer. But true young Cortes got wind of this in time and sailed away before the governor's messengers arrived. The soldiers and other men of the expedition agreed to stand by the brave leader and capture the new country for King Charles of Spain in their own name instead of the Cuban governors. This was exactly what that governor feared Cortes would try to do. When the Spaniards landed on the continent, the natives were afraid. They had never seen a horse, and they thought the men on horseback were monster human beings with four legs, half man and half horse. Yet they came bravely out of their hiding places to do battle with such frightful invaders. Then the Spaniards fired a cannon volley and shot off their muskets so that several of the Indians fell dead. They are gods, shouted the natives in deadly fear. They have the thunder and lightning in their hands. It did not take long for Cortes to make terms with these natives, some of whom became allies and interpreters for the Spaniards. After founding a city at the coast, which he named Villa Rica de la Vera Cruz, rich city of the True Cross, now called Vera Cruz, Cortes prepared to conquer the empire of the Aztecs with 600 Spaniards and several thousand Mexican Indians. Montezuma, emperor of the Aztecs, heard of his coming and tried to make him leave the country by sending rich presents from his capital in the mountains. But that did not stop Cortes. In order to ensure victory, the Spanish general committed a brave though desperate act. Choosing one ship from his fleet, he manned it and sent a trusted officer back to Spain, not Cuba, with some of Montezuma's rich presents. With these, Cortes sent other proofs of the wealth of the country which he was about to conquer and add to the empire of King Charles of Spain. Then, after taking from the other ten ships everything the Spaniards could use in the new country, Cortes ordered those vessels burned and sunk. Thus, having burned their bridges behind them, they had no way of escape but to go forward and fight for their fortunes, their country, and their very lives. On the march of 200 miles to Montezuma's capital, the Spaniards beat the Tlaxcalans in battle and made friends with those Indians against the Aztec tyrant, as the Indians called Emperor Montezuma. The Indians of the hot countries of America were not so savage as those who lived in the northern parts of the continent. 
but they had a terrible religious rite, which they had learned from the Aztecs. They offered human lives to appease the sun god. Though the Aztecs were a peaceable people otherwise, they often went to war to take prisoners for these horrible sacrifices. Cortes broke into a temple at one place on the way and murdered the priests who were killing and offering human beings to the sun god. He set up a cross and invited the people to become Christians or be killed. In that way, he gained many converts from among the frightened Indians. But with Hernando Cortes, this kind of conversion was but a step toward gaining gold and power for himself and for the king of Spain. After many terrible battles, in which he massacred the helpless natives by thousands, he and his few hundred white men, with thousands of Indian allies, reached the capital of Montezuma. Built of stone on an island in the midst of a beautiful lake, this civilized city was connected with the mainland by six long stone bridges or causeways. The splendid capital, with its palaces and temples of hewn stone, had much of the beauty of Venice. The city measured 12 miles around. It was then hundreds of years old and proved that the ancient Aztecs knew how to build great stone houses and bridges. Montezuma came out to meet Cortes, born on a golden throne on the shoulders of Aztec nobles and officials. He wore priceless feathers and his garments were embroidered with many colored gems. Even his shoes were gold. His courtiers carried carpets to lay down before him so that his sacred feet should not touch the ground. How the eyes of those greedy Spaniards glittered when they beheld such signs of the great wealth of Montezuma and his people. The white men were received with great honor. They were served in golden goblets with a strange, rich drink which the Aztecs named Chocolatl. This delicious drink is now called chocolate or cocoa. Montezuma told the Spaniards that their coming had been foretold by the priests for hundreds of years, ever since the visit of a pure white man, the son of the sun, who had come down from the skies. This sun god had told the Aztecs that he would come again with other sun gods and reign over the empire forever. Cortes pretended to be the long-expected fair god of the Aztecs, and persuaded Montezuma to visit him in the palace assigned to the Spanish leader and his officers during their stay in the city. The people, who had no reason to believe in the Spanish soldiers, crowded around the sedan chair of their king, crying out against him because he was placing himself in the wicked hands of the strangers. Montezuma had told them not to fear, for their guests were honorable men and he was sure that all would be well with him. But he soon found that he was not a guest but a prisoner, betrayed by a pretense of friendship. The Mexicans came again and attacked the palace which Cortes and his men had now turned into a fortress. During the months when the Spaniards held Montezuma as a prisoner, a fierce war was waged with the Mexicans. While Cortes and his army were in such desperate straits, word came that the governor of Cuba had sent ships and nearly a thousand men to bring the general and his followers back to be punished as deserters. Cortes and a picked band crept out of the capital one dark night, marched hundreds of miles to the coast and surprised and defeated the army the governor had sent. Then he returned, with all those armed men and many more cannon and horses, to relieve the small garrison he had left to hold the many thousands of Aztecs at bay, and capture the city of Mexico. The Aztecs were frightened when they saw the thousand soldiers Cortes now brought up against them, 
for it looked as if the new troops had come down from the skies to the help of the Spaniards. When the battle was fiercest, the broken-spirited emperor went out to plead with the natives to stop their fighting. This made them so angry that they hurled stones at him and he died of a broken heart. The hatred of his own people was even harder to bear than the Spanish cruelty. After more fierce fighting, Cortes completed the conquest of Mexico. Years afterward, he returned to his old home in Spain, where he was, for a time, treated as a great conqueror. But he suffered in later years from remorse for his treachery and cruelty. When he grew old, he was imprisoned through the influence of Spanish enemies. One day, an old broken man with shaggy gray locks pushed through the crowd around King Charles of Spain, now known as Emperor Charles V, and the most powerful monarch in the world. When the emperor asked the old man who he was, he replied with indignant pride, I am Cortes, the man who has given you more provinces than your ancestors left you cities. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of Hero Tales from History」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcus Miller Zuffle Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham De Soto, a gold hunter in the southern swamps Hernando de Soto was the Spanish grandee, or noble, appointed governor of Cuba and the Floridas about 25 years after Florida was discovered. It was Ponce de Leon who landed near the southern point of North America on Easter Day 1513 and named that lovely country Florida, land of flowers. De Leon had heard a beautiful story that far inland in the heart of the wilderness there was a magic spring that would make young forever all who drank of its sparkling waters. Though he searched long and eagerly, Ponce de Leon discovered no fountain of eternal youth, but he did find endless swamps full of snakes and alligators. De Soto, the new governor of Florida, made up his mind that Ponce de Leon was a very foolish old man. He ought to have known that there are no such things nowadays as springs of eternal youth. He, Hernando de Soto, was going to show his practical good sense by finding solid yellow gold, for what good is youth without money to enjoy it with? De Soto was already a very rich man, for he had served under Pizarro, the cruel conqueror of Peru, and he had gone home to Spain one of the wealthiest of its grandees, in those days of wonderful discoveries and marvelous fortunes. Still, Hernando de Soto was not satisfied. He wanted to be like Pizarro or Cortes, to conquer a great country and capture from its dusky people gold mines and vast wealth. Therefore, on a bright July day, he left Cuba in charge of a high official and sailed away. He and his knights in armor stood on the decks of their nine ships, large and small, and waved farewells to the fair ladies who stood on the castle tower at Havana, weeping bitterly, fearing that they would never see their brave lords and knights again. Governor de Soto and his fleet came to anchor in the harbor now known as Tampa Bay. During the night, they were aroused by horrible yells and showers of arrows from the shore. In the morning, the Spaniards made a landing, though the natives fought hard to keep them back. Before night, they met a man who could be of great use to them. He was a member of a party that, after de Leon's discovery, had gone to Florida to find gold, but had been driven back. This young man, 
Juan Ortiz, had been captured and kept by the Indians as a slave. A member of De Soto's scouting party tells how they met this poor fellow. Towards sunset, it pleased God that the soldiers described at a distance some twenty Indians painted with a kind of red ointment that they put on when they go to war. They wore many feathers and had their bows and arrows. And when the Christians ran at them, the Indians fled to a hill, and one of them came forth into the path, lifting up his voice and saying in Spanish, Sirs, for the love of God, slay not me, for I am Christian like yourselves. I was born in Seville, and my name is Juan Ortiz. The Spanish governor received Ortiz as if he were his own long-lost son. He made himself very useful because he knew both the Spanish and the Indian language, and thus could help the Spaniards to talk to the natives. De Soto now started inland, leading a brilliant company of knights and private soldiers, all in bright armor. Over the shining helmets were waving plumes, and many a mailed first held aloft a rich and beautiful banner. They were hundreds of horsemen, and many more men marching on foot. No more richly dressed men and horses ever started out on a crusade to regain possession of the holy city. But the object of this Spanish quest was gold. Spanish serving men drove along with this rich and gay procession 400 fat hogs. De Soto had decided not to risk being starved to death, as so many explorers had been. And gamekeepers held in leash, not falcons to catch and kill birds or beasts, but bloodhounds for hunting Indians. Instead of mountains of rocks from which gold could be mined, De Soto's men found swamps. The weather was sultry and moist. Insects got inside their knightly armor and stung them to madness, and venomous serpents coiled around their armored legs. Indians shot poisoned arrows at them from the bushes. Their coats of mail were so heavy that stout knights sank deep in the bogs. They advanced very slowly, they wallowed rather than marched, and their days and nights were spent in weariness and torture. The fame of the white man went on ahead of them. As De Soto advanced, he found the savages on the warpath ready to drive back the invaders. All along their line of march, they could hear savage threats in the distance. Juan Ortiz told the Spaniards that the Indians were shouting, Keep on, robbers and murderers! In Appalachia, you will get what you deserve! No mercy will be shown to captives who will be hung on the highest trees along the trail! After the Spaniards had marched through the lands of five different chiefs, they found a great chieftain who seemed to wish to make friends with the white men. De Soto gladly accepted, but Juan Ortiz warned him to look out for treachery. So the white men were secretly prepared, and when the traitor chief gave the signal to his men to attack, the Spaniards raised their battle cry, Santiago! and thousands of the savages were killed by a few hundred Spaniards. Hundreds of Indians took refuge in a lake. There five good swimmers would lie side by side, on the surface like logs, forming a human raft on which the best archer would stand and shoot back at the white men. The fight lasted all day and nearly all night. Before morning, all the Indians were killed or captured, put in chains, and divided among the Spaniards as slaves. The Indians, who at first thought the white men were gods, were now sure they were devils. The boasted village of Appalachia was only a few straw huts on a knoll in the center of a great swamp, and the savages who defended it with bows and arrows were no match for armed Spaniards. The white man killed nearly all of them. Cold weather came on, 
and the Spaniards went into winter quarters. A beautiful Indian girl chief in that region came bringing pearls and gems to the Spanish chieftain, but he demanded gold. When she understood this, she sent men to a far country for the yellow metal he desired so eagerly. De Soto and his men now rejoiced, for they thought they had found the object of their long and painful search. When the red messengers returned, the stuff proved not to be gold. It must have been copper ore, or fool's gold. During the second year of their long march, the Spaniards were led southward to Mabila, which is believed to have stood on the shore of Mobile Bay. This was a huge fortress, the greatest native town the white man had yet seen. Within an immense stockade, or wall of tree trunks on end, stood a number of houses, each of which would hold hundreds of Indians. Tuscaloosa, the Mobile chief, set a trap for the Spaniards. The battle which took place here was the worst of all. The Spaniards lost 70 men and 40 horses. Then they set fire to the Indians' houses, and the savages perished in the flames. De Soto's men were heartily sick of fighting. They also despaired of finding gold in the southern swamps. The governor heard here that they were plotting to desert him at Mabila and returned by boat to Havana. So instead of waiting for a ship to come from Cuba, he ordered them to march farther into the wilderness. As the prospect of finding gold became more desperate, De Soto seemed to grow more cruel. Indians were beheaded for small offenses. Friendly scouts were tortured and sent back with insulting messages to their chiefs. The farther west the Spaniards went, the more bitterly the natives fought and the more successful they were in battle. In one place, the Indians burnt nearly all the Spaniards' hogs and feasted on roast pork for many days. After terrible wanderings, the few remaining Spaniards came to a wide stream at Chickasaw Bluff, a few miles above the present city of Vicksburg. Though it is often stated that De Soto discovered the Mississippi, he was not the first Spaniard to see that wide and muddy stream. The great river meant nothing to him. As he wandered up and down its banks, he contracted malarial fever and died miserably. Faithful friends placed the body in his heavy armor and wrapped that in blankets weighted with sand. Then, on a dark night, they pedaled out into the middle of the stream and sank it in a hundred feet of water, where the Indians could not find it and wreak their revenge upon De Soto's remains. His followers attempted to go farther west, but became discouraged and descended the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. End of chapter 19 Recording by Marcus Miller Zufle Chapter 20 of Hero Tales from History This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Wayne Cook Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham Sir Francis Drake, England's First Great Sailor Among little Francis Drake's earliest memories was his home in the hulk of an old ship near a navy yard in the south of England. His father was a sort of chaplain to the fleets which kept coming and going there. Francis heard the wild tales of seafaring men, about pirates and Spaniards and sea fights and the wonderful wealth in distant lands. Young Drake's soul was fired with a fervent longing for life and adventure on the high seas or the Spanish main, as the region along the northern coast of South America was called, where wedges of gold and silver from Peru and pearls and precious stones were stored in treasure towns waiting to be shipped to Spain. 
but francis was the eldest of twelve children and his father was poor so the lad was bound out till he was twenty-one to work for a skipper or owner of a small trading vessel called a bark in his work there was plenty of lifting and lugging to do moving baskets and bales on and off of his master's boat he had to work long hours often at night his food was scarce and coarse and his pay was very small indeed for his work was thought not worth much more than his learning the sailor trade sometimes they sailed the bark across the channel to france or holland and brought back a cargo to england but that was as far as such a small craft could be trusted to go francis often saw great ships riding high on their majestic way to foreign lands and he felt sure that those lucky sailors would have thrilling times with pirates and spaniards and come home loaded down with gold and silver spices precious gems and thrilling stories much as he yearned to go on a long voyage the faithful fellow stayed by his master worked hard and learned all the ins and outs of sailing a ship whether large or small just before francis was old enough to be his own man the good skipper died and as he had never married and had no near relatives he left his bark to his faithful apprentice young drake continued the business running from port to port and market to market for about a year when he saw a chance to sail on a longer voyage and engage in a larger enterprise he had a cousin john hawkins who was captain of a vessel this cousin now had a little fleet of five ships and was about to engage in the slave trade as francis had learned to manage a ship captain hawkins offered to put the smallest vessel in his fleet under his young cousin's command so francis sold his bark and became captain of his cousin's ship judith now at the age of twenty-two francis drake was embarking on the voyage of life with a prospect of great adventures as he had always dreamed of doing slave trading was not considered wrong four hundred years ago the ships would go to africa and buy or carry off negroes and take them to some foreign country to work in fields and mines there the blacks would be sold for gold silver pearls and other things of great value sometimes the owner of a fleet would make a fortune in a single adventure of course there was a great risk to run although england and spain were not then at war the english and spanish treated each other as enemies when they met on the high seas for this voyage captain hawkins got leave of queen elizabeth quote, to load negroes in guinea and sell them in the west indies end quote as a sign that the hundred and seventy men on Hawkins' fleet saw nothing wrong in stealing black men from their homes and selling them to be slaves, here is a motto which that captain had written to govern his soldiers and sailors. Serve God daily, love one another, preserve your victuals, beware of fire, and keep good company. Hawkins and Drake seemed to have had no trouble in seizing Negroes on the coast of Africa, or in selling their human cargo in the Spanish ports of America. But as these slavers were starting back to England, they were caught in a storm and had to go into a harbor in Mexico for safety and to repair damages. While they were there, a Spanish fleet, five times as large as theirs, loaded with gold and pearls, came in also for repairs. The English agreed to leave the Spaniards without touching their ships if the Spaniards would let them alone. But the Spanish captain did not keep his word, and there was a fierce battle. Hawkins and Drake did great damage to the Spanish fleet. They reached England safely with two of their ships, though they had lost nearly all the treasures they had received as pay for the slaves. Captain Drake complained to the Queen of the way in which the Spaniards had deceived them but she was afraid to go to war with a country which had such a powerful navy as Spain's was then. So the bold English captain took matters into his own hands. He made one voyage after another, attacking Spanish settlements where gold and silver were stored, boarding Spanish vessels, killing the men or taking them prisoner, and bringing their rich cargoes to England. Within a few years the Spaniards lived in terror of their lives, 
when they heard that Francis Drake was near, and the King of Spain appealed to Queen Elizabeth to stop those attacks, calling Drake the master thief of the Western world. On one of these expeditions, Drake landed on the Isthmus of Panama, or Darien, as it was then called. Some of the natives showed him the way across to the South Sea, or the Pacific Ocean, as Magellan had named it, and when they had ascended a mountain about halfway across, Drake climbed a tall tree from which he gazed upon the broad, unexplored ocean. May God give me leave and life to sail that sea but once, murmured Captain Drake to his companions. But Queen Elizabeth had heard of the terror of the Spaniards and ordered him to stop, lest he plunge her kingdom into a Spanish war before England was ready. So, for a while, Francis Drake stayed at home and suffered because he was not allowed to fight with the Spaniards. About five years after his first sight of the Pacific, Captain Drake sailed away from England in command of a fleet of five vessels, of which the flagship was the Golden Hind. The object of the voyage was a secret. This was about sixty years after Magellan, the Portuguese master sailor, had discovered and passed through the straits named for him. It took five months for the fleet to reach the eastern coast of South America. In due time they found and passed through the Straits of Magellan. But the ocean beyond was more terrific than Pacific, for a fierce storm drove the Golden Hind even further south than Tierra del Fuego, so that Drake was first to land at Cape Horn, the southernmost point of South America. At the place where the waters of the Atlantic met those of the Pacific, Drake lay down and embraced the sharp point of rock and exclaimed, I am the only man in the world who has ever been so far south. All the ships in Drake's fleet but the Golden Hind had either been sunk, broken, or scattered. Now at last he had leave and life to sail that sea but once, with one ship alone. The undaunted hero sailed up the western coast of South America to capture treasures from the gold mines of Peru. When he came near Valparaiso, some Spaniards in a ship saw the Golden Hind approach. Never dreaming that an English ship could be in that ocean, they were astonished to see a gun presented through a porthole and to hear an English voice calling on them roughly to surrender. So they stared and cursed under their breath while the master thief of the western world took charge of their ship with 60,000 gold pesos, jewels, merchandise, and a stock of wine. When the people of Valparaiso heard that the dreadful Drake was in their harbor, they fled from the city. The little English crew entered the town and stocked up with bread, bacon, and wine, which they enjoyed to the full after many months of famishing. In a day or two, the Golden Hind sailed away northward toward Peru. At another port they waylaid three unguarded barks and captured fifty-seven bricks of silver, each weighing about twenty pounds. When they came to the port of Lima, there were seventeen vessels anchored in the harbor. Not daunted by numbers, Drake sailed right into the harbor, captured them all with his one ship, and made their men prisoners while he plundered the whole Spanish fleet. By this time the alarm had been spread along the coast that Drake was capturing everything in sight, and the governor of Peru with two thousand men was waiting for him at Cayo. Drake's good luck seemed now to desert him. In the presence of that waiting army the wind died down, and the golden hind was becalmed, helpless, and unable to move a yard. The Spanish governor grinned as he went out in boats from the shore with four hundred soldiers to take back all the precious cargo Drake had lately captured. But before the armed men reached the English ship, a gale blew up and Drake sailed away, laughing and waving farewells to his pursuers. The cargo from the last ship they captured overloaded the Golden Hind with tons of gold, silver, and precious gems. It was useless to overhaul any more galleons, for they now had all their ship could carry. Their only thought was to get their treasure home, safe and sound. Sailing across the Pacific, they were sixty-eight days without sighting land. 
the golden hind began to show the strain of her long voyage. So they set up a forge on an island in the South Pacific and spent weeks in making repairs so that the ship might complete her voyage around the world. After they had sailed more than a month longer, the ship ran on a ledge of rocks. Seeing that they could not get her off, they threw six cannon overboard, then the sugar and spices, then great fortunes in silver. At last they managed to work her off the ledge into deep water. Still, it was nearly a year before they reached the harbor of Plymouth, England. The wildest dreams of the boy Francis Drake were now more than realized. All England buzzed with his astounding exploits. The city bells rang, and there was a general holiday with feasting and dancing. Queen Elizabeth came down from London and dined with the great captain on the Golden Hind. Before she left the deck, the captain knelt before her, and she tapped him on the shoulder with his sword, thus knighting him Sir Francis Drake. After this, the greatest of the English knights of the high sea made many voyages, dealing out destruction to Spanish galleons and treasure stores. He attacked cities and burned fleets, reporting to the queen that he had just singed the Spanish king's beard. Drake was one of the four chiefs in command of the English ships that destroyed the Spanish Armada. No one did more than he to take the sea power away from Spain and give it to England, and thus make it possible for the English to begin the settlement of our country. End of chapter 20、Chapter、Twenty One of Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Chapter Twenty One Sir Walter Raleigh, the Favorite of Good Queen Bess. A gay company was waiting before the old palace at Greenwich, beside the river Thames below the city of London, on a summer afternoon in the days of Elizabeth. They were watching for the queen and her intimates to come down the broad steps in front of her palace. There had been a shower, and the trees, grass, and bright flowers glistened in the sunshine. Here comes her majesty, exclaimed some in the waiting throng, as a woman in middle life descended the steps, attended by the Earl Leicester and other nobles and knights whose names are well known to history. The queen was slender. With her light auburn hair dressed up from her high, pale brow. Her chief mark of beauty was her small, delicate hands with long, taper fingers, of which she was rather vain. She was richly dressed in a heavy silk brocade, and a collar of costly lace stood up from her shoulders behind her slender neck like an open fan. The court, after receiving her gracious meet greetings, Followed the queen a grand promenade through the park. As Elizabeth soon came to a spot where the recent shower had left a shallow pool of water, a quaint writer describes this scene. Her Majesty, meeting with a placid place, made some scruples to go on. When Raleigh, dressed in the gay and genteel habit of those times, presently cast off and spread his new plush cloak on the ground, whereon the queen. Trod gently over, regarding him afterwards with many suits for his so free and seasonable tender, of so fair a footcloth. Walter Raleigh was a handsome young man, six feet tall, with curly brown hair and beard. He had been a soldier in France and an officer in Ireland, and had made several voyages of discovery with his gallant half brother Sir Humphrey Gilbert. It was the fashion. Indeed, it seemed necessary then, for men at court to flatter the middle-aged maiden queen, who was foolish enough to believe that she was as lovely as they told her she was. The Earl of Leicester once entertained her at Kenilworth Castle, where he had all 
the clock stopped on the moment of her arrival to show that no notice should be taken of the passing of time during her visit there so queen bess could hardly help feeling flattered when such a gallant and good-looking courtier as raleigh bowed before her and laid his cloak as a velvet carpet for her to walk upon riches lands castles and even happiness go by favour in royal circles some time after this the queen made her favourite a knight with the title sir before his name one day the queen saw raleigh taking a diamond ring off his finger and scratching something on a window-pane fain would i climb yet fear i to fall then she took from her own slim hand a diamond and cut in the glass under what he had written this rhyme if thy heart fall thee climb not at all of course each reigning favourite of the queen became an object of envy to the rest of the court lord leicester who was now slighted by her majesty from this new knight did all he could to injure raleigh the young earl of essex did his utmost later to turn the queen against sir walter but for a long time raleigh remained high in favour raleigh was the first englishman to attempt to plant a little colony in the new world by way of compliment to the maiden queen he named the whole region which he was trying to settle virginia returning from an early voyage he introduced into ireland the potato first found in south america he also discovered the pineapple so named because it was shaped like a pine cone and imported it to england another thing raleigh is said to have introduced into england was tobacco which the american indians raised and drank as they called smoking in pipes of copper and clay raleigh had a silver pipe made for his own use one day he was smoking in his library a manservant came in with a pot of ale and thinking his master was on fire yelled with fright as he poured the ale over him it is said that the queen asked her walter to smoke in her presence but when she tried to learn to use tobacco in that way she stopped because it made her ill sir walter raleigh was in active command of a number of english ships in the fleet which defeated the invincible armada sent against england by king philip the second of spain for her favourite's part in that great adventure the queen made him an admiral later he was wounded in a naval battle near cadiz spain when asked what had been done for him on account of his heroic services there admiral raleigh sadly replied what the generals have got i know least for my own part i have got a lame leg and deformed i have not wanted good words and exceeding kind and regardful usage but i have possession of naught but poverty and pain someone must have told the queen of this speech for she called raleigh back to the palace and appointed him once more her captain of the guard when queen elizabeth died james stuart king of scotland became king james's mind had been poisoned against raleigh whose enemies told the new king that raleigh plotted to place james's cousin arabella stuart upon the throne of england so sir walter raleigh was imprisoned in the tower of london he was confined there for twelve years though he proved that the things his enemies had said against him were untrue one wicked creature who had accused him confessed that his story about raleigh was made up out of spite during the long years of his imprisonment sir walter wrote his history of the world and experimented in a rude chemical laboratory which he had fixed up in his prison he also wrote beautiful poems and made many letters to his friends for some time lady raleigh was allowed to visit him with their son carew the older son walter had been killed in an encounter while on a voyage with his father seeking el dorado or the city of gold supposed to lie hidden in northern south america at last word came from king james that if raleigh would go and find those fabled gold mines for his benefit his high treason would be forgiven so the white-haired knight 
lame from a wound he had received in loyal service of england started out on another voyage of adventure to fight the spaniard to the bitter end but sir walter was only hoping against hope for there was no such mine there and the expedition proved an utter failure instead of escaping to another country as he might well have done he went back and bravely told king james that the el dorado story was only a spanish lie so the disappointed king ordered raleigh back to prison and a corrupt judge pronounced him guilty of high treason for that crime the raleigh's beautiful home estate might legally become the property of the crown and raleigh himself condemned to death raleigh made the best even of this terrible experience he cheered his wife by telling her that he was ready and glad to go where she would come to where they would be happy together always on his way to execution raleigh noticed a man with a bald head and no hat taking off his own cap he tossed it down to the old man with you need this my friend more than i do on the scaffold he made a patriotic speech to the assembled crowd then he asked to see the axe he smiled as he tried the edge of it with his thumb and remarked to the executioner who stood before him dressed as he was the custom in black velvet tights with the black mask over his face this gives me no fear it is sharp and fair medicine to cure me of all my troubles End of chapter twenty one read by Elijah Fisher Chapter twenty two of Hero Tales from History This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Recording by Betty B. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham henry hudson the man who put himself on the map just as magellan set out to discover a way through america from the atlantic to the pacific ocean so henry hudson determined to find a northwest passage from ocean to ocean the reason for wishing to cross in the north from one ocean to the other was to save going round the horn as sailors call the long voyage around cape horn the southern point of south america we now know that there is no northwest passage at least if there is such a waterway it is so near the north pole that it is always frozen up but henry hudson like all sailors in his time thought that it would be a simple matter to sail through the open polar sea and pass from the atlantic to the pacific north of north america in sixteen o seven this bold british navigator undertook a voyage in the employ as he wrote in his journal of certain worshipful merchants of london the object of this voyage was to explore the coast of greenland and as he explained for to discover a passage by the north pole to japan and china his crew numbered only twelve persons including one boy his own son john after sailing about for five months suffering great hardships hudson returned to london without discovering that northern passage the next year he started out again this time sailing northeast along the coast of norway and returned after four months without finding anything but hardships hudson's third voyage was made in the employ of the dutch east india company he sailed from amsterdam holland with a crew of twenty men and his young son on the half moon he started out a second time for a northeast passage but he found so many difficulties that he turned his prow westward again determined to discover the way past north america about the fourth of july sixteen o nine he came to the grand banks of newfoundland where he saw a fleet of frenchmen fishing for cod after catching over a hundred of these fish for themselves the crew of the half moon proceeded to the southwest as hudson had heard from his friend captain john smith that there was an open way to the pacific south of virginia after wandering down the coast and back the half moon entered a broad bay and anchored beside an island which the natives called manhattan hudson took possession of this region in the name of his dutch employers and named it new netherland here he traded with the indians and sailed a little way up the beautiful river which now bears his name here one of his men wrote in the journal the land grew very high and mountainous hudson and his crew were afraid of the indians 
they captured two red men and tried to hold them as prisoners they thought that the other indians would treat the white men well for fear that hudson would kill these two prisoners but they made their escape through a porthole and swam to the shore as the half moon got under way again the two indians and their friends stood on the bank war whooping brandishing tomahawks and calling for vengeance the half moon sailed on upstream and towards night came to anchor near what is now catskill landing there as it is written in the journal of the voyage we found very loving people and very old men where we were well used our boat went to fish and caught great store of very good fish the next morning the fishing was not so good the savages having been there in their canoes all night in the two days following the ship went only five miles farther up the river hudson was kindly received by an old chief who gave him the best cheer he could the natives came flocking on board the ship bringing grapes pumpkins and beaver and otter skins which they traded with the sailors for hatchets knives beads and trinkets the ship's log states that they gave some of the savages brandy to drink one of these men fell sound asleep to the astonishment of the others who feared he had been poisoned they took to their canoes and paddled for shore after a long powwow a few of the indians returned with a quantity of beads they wanted to pay the white man to lift the spell which they had put upon the sleeping indian the next day the intoxicated indian was walking about well and happy after his first taste of fire water this made his friends believe in the white men again and the journal goes on to say so at three o'clock in the afternoon they came aboard and brought tobacco and more beads and gave them to our master and made an oration and showed him all the country round about then they sent one of their company on land who presently returned and brought a great platter full of venison dressed by themselves and they caused him to eat with them then they made him reverence and departed all save the old men that lay aboard hudson found that it would not be safe to take the ship beyond the site of the present city of albany so the half moon's prow was turned downstream on the way back the sailors were met by the two escaped prisoners with quite a company of savages more than a hundred braves surrounded the ship one climbed up the rudder and others swarmed over the sides the crew fired upon them with their muskets and with the cannon blew holes in their canoes the thunder and lightning from the guns frightened the indians so that they fled to the shore and took to the woods hudson himself had had enough the half moon lifted its anchor and sailed away from the river whose name is henry hudson's most glorious monument stopping in england on his way to holland he was engaged by the london company to make another voyage in their behalf the following year this time the ship he commanded was the discovery the course was past iceland around the southern part of greenland sighting desolation island which he charted as in the northern part of davis strait through the strait which now bears his name he entered the sea known for all time as hudson bay this crew was a bad set of men one young fellow whom captain hudson had picked up and befriended in london proved the worst of the gang they did not face their hardships and sufferings with real courage when starvation stared them in the face every man looked out for himself they hoarded food and robbed and fought one another like wild beasts at last they turned against hudson saying that he had brought them there to starve the young man to whom hudson had been kindest of all bound his master the rest tied up the six men who were most loyal to their chief and hudson's son these eight men were put bound into the ship's boat then the crew hoisted the sail of the discovery they towed the little boat for a time as they <clears throat> as if they were loath to do the dastardly deed that they had planned but when they reached the open sea they cut the rope and the little boat containing henry hudson and his son was never again seen by white men the ungrateful young man met a fate he richly deserved in a fight with arctic savages he was killed and several of the rest were mortally wounded still others died of want before the few remaining deserters were picked up starving by a passing vessel their names are forgotten and they are only remembered at all because of their wicked treachery but the map of north america is a fitting monument to the heroic but ill-fated adventurer and discoverer henry hudson end of chapter twenty two
Chapter Twenty Three Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Chapter Twenty Three La Salle and the Mouth of the Mississippi. Little is known now of the early life of Robert Cavalier de la Salle, until, at twenty-five or a little less, he came from Rouen, France, to Montreal. But of his life in America, in those days when the land was still a howling wilderness, there is much to tell. He was born a century and a half after Columbus thought he had found the coast of China. Yet this young Frenchman still believed that China was only a little farther west than the land Columbus found, for he had but a narrow idea of the width of America. The people who were living in Canada, the new country along the river St. Lawrence, were French. They traded with the Indians and trapped and skinned wild animals for their fur. Those were the days of Indian scouts and wigwams, and of war and scalp dances. Many of the French lived like Indians. They played Indian games, running, shooting, snowshoeing, lacrosse, and they learned to hunt and ride, and to travel stealthily through the forests like real red men. So the Indians liked the French people better than they liked other white settlers. The French called their scouts wood runners. These brave, shrewd messengers went out among the Indian tribes and learned their languages and customs. Many of them ran from tribe to tribe thousands of miles into the wilderness and came back to the French settlement with skins of the mink, beaver, otter, and other animals. They also had strange stories to tell of meadows, which they called prairies, as level as a floor and hundreds of miles wide, where there were no trees except along the rivers. Down through this thousand-mile prairie region they said there were rivers which flowed together into a wide stream, which the Indians called the Mississippi, or Father of Waters, which kept on in a mighty flood to the unknown south country. These stories fired the fervent soul of Robert La Salle, he believed that mighty river should be used as a water highway to the South Sea, as the Pacific Ocean was still called, and that if they could sail down to its mouth, they would find an outlet to China, like the outlet which the St. Lawrence gave toward Europe. He was always talking about China, and trying in every way he could to raise money for canoes and food and Indian guides to find the way to China through the western wilderness. The French people laughed at his enthusiasm, and called some land which he owned beside the rapids above Montreal La Chine, French for China. That suburb of Montreal is still called La Chine, and the rapids are the La Chine Rapids. Not having wealth enough of his own, La Salle went to France to ask the king to approve his plan, and to provide money for the planting of the lilies of France on the banks of the Mississippi. La Salle's practical way of planting French lilies was to build and maintain forts at different points through all that great western country. Already Fort Frontenac had been built near the outlet of Lake Ontario, and Father Marquette, a heroic French missionary, accompanied by a trader named Joliet, had found the Mississippi and explored that great river for hundreds of miles. On his return to a French settlement, Joliet wrote to Count Frontenac, governor of Canada, telling of the dangers of his voyage. I had escaped every peril of the Indians. I had passed forty-two rapids, and was at the point of debarking, full of joy at the success of so long and difficult an enterprise, when my canoe capsized, after all the danger seemed over. 
I lost two men and my box of papers within sight of the first French settlements, which I had left almost two years before. Nothing remains to me but life, and the ardent desire to employ it on any service which you may please to direct. When Robert Lasselle had permission from the king and his treasurer, and had borrowed money of his rich relatives in France, he returned to Canada and made up a party of brave French and Indian guides, scouts, and interpreters, who were to fight, if need be, to plant the lilies and forts of France in the great western valley of the Father of Waters. After they had paddled through Lake Ontario and carried their canoes past Niagara Falls and the rapids above the falls, they built their sailboat, the Griffin. On this ship they sailed through the lakes to the lower end of Lake Michigan. They paddled their canoes down along the shore of that lake to the St. Joseph River, where they built Fort St. Joseph canoeing up this river which flows into lake michigan they carried their barks across to a little stream which led away from the lake toward the greater rivers of the south country on their way they saw indians of the illinois tribes and smoked the calumet or peace pipe with most of these red men some tribes were so savage and unfriendly that the white travelers were afraid to shoot game for food or even to build a fire lest a band of indians on the warpath should see it and come to kill and scalp them all but it seems to have been the fate of most discoverers to find their bitterest foes among those who should be their friends one of la salle's own party was caught just in time to keep him from shooting their leader in the back floating down a small stream the travelers came to the illinois river on their way among friendly tribes they shot plenty of game once they captured a huge bison or buffalo stuck in a swamp and left behind by the rest of the herd and feasted on buffalo meat for many days at last they came to a place now called lake peoria where the illinois is several miles wide they decided that this would be a good place to build a fort seeing smoke they guessed that it proceeded from the campfire of an illinois tribe which was said to be hostile to the french seeing wigwams in the distance la salle arranged the canoes in rows and pulled up to the indian camp there was a stir in the Illinois village. The Indian braves came out and received the white men as friends, and there were feasts and games and dances in honor of their French guests. The Indians said that La Salle and his friends might build a fort there. Built without delay, the fort was named Fort Breakheart, for Robert La Salle had been going through some heart-rending experiences. One of these was the loss of the lake boat, the Griffin, with all the supplies and equipments. When La Salle explained to the Illinois tribe what he was seeking, the chief gave him and his men a solemn warning of perilous falls and precipices, of cannibal tribes and man-eating monsters. He said that if they should get by those awful dangers, the mouth of the river was an awful whirlpool which would engulf them, for no man who had ever gone down into the mouth of the Father of Waters had returned alive. These stories so frightened the men of the party, both red and white, that they deserted their leader. They preferred to endure the ills they had and risk their lives among savages known to be cruel rather than fly to ills they knew not of. So La Salle had to go hundreds of miles back to Canada for more men, funds, and supplies before he could venture to make the rest of the trip. After many months' delay, he started out again from Montreal. There were now fifty-four in his party, twenty-three Frenchmen, eighteen braves, ten squaws to do the cooking, and three papooses. When they got back to Fort Breakheart, La Salle gave up building a ship, as he had decided to make the voyage down the Mississippi in canoes. 
There was plenty of game along the river, and in its muddy waters they caught catfish six feet long and weighing about two hundred pounds. They saw wild beans along the banks with stalks as big as your arm, reminding one of the tale of Jack and the Beanstalk. They had varied experiences with the different tribes of Indians, Chickasaw, Arkansas, Natchez, along their course, and found that the man-eating monsters, described by the Illinois chief, were only alligators. When at last they reached the mouth of the Father of Waters, there was no whirlpool to swallow them down, but the river calmly divided into three mouths, each leading into a broad expanse of salt water which, they learned, was not the Pacific Ocean, but the Gulf of Mexico. On a hill nearby, La Salle raised a wooden pillar on which he nailed the coat of arms bearing the lilies of France, and buried near it a leaden plate on which letters were engraved to tell future comers that the whole country drained by the Mississippi belonged to France. At last the patient worker and traveller had triumphed. He went back to Paris and reported all he had done in the name of his beloved king and country. Robert Cavalier de la Salle had done a greater thing than he realized. One hundred and twenty years later, Napoleon, emperor of the French, sold to the United States the territory of Louisiana, claimed by La Salle, which is now half of the great republic. This was an achievement which meant more than the discovery of an outlet to China. Although a boat may be sailed through long rivers and short canals from the mouth of the St. Lawrence to the mouth of the Mississippi, this fact is hardly thought worthy of mention in these days. A far greater benefit to America and the whole world was achieved by Robert La Salle because he enabled the French government to give to the United States her broad empire of the West. End of chapter 23「Chapter Twenty Four of Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Livingstone the white man of the dark continent. Little Davy Livingstone was a queer, quiet Scotch laddie. His father was a high-minded man, but he was so poor that he had to take Davy out of the village school when he was ten. In those days, the early part of the 19th century, children began to work when they were very young. So Mr. Livingstone sent the lad to work, with other boys of his own age, as a piecer in a cotton mill. David worked from six in the morning till eight at night, stopping only for lunch. With his first week's wages, the ten-year-old boy bought a Latin grammar. He was so eager to learn that he went to night school from eight till ten at night. He studied till midnight, and even later when his mother did not take his books away and send him to bed. His great desire was to be a missionary, so he took up other languages besides Latin and such studies as would fit him for missionary work. As soon as he was able, he went to London and elsewhere to study, working part of the time to earn enough to pay his way. On a visit to London, Livingstone met Dr. Moffat, a leading missionary in South Africa, and soon decided to work in Africa himself. He had prepared himself to help men's bodies as well as their souls, so he went first as a medical missionary. Dr. Livingstone's first mission station or centre was 700 miles further north than Dr. Moffat's in a region which was dangerous because of savage men, wild beasts, 
and worst of all, an unhealthful climate. In this lonely place, the new missionary began to tell the ignorant black people about the one true God. He cured them of their illnesses and showed them how to dig canals and build dams to water their little farms. He also taught them to till those farms in a better way than they had known. In the region there were many lions. One day, when the missionary was out of a band of natives, he met one of the big beasts. Livingstone and one of his black men shot at the lion, which sprang up with a roar and bounded into the bushes, through the circle the men had made round him. Then two more lions appeared. Before Livingstone could reload his gun, he saw one great brute with bristling mane and angry eyes springing upon him. Its weight bore him to the earth. The lion seized his shoulder with jaw strong enough to carry off an ox. When someone asked him afterward what he fought just then, Dr. Livingstone replied, I was wondering what part of me he would eat first. In a letter, the doctor described this adventure. With his terrible roar sounding in my ear, the lion shook me as a dog does a rat. But strange to say, I felt neither pain nor fear, though fully conscious of all that passed. As I turned to escape the weight of his paw which was resting on my head, I saw his eyes turned toward Melbowie, one of the natives, who was about to fire. But his gun missed fire in both barrels. Instantly, the lion quitted his hold of me and leaped on Mbawi, biting him badly in the thigh. Then he dashed at another man who was about to attack him with his spear. But at that moment, the previous shots the lion had received took effect, and he dropped to the ground, dead. Livingstone was bitten in eleven places. His arm was badly mangled, and bones were broken in several places. It was many months before he was well. The broken arm was always weak, and he bore the marks of that big lion's teeth to his dying day. While recovering from his wounds, Livingstone made the long journey to the home of Dr. Moffat, and married that gentleman's daughter, Mary. Miss Moffat was born in South Africa, so that she knew the language and ways of the people. This made her a true helpmeet to her husband in his noble work. Livingstone called himself Jack of all trades. I read in journeying, he wrote, but little at home. Building, gardening, cobbling, doctoring, tinkering, carpentering, gun mending, farrying, horse doctoring and shoeing, wagon mending, preaching, schooling, lecturing in divinity to a class of three, fill up my time. When Livingstone reached the country of one of the black tribes, thousands of miles to the north, all the people of the region, numbering six or seven thousand, poured out to see the white man. The missionary was greatly relieved to find that the chief of this region, who was only eighteen years old, was disposed to be friendly. The white man and his party were well cared for, and given plenty of good food, of which they were badly in need. They were nearly starved, because unfriendly natives on the way had refused to sell them food. In regions where the Arab slave traders had robbed, killed, and carried away and sold many of the natives, the people were afraid of Livingstone, for they thought all white men must be robbers and murderers. But in reality, the brave Scotch missionary was a great worker against the slave trade, writing and saying all he could to make people in Europe and England know how wicked it was. Although Livingstone journeyed about so much, travel was very hard and dangerous. He and his faithful men often had to go up to their necks in swamps, where the hot, moist air was filled with poisonous insects and to cross rivers in great peril from the crocodile and hippopotamus. Not only did Livingstone have numerous hairbreadth escapes from lions, 
elephants, and other wild beasts, but he was many times stricken with a terrible African fever. Because of his wonderful recoveries, the natives thought his life was charmed, and they were afraid he was a wizard who worked cures by magic from the devil. But the good doctor soon won their friendship by his great kindness to them. Livingstone travelled thousands of miles by water in clumsy boats. He wrote to a friend, describing the life on one of these river trips. We rise a little before five, when it is daylight. While I am dressing, the coffee is made, and after I have filled my little coffee pot, I leave the rest for my companions, who eagerly swallow the refreshing drink. Meanwhile, the servants are busy loading the boats, which done, we embark. The next two hours, while the men row swiftly onward, are the pleasantest of the whole day. About eleven we land and eat our luncheon, which consists of what is left from supper the evening before, or of zwieback with honey and water. After resting for an hour, we enter the boats again, and take our places under an umbrella. The heat is oppressive and as I am still weak from my recent attack of fever, I cannot go ashore and hunt. The rowers, who are exposed to the sun without cover, drip with sweat and begin to tire by afternoon. We often reach a suitable spot to spend the night two hours before sundown, and as we are all tired, we gladly make a halt. As soon as we are ashore, the men cut grass on my bed and poles on my tent. The bed is then made, the boxes with our supplies piled on each side of it, and lastly the tent is stretched above. Four or five paces in front of it a huge fire is lighted, besides which each man has his own place according to the rank he occupies. Two of the Makalulus are always at my right and left, both in eating and sleeping while Makana, my head boatman, lies down before the door of my tent, as soon as I go to bed. A space beyond the fire is staked out for the cattle, in the shape of a horseshoe. The evening meal consists of coffee and zwieback, or of bread made from maize or kaffir corn, unless we are lucky enough to shoot something to supply us with a pot of meat. We go to bed soon after, and silence descends upon the camp. On moonlight nights, the fire is allowed to go out. While Livingstone was exploring to the northward, he discovered the great cataracts of the Zambezi, which are even higher and wider than Niagara. He named them Victoria Falls, in honour of the Queen of England. He also found the lakes in which the Zambezi flows into the eastern sea and the Congo into the western, on opposite sides of the continent of Africa. The two rivers are like two long water snakes with their tiny tails close together, but their wide open mouths thousands of miles apart. Dr. Livingstone had sent his wife to England for the benefit of her health and to educate their children. The people there were greatly pleased with the results of Livingstone's labours in Africa, for all of the country discovered by him would belong to Great Britain. So the British government gave him its support and paid him a small salary for the work he was doing for science and for the world. By this time, other missionaries had come to help save the Dark Continent. The wives of two of these were coming up from England with Mrs Livingstone when she returned. There was great joy on both sides that of the free husbands in the heart of Africa, and that of the free wives on their way to join them. But Livingstone and both his friends were seized with African fever, and when their wives came, the two men missionaries had just died. Even Mrs Livingstone, though she had been brought up in Africa, took the disease and died. The two missionaries' wives soon returned to England, but Dr. Livingstone could not even then be persuaded to leave the needy people to go to England to rest a while and see his now motherless children. Besides all these labours and besides the exact reports he made on the animal life, flowers, trees, rocks and geography of that new land, 
He wrote books about his adventures and experiences which had an immense sale. This made him a man of considerable wealth. But after providing well for his family and for the education of his children, he spent the greater part of his fortune, ten to thirty thousand dollars at a time, for the benefit of his black children. When Livingstone did go to England, it was only for a short visit. While absent from Africa, he seemed always to hear those millions of poor, ignorant people calling him. Once he purchased the parts of a little steamer and brought it back to Africa. The boat was put together and was run on some of the lakes and rivers he had discovered. The vessel proved to be a poor affair, which ran very slowly and was always breaking down. But the natives were astonished and would have worshipped it if he had let them. As time went on, larger and better boats were sent out to him. Once he had to discharge his engineer, but he ran the steamboat himself. He found it easier, of course, to make his journeys with the help of steam, though he had to go to many places where the boats could not be taken. A writer has described a trip Livingstone and his friends made in July. It was now the African midwinter, and the nights were very cold. The tsetse flies were more troublesome than ever. Wild beasts became more numerous every day in this in uninhabited region. Herds of elephants, buffaloes, zebras, and many kinds of antelopes were frequently seen, which allowed the head of the caravan to approach within 200 feet of them. The wild boars, of which many were seen, were very shy while on the contrary troops of monkeys hastily retreated into the jungle at the sight of the travellers, chattering angrily about the coming of the white man. Guinea fowl, doves, ducks and geese were also plentiful. With the darkness a new and even more numerous world of living creatures awoke. Lions and hyenas roared and howled about the camp. Unknown birds sang sweetly or screeched as if in fear and all sorts of strange insect noises were heard. One day Livingstone narrowly escaped losing his life from the attack of a two-horned rhinoceros. This beast was strangely quick, in spite of its great bulk, and very savage, being one of the few animals which will attack a man without being first attacked. While making their way through a dense thicket, Livingstone had become separated from the others, and was stooping to gather some specimen, when a black rhinoceros made a furious charge at him. But strange to say, it suddenly stopped short, giving him time to escape. In his flight his watch and chain became entangled in a branch, and stopping to loosen it, he saw the beast still standing in the same spot, as if held back by an unseen hand. On reaching a safe distance, he uttered a shout of warning, thinking some of the party might be near. At this, the rhinoceros rushed away, grunting loudly. While Dr. Livingstone was in England, he was welcomed with highest honours. He was invited to visit Queen Victoria and her husband, the Prince Consort. But so strong was the missionary spirit in him that he preferred talking to cotton spinners and the people in the slums of the East End of London. He was quite glad to go back to Africa and escape from the medals, degrees and other great honours showered upon him. After his return to the dark continent for the last time, he went farther than ever into the interior in an attempt to discover, or at least to prove, where the great river Nile begins. When he had nearly reached the goal, he was driven back by hostile tribes which had recently suffered from tax of slave traders. At this time the Arabs who carried Livingstone's letters down to the coast to be sent to England destroyed them all. For fear he had written to England about the slave outrages they had committed. For this reason nothing was heard of him for years. It was thought that he had been murdered by savages or had died of African fever. At last, the publisher of the New York Herald sent Henry M. Stanley, the newspaper's foreign correspondent, with all the money he needed 
to find Dr. Livingstone, or if he were no longer living, to get any records that could be found. After a long search, the American newspaper man heard of a white man hundreds of miles further in the interior. Trace and trail grew more and more distinct, and at last the American company with the American flag flying marched up to Livingstone's camp on the shore of one of the great lakes he had discovered. Of this meeting, Stanley wrote, As I advanced slowly toward him, I noticed he looked pale and weary. He had a grey beard and wore a cap with a faded gold band on it. I could have run to him and embraced him, only I did not know how he would receive me. So instead I walked up to him and said, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. Yes, said he with a kind smile. We both grasped hands. I thank God, Doctor, that I have been permitted to see you, said I. And he answered, I feel thankful that I am here to welcome you. I found myself gazing at the wonderful man, at whose side I now sat in the heart of Africa. Every hair of his head, every line of his face, his pallor and the wearied look he wore, all told me what I had longed so much to know. The two explorers spent months together talking over their discoveries and experiences. Stanley had much to tell him of what was going on in the world outside. Nearly all Livingstone's store of supplies had been stolen, but Stanley had prepared for that. He insisted on providing the old missionary with everything he might need. Of Stanley's tenderness, Livingstone wrote to his daughter. He laid all he had at my service, divided his clothes into two heaps, and pressed one upon me, then his medicine chest, his goods and everything he had, with true American generosity. To coax my appetite, he often cooked dainty dishes for me with his own hands. The tears often started to my eyes at some fresh proof of his kindness. As Dr. Livingstone was again recovering from a very severe attack of fever, Stanley begged him to go home to England with him for a year of rest. But the aged missionary shook his head sadly. Stanley returned to the outside world. About a year after this, David Livingstone was found kneeling beside his bed in a hut and built of bamboo poles and coarse grass. He had died while praying. Millions of natives in the heart of the dark continent were heartbroken when they heard of the medical missionary's death. They spent months in wailing and mourning, for they had lost their white father. Two devoted black men carried the body of their beloved master hundreds of miles through the swamps and jungles of Africa and placed it on shipboard to be taken back to England. The ship was met at the English seaport by a special train, heavily draped in mourning, which carried the honoured remains up to London. Great Britain has strong reasons for honouring David Livingstone. He had added a million square miles to the known world, and put great lakes, rivers, mountains and countries on the map of Africa. There was a magnificent funeral in Westminster Abbey, where the great missionary and explorer was buried beside the sacred ashes of kings, queens, princes and statesmen. Thus he received the highest honours England can bestow upon her most illustrious dead. On the black marble slab which marks David Livingstone's final resting place are the last words he is known to have written. They are about the cruel slave trade. All I can say in my solitude is, May heaven's rich blessing come down on every one, American, English, Turk, who will help to heal this open sore of the world. End of chapter 24。Chapter 25 of Hero Tales from History。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Like Many Waters. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Peary, a hero of the Great White North. 
For hundreds of years after Columbus, explorers sought the Northwest Passage through the frozen seas of North America. It was not until 1853 that such a channel was actually traced. Even then, it was so filled with ice that no sailor, however brave and skillful, could have made his way through. Long ago, the search for the Northwest Passage gave place to the great desire and purpose to reach the North Pole. Of course, there is no pole standing out of the northern half of the world. The axis or axle of the earth is only an unseen line, which scientists have thought of as if it ran straight through the center of the earth. The place in the middle of the top of the globe where this line, if there were one, would come out, is named the North Pole. And the same place at the opposite end is called the South Pole. It is easy to see how many boys could have a great longing to run away to sea and seek their fortunes in foreign lands. But it is hard to understand why any young man should wish to undertake the awful hardships of bitter colds and blizzards. With the risk of falling down ice cracks hundreds of feet deep, and of starving or freezing to death, in trying to get to the pole, especially if there is nothing but snow and ice to see there if he ever could find the place. Yet in his youth Robert E. Peary had a strange desire to visit the inland ice region of Greenland. Robert was a Pennsylvania lad whose father had died when he was three. He grew up to care for his widowed mother. He went to an eastern college and was graduated second in a class of fifty-one. Then he passed the rigid tests for engineer in the United States Navy. Like young Robert E. Lee, Robert E. Peary was first assigned to engineering duty on the eastern coast in Florida. Then he was sent as one of a number of experts in science to survey a route through Nicaragua, as many people believed that a ship canal should run through Nicaragua rather than across the narrow isthmus where the Panama Canal was dug afterward. So it was not until he was thirty years old that Robert E. Peary was able to realize the dream of his boyhood and explore the bleak and frozen plains even beyond Greenland's icy mountains. Five years later he started out to go farther north than any white man had ever been. His first attempt to reach the pole was in 1891, when he took with him his young wife. This was the first time a white woman ever had made the journey into the unknown regions of the great white north. With the Peary's in this dangerous undertaking went Dr. Frederick A. Cook, a surgeon, and Matthew Henson, the Peary's colored helper. On board the kite, the special ship for this journey, the leader's leg was broken by the sudden slipping of the rudder. This accident kept them from advancing farther north that fall. Through the constant care of his wife, the faithful Matthew, and Dr. Cook, Lieutenant Peary was restored to health and strength by the following spring. Peary knew how to make the best of everything. The half year he was laid up by this accident was that of the Arctic night. For six months in the year, spring and summer, the sun in the Arctic regions can be seen moving in a complete circle up in the sky. In other parts of the world, what is called the sunset is just the turning away of one side of the earth from the sun, and sunrise is the whirling round of that side into the sunlight again. What is called night is the time when the sun is shining on the other side of the earth. But the sun moves north in spring and summer, so that during those seasons in the Arctic region it never sets, and there is daylight all the time. In the fall and winter the sun moves south, and then in the Arctic region it never rises, so there is night for six months. While nursing his broken leg during his Arctic night, Lieutenant Peary was by no means idle. He sent the kite thousands of miles back to the United States. He made friends with the Eskimos, his little fat, red-faced northern neighbors who lived in igloos, as they called their small dome-shaped houses built of blocks of ice. He learned all he could of their language and their ways. He found out how to hunt the reindeer, the musk ox, and other big game of the north, and studied and trained the Eskimo dogs, which would draw his sledges the thousands of miles he must yet go to reach the pole. At last, when his leg was entirely well, it was early spring, when the sun could be seen rising, shining a little while in the middle of the day, and setting just above the frozen plains and icebergs to the south of them. In May, when the sun was circling a little higher in the sky for several hours every day, Peary and a small party harnessed sixteen dogs to four sledges and started off on a camping trip towards the farthest north. 
with one companion who was used to the life in the cold northern countries he climbed a mountain of ice nearly a mile high these two heroes kept on alone across bleak regions broken up by ice cracks called crevasses hundreds of feet deep over slippery hummocks or ice mounds through deep snowdrifts and fogs in constant danger of precipices and pitfalls on the fourth of july they reached a body of water which they named for the day independence bay here they climbed an icy height which they called navy cliff from here they beheld a splendid expanse of clear country stretching still farther away toward the north it was now the arctic midsummer they were surprised to find flowers blooming in sheltered nooks and to hear the hum of bees and flies there were birds also snow bunting and sandpiper flitting and flying about on the little patches of bright green that showed through the snows of ages musk oxen which looked like both sheep and buffalo were grazing peary shot five of these to supply meat for the men and dogs on the return journey of five hundred miles or more the way back was beset with even greater dangers than before while they were on their way north they had known that the shifting and breaking up of fields of ice might cut them off forever from their friends and supplies so every few hundred miles they had cached or buried tools and provisions and marked the places so that they could find them again when a little food might save them from starving in spite of such precautions many exploring parties found only hardship starvation and death in the cruel ice but peary and his party succeeded in making their return to the inland ice fields the region of young peary's boyish dreams through violent windstorms drifting snows and freezing fogs even the hardy little arctic dogs were half famished and worn out finding the kite with other explorers waiting for them there the peary party sailed down to the united states meeting mountain-like icebergs and shooting walruses and polar bears by the way Lieutenant Peary at once went to work preparing for a second attempt at the discovery of the North Pole. Mrs. Peary again accompanied her husband into the Arctic regions, and the 12th of September, 1893, the first white baby ever seen in that far northern country was born. This was the Peary's little blue-eyed daughter, bundled deep in soft, warm Arctic furs, and wrapped in the stars and stripes during the first half-year of her life marie snow baby peary as they named her never saw the sunlight before the sun began to show above the southern horizon again papa peary started off on another twelve hundred mile ice journey this time he took with him eight men twelve sledges and ninety-two eskimo dogs but some of the dogs were strangers to the rest and those from different places fought one another as it is hard enough to separate only two fighting dogs, it was impossible to stop the wholesale dog fight that went on continually and kept the party from going forward. The cold became even more intense. The temperature went down to sixty degrees below zero. Conditions were so much worse than on the previous trip that Peary decided to cache all the provisions and other things they did not need to preserve life and return to the place where he had left his wife and baby. The feet of the men, even of the Eskimos of the party, were badly frozen, and when they returned to their base of supplies, out of the ninety-two dogs there were only twenty-six left. But the heroic explorer would not give up. He and his little family stayed north of the Arctic Circle, while he made discoveries and proved the truth of the statements of those who had been there before him. Little Snow Baby also made her observations she saw eskimo children living in their small round hives of ice and hearing them teasing their mothers for whale blubber and other kinds of grease just as the children at home plead for candy or ice cream an eskimo child likes a tallow candle much better than a stick of candy and will chew the cotton candle wick until there is no more grease left in it lieutenant peary made eight trips to the arctic regions sometimes he would advance farther north than any explorer before him then when he was almost within reach of the pole everything would fail and he would have to retreat and go back thousands of miles to the united states and begin to raise a fortune for the next attempt at one time his ship on the way to the north would be caught in the ice and crushed like an eggshell on another occasion the boat would be frozen up in miles and miles of ice so that he and his men would have to wait for spring to come and thaw it out of the clutches of the terrible white giant jack frost 
it needed the patience of Job to endure and overcome the trials which came thick and fast upon him. One summer the wealthy friend died who had promised him all the money he needed to reach the pole. But a newspaper owner in London, England, offered his yacht, the Windward, for the next polar trip. This time the great Arctic explorer froze both his feet and had to have eight toes cut off. The cold was awful, from fifty-one to sixty-three degrees below zero. After many weeks of acute suffering he was removed to a less severe climate. In 1902, for the seventh time, Peary came within a few degrees of the pole, and finding that he could not go farther, was forced to return to the United States. In the first gloom of this defeat he wrote, the game is off. My dream of sixteen years is ended. I have made the best fight I knew. I believe it has been a good one, but I cannot do the impossible. But this hopeless state of mind did not last long. Peary spent six more years in preparing for one last desperate attempt. On the 6th of July, 1908, he left New York City for his eighth voyage to the Arctic, on his latest ship, the Roosevelt determined to reach the pole or die in the attempt. This time, when he came within a few degrees of his goal, he decided to leave all behind but the faithful Matthew and one Eskimo while he made the last dash. When he came within a few miles of the spot he had sought for nearly twenty years, he was prostrated by overwork and excitement. After a short rest, he went on and stood, on the 6th of April, 1909, in the place called the North Pole. There was nothing to see, not a living thing but themselves and their dogs, but he was now on the top of the world. There was no north, no east, no west, only south. The only north he could see was up in the cold gray sky. Directly overhead was the north star, toward which the pole points. Peary stayed in that desolate neighborhood thirty hours, taking observations and planting five United States flags to show to future comers that America had been first to discover and take possession of the North Pole. One flag he mounted on a pole, which he set in the top of a hummock of ice, as if the North Pole were a flagpole standing up out of the surface of the earth. This was called nailing the American flag to the North Pole. Then he wrote this postal card to mail to his wife. 90 North Latitude, April 7, 1909 my dear Joe, I have won out at last, have been here a day. I start for home and you in an hour. Love to the kidsies, Bert. End of chapter 25。Chapter 26 of Hero Tales from History。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Holland. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Chapter 26 John Smith, the Captain of Many Adventures. Stories of the strange adventures of Columbus, John Cabot, and other explorers made a restless lad of little motherless John Smith of Willoughby, England. When he was fourteen, he had made ready to run away from home. But then his father died and left him the owner of an estate in the charge of guardians. Those mean men cared more for the property than for the boy who was to have it when he was old enough. So they gave him only a little pocket money and hired him out by law as apprentice to a tradesman, who treated the well-to-do lad as if he were a slave. In less than a year, young John Smith ran away in good earnest, leaving master, guardians, and property behind. He had attended two free schools and had gained what would be equal to a common school education in these days. He went right to Paris because France and Spain were at war just then. But peace was declared almost as soon as he was able to enlist. After several hard experiences, young Smith engaged in the service of the Duke of a little kingdom which was fighting the Turks. In one of his books, john smith describes his adventures in these desperate battles he tells of killing three turks single-handed in mortal combat and of how his princely master designed for him a coat of arms having in it three turks heads 
but ill fortune soon befell young captain john smith in a battle with the turks he was wounded and left for dead and became the property of a turkish chief who as smith goes on to tell sent him forthwith to constantinople to his fair mistress for a slave by twenty and twenty chained by the necks they marched in file to this great city where they were delivered to their several masters the princess to whom captain john smith was sent was too young to own any kind of property afraid her mother would sell her white slave before she was of age she sent him to her brother a distant chief asking him to be kind to her prize but the brother treated his sister's slave so brutally that smith killed him and escaped in his master's clothes to russia here he found people who were unfriendly enough to the turks to file off the iron collar which he still wore on his way back to england smith found himself on the ship of a friendly french pirate where he had to fight for his life against two spanish men-of-war the french ship succeeded in escaping from the spaniards into a port on the northern coast of africa from here smith took ship for london and entered the service of the virginia company whose business it was to carry on the settling of america begun by sir walter raleigh the virginia company secured a charter from king james and in december sixteen o six sent more than a hundred men to america it was a strange company for such an enterprise there were four carpenters one blacksmith one bricklayer one mason one tailor one sailor one drummer two surgeons two boys or men servants and only twelve laborers but there were forty-eight gentlemen of whom some were ne'er-do-wells and other downright criminals who could not work because they did not know how to do anything useful even before they reached virginia quarrels broke out among members of the party and captain john smith was falsely accused of conspiracy and condemned to be hanged he escaped however and afterward forgave the conspirators the king had sent out the colony with sealed orders which were not to be opened until they reached virginia when the orders were opened john smith was found to be among the seven men appointed as counsel for the colony but the men highest in control were unfit to command such an enterprise they spent seventeen days searching for a good site for a settlement the place which they finally chose was a long distance from the coast was hard for a sailing vessel to reach and lay in an unhealthy place between the shallow river and a bad swamp the river was named the james and the settlement jamestown both in honor of the king as for captain john smith the others of the party were jealous of him they thought he knew too much because he saw how little they knew most of the party expected to get rich quick and they did not care how they did it so long as it was at the expense of someone else so instead of fishing for oysters planting gardens and clearing farms they went hunting for gold and making trouble with the indians they did discover something they thought was gold but know-it-all smith told them the yellow stuff was only fool's gold which is the common name for iron pyrites instead of following smith's advice and working all together to prepare for the future they became so spiteful that they would have imprisoned him if he had not been too shrewd for them the indians grew more and more hostile the condition of the settlers was fast becoming hopeless smith himself wrote of their condition what toil we had with so small a power twelve laborers out of more than one hundred men to guard our workmen a days watch all night resist our enemies and effect our business to relade the ships cut down trees and prepare the ground to plant our corn the settlers provisions were disappearing faster than they expected one of them wrote at this time of the sad state of affairs our drink was water our lodgings castles in the air the foolish president of the council was soon displaced the man elected in his stead was said to be of weak judgment in dangers and less industry in peace but he had the sense to leave the management of affairs to john smith that capable captain now took hold with a firm hand he fought the indians till they gained a wholesome respect for him and the english then he played on their curiosity and superstition so as to get them to bring indian corn venison and wild turkeys to feed the white men 
He set the idlers to work at chopping down trees and the like. When he had things going right in Jamestown, the tireless captain went out exploring the wilderness. Captured by a hostile tribe of Indians, he showed them his compass and told them a story which made them afraid to kill him. So they took him as a great prize to the Powhatan, or head chief of all the tribes of that part of the country. The Powhatan and his chiefs knew too well that this was the mighty chief who had thus far kept the white men out of their clutches. They held a solemn powwow and condemned the troublesome captain to death. They laid his head on a stone, and a chief was lifting his war club to dash out the prisoner's brains when Pocahontas, the Powhatan's beautiful daughter, rushed out and threw herself between the death club and Smith's head. She pleaded so earnestly, threatening to kill herself if Smith was harmed, that her father gave orders to stop the execution and to keep the white man prisoner. With the help of the Indian girl, he soon made his escape. Pocahontas proved a true friend to the English. More than once she warned Captain Smith of the deep-laid plans of the Virginia tribes to murder all the white settlers at a stroke. She became a convert to Christianity, was christened Rebecca, and was confirmed in the Church of England. Then a young settler, John Rolfe, married her and took her to England where she was received in the homes of lords and ladies, and entertained by the queen as Lady Rebecca and the Princess Pocahontas. Some of the first families of Virginia proudly proved that this beautiful and devoted Indian girl was one of their ancestors. Not long after his escape from the Indians, John Smith was seriously injured by the explosion of some gunpowder and was compelled to return to England for treatment. His work in Virginia was done, but the restless soul of the old captain could not let him be content to remain at ease in England. He made other voyages of exploration along the coast to the north of the Dutch island of Manhattan. From his careful observations, he drew a good map of that northern country and gave it the name New England. So besides starting the great southern colony of North America, he prepared the way for the pilgrims to settle at Plymouth. End of chapter 26《Chapter 27 Hero Tales from History》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Chapter 27 Champlain, the Father of New France. In Samuel de Champlain's earlier life, he was both a soldier and a sailor of France. He was a great adventurer, who came to visit the new country in America, claimed for France by Jacques Cartier about seventy-five years before. He was a personal friend of Henry of Navarre, who became Henry the Fourth, King of France. Champlain was a great lover of king and country. He said to the high officials at court, Spain has her new Spain, and England her new England. Why should not we have our new France in America? The king and the rich nobles thought it was a good idea, and one leading man at the French court sent Champlain to carry out his own project. The brave explorer started a settlement on the coast near the wide mouth of the St. Lawrence, but on account of the wars france was engaged in this wealthy frenchman found that he could no longer spare money to carry on the enterprise and champlain had to give up the settlement he had so nicely started and go back to france but samuel de champlain was a plucky soul whom nothing could frighten or discourage he had a romantic nature to which the wild life in america appealed it was not long before he was back in the New World, sailing up the St. Lawrence. There he saw a high steep cliff at a narrow point in the wide river, and decided that it would be a good place to build a fort and make a settlement. He started both at once, placing the fort on the head of the cliff and building several houses at its foot. 
Champlain, who was quite an artist, made a drawing of this small group of houses and named the little settlement Quebec. On account of its high cliff above a narrow place in the river, Quebec is called the Gibraltar of America. Gibraltar is the name of a high rock on the coast of Spain guarding the entrance to the Mediterranean. In this narrow settlement, Champlain planted a garden with as many roses and other flowers as he could. He had a kind heart and a pleasant face, and soon became as great a friend to the Indians as William Penn in Philadelphia. Champlain encouraged his French friends to treat the men of the forest as their brothers. As he was a devout Catholic, he did everything he could to make the savages Christians, sending good men to live among them and teach the natives how to live right. He not only tried to help pious men to convert the Indians, but he went himself to trade and hunt with the neighboring tribes and make them his friends. More than this, he sent young Frenchmen to live among the different tribes and learn the language and the ways of the Indians. These hardy young heroes were called woodrunners and became the first white guides and scouts in the wilds of America. It was necessary for Champlain to make several voyages home to old France. On one of these visits, the father of new France, now forty years of age, married Hélène, the young daughter of a wealthy citizen of Paris. But instead of taking her to share his rough life in the wilds of the St. Lawrence, he sent her back to school to fit herself better to aid him in teaching the Indians when she was old enough to come with him to the New World. When he went back to Quebec, he went farther up the St. Lawrence to an island which Cartier had called Mount Royal, and started another little settlement which he named Montreal. Here he made everything as beautiful as he could, planting roses and other flowers as he had done at Quebec. The island in the river opposite this new settlement he named Sainte Hélène for the child wife he had left behind in old France. This island, now known by the English name St. Helens, is a park and pleasure ground for the people of Montreal. The white governor found before long that the Indians around Quebec were not satisfied with a friendship which showed itself in teaching them to be Christians and in trading beads for the furs the savages had gathered by shooting and trapping in the forest. It seemed strange that tall, stern red men should be so childish as to care much for beads, but it must be remembered that the Indians used beads of special colors in weaving bands and strings of wampum which they used for money. Their own beads were very hard to make from shells, so they were as eager for glass beads of certain colors as white men are for the smallest grains of gold. The Indians were less trouble to Champlain and his friends than the English, and other Frenchmen too, who tried to turn the Indians against him and his settlers. Other ships than those of Champlain's company landed every now and then at points along the St. Lawrence to trade with the Indians. These white men would try to make the savages unfriendly to Champlain, so that they would trade only with the newcomers, somewhat as a business house today tries to take customers away from other dealers. The simple men of the forest could not understand these tricks of trade of the wily white men. Champlain, in one of the stories of his adventures, relates that the Indians came to tell him about some fur traders from other parts of France. They tell us that they would come and fight for us against our enemies if we liked. What do you think of it? Are they telling the truth? No, they are not, said Governor Champlain earnestly. I know well enough what they want. They tell you this only to get your trade. The white governor is right, shouted the Indians. Those men are women. They only want to make war on our beavers. 
by this they meant that the other frenchmen were willing to promise anything in order to get all the beaver and other fur skins the indians might have to sell as the indian squaws were not allowed to go into battle the savages showed their contempt for white men by calling them women champlain knew that the indians would not accept him as a real friend unless he would fight for them against their enemies the cruel and powerful iroquois who lived south of the st lawrence the tribes of the iroquois were the most daring and warlike of the red men and were feared by all their neighbors the indians looked upon the white governor and his men as workers of miracles with their fire sticks as they called the rude guns which the french called arquebuses in one of his accounts champlain describes the first of a number of battles he helped the indians to fight against the iroquois after describing how his red friends met the enemy at night and agreed to fight next morning he continued meanwhile the whole night was spent in dancing and singing on both sides with many insults and other taunts such as how little courage we had how great their power against our arms and when day broke we would find this out to our ruin our indians did not fail in talking back telling them they would witness the effect of arms they had never seen before after each side had sung and danced and threatened enough day broke my white companions and i were always concealed for fear the enemy would see us preparing our arms the best we could being separated each in one of the canoes belonging to the st lawrence savages after being equipped with light armor we took each an arquebus and went ashore i saw the enemy leave their barricade they were about two hundred men of strong and robust appearance who were coming slowly toward us with a gravity and assurance which greatly pleased me led on by three chiefs ours were marching in similar order and told me that those who wore three tall feathers were the chiefs and that i must do all i could to kill them the moment we landed our indians began calling me with a loud voice and making way placing me marching at their head about twenty paces in advance until i was within thirty paces of the enemy the moment they the iroquois saw me they halted gazing at me and i at them when i saw them preparing to shoot at us i raised my arquebus and aiming directly at one of the three chiefs two of them fell to the ground by this shot and one of their companions received a wound of which he died afterwards i had put four balls in my arquebus our indians on witnessing a shot so favorable for them set up such tremendous shouts that thunder could not have been heard and yet there was no lack of arrows on either side the iroquois were greatly astonished seeing two men killed at once though they were protected by arrow-proof armor woven of cotton thread and wood this frightened them very much while i was reloading one of my white men in the bush fired a shot which so astonished them anew that they lost courage took to flight and abandoned the field and their fort hiding in the depths of the forest where i followed them and killed some others our savages also killed several of them and took ten or twelve prisoners the rest carried off the wounded fifteen or sixteen of ours were wounded by arrows they were promptly cured after gaining the victory they amused themselves plundering indian corn and meal from the enemy also the arms which the iroquois had thrown away in order to run faster after feasting dancing and singing we returned three hours later with the prisoners i named the place where this battle was fought lake champlain the white governor went on to tell about the devilish delight his friends the st lawrence indians took in torturing their iroquois prisoners 
the braves and even the squaws would try to think of something to do that would make the dying indian's sufferings still more terrible if the victim cried out or uttered the least sound the torturing indians would laugh and dance about for joy champlain begged his friends to stop this fiendish sport but they could not understand why the iroquois would have tortured them just as wickedly if they had won so the white governor shot several of the suffering victims to put them out of their agonies after that when the st lawrence indians gained a victory champlain would demand as many prisoners as he could for his share these he would not allow to be tortured and in time would contrive to let them escape by being friends with the neighboring tribes in war champlain made bitter enemies of the iroquois who lived in new york so that in the later years between france and england those powerful tribes fought with the english against the french and in the end helped to place new france in the hands of the british champlain's sympathetic and romantic nature made him a welcome visitor whether in the wigwams of the savages or in the palaces of the kings and noblemen of france he did all he could to help the people of old france and new to understand one another he sent a young frenchman up into the country some distance north of montreal to live among the savages after this youth had spent the winter in the north he came back to the st lawrence with glowing stories about the finding of a salt sea much farther north he was taken to france and became the lion of the day there for explorers from all lands were still looking for a northwest passage across america to the south sea and china just about this time henry hudson had discovered the hudson river and was lost in hudson bay in his search for this passage but this was not yet known in europe so champlain with his strong desire to explore and to prove a great benefit to mankind arranged to command an expedition into the far northern wilds and make his young friend's boasted discovery of actual use to old and new france with the young explorer and an indian guide the governor and a company of men reached the lake and island belonging to the tribe with which the young frenchman had stayed in talking with those indians about the great discovery champlain spoke with pride of his young friend's energy and success they laughed and told him he had been fooled for that young man had never gone farther north than the island on which they were standing this was a bitter experience for the good white governor the indians who had told him before that there was no salt sea anywhere near that region taunted champlain with now who were your friends don't you see that he wanted to cause your death Give him to us, and we promise you he shall never lie again. Champlain knew too well that with the savages' hatred of a liar and their cruel modes of punishment, they would have tortured that young Frenchman to death. Of course, the kind-hearted governor could not permit this, but he did make the fellow stand before all the Frenchmen at Montreal and confess that he had been guilty of lying and committing a great fraud after that as champlain himself expressed it we left him to the mercy of god at last sieur de champlain brought his young wife to canada her brother who had been a settler on the st lawrence for years exclaimed when he met her you are a brave girl to come here the indians always glad to welcome the great white chief were now doubly glad to see his young squaw they greatly admired the little white witch, as they called her, and would have worshipped her if she had let them. She wore a small mirror, the fashion in Paris then, as a sort of charm. When she allowed the Indians to see their painted faces in this, they said, She carries each one of us in her heart. 
she used her good influence over her dusky admirers to persuade them to be baptized of a very devout spirit madame de champlain returned to france after a short stay in the western wilds and entered a convent in paris once more england and france were at war and king charles i looked with jealous eyes upon the fair islands and settlements of the st lawrence english warships appeared before quebec claimed possession and threatened to take that place the white governor wrote back with French courtesy to the impudent enemy. We will await you from hour to hour, and shall endeavor if possible to dispute the claim which you have made over these places, upon which I remain, sir, your affectionate servant. The English commander did not dare dispute the claim then, but he came again with a powerful force and the white governor was forced to yield and go back to france but at the end of the war england returned canada to france and the father of new france came again to quebec his capital among the rejoicings of all the people both french and indians and even of our friends our enemies the english here he lived like another french knight without fear and without reproach until he received the call of the king of kings in the far country on christmas day sixteen thirty five end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of hero tales from history this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Holland. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Chapter 28 Miles Standish, the Brave Little Captain of Plymouth. Little is known of the life of Miles Standish before he sailed from Holland among the hundred and two passengers of the Mayflower on its way across the stormy ocean to the wilderness of America. The brave men and women who had been driven out of England on account of their religion by foolish King James had made their escape to Holland. Although the Dutch who lived in that country were very kind to them, the English people decided to go to America where they could live and worship as they wished and teach their children their own language and ways of living for though their king was silly and mean they still loved dear old england the mayflower was a poor clumsy leaky craft about the size of a coastwise schooner which would not be allowed to risk a voyage across the ocean to-day the pilgrims as the mayflower passengers were called did not know just where to land the part of america to which they had chosen to go was called virginia but that was the name of the country all along the eastern coast from the south nearly to new york harbor which had been claimed by the dutch only a few years before the pilgrims had a vague idea of landing about halfway between new york and jamestown which had been settled some years before by john smith and a company of men from england but storm after storm drove the mayflower farther and farther northward till the pilgrims found themselves just within the long protecting arm of land called cape cod they were very tired of being huddled together and pitched about in the little ship many of them were ill from the close quarters as well as from terrible seasickness during the long voyage they had nothing but mouldy bread and salt pork to eat for there were no canned meats vegetables and fruits in the fall of sixteen twenty when the pilgrims made their long voyage across the sea the first thing they did was to go ashore near the end of cape cod where the pilgrim mothers did their much-needed washing the cape was a long low sandy arm of land extending far out to sea the ship's carpenter worked to finish the shallop or small sailboat which he had started to build during the voyage it was intended for the purpose of sailing in shallow water to find a good place to live where there were trees for shelter and springs of water and if possible a good safe harbor in which the mayflower and all coming ships might stay at anchor the pilgrims held a meeting in the cabin of the mayflower 
and signed a paper which they called the Compact, by which they agreed to live and be governed. They elected John Carver, the oldest man in the company, governor. Although they are called the Pilgrim Fathers, they were nearly all young or middle-aged men. Elder Brewster, the minister, was about 40 years old, and Miles Standish was 36. William Bradford, who wrote the story of the settlement in his diary, and John Alden, the cooper, were still younger. The pilgrims chose 20 of their number to go along the shore of Cape Cod toward the mainland to find a place to build their cabins and spend the winter, for it was late in November and very cold. While waiting for the shallop to be finished, this pilgrim lookout committee, led by Miles Standish, started out afoot on their great search, not knowing what might happen to them. Captain John Smith had explored that part of the country after he lived two years at Jamestown, Virginia. He had made a map of all that region which he named New England. The men went ashore from the Mayflower and had walked along the Cape a mile or more when they saw a party of Indians with a dog coming toward them. When the red men saw the white strangers, they hid in the bushes and whistled to their dog, which followed them out of sight. Miles Standish and his men tried to catch up with the Indians and speak with them, but they were afraid of the strangers who wore helmets and armor over their bodies and thighs, and carried fire sticks, as the Indians called the guns. The pilgrims followed the natives about ten miles without seeing them again. Then they built a hasty camp of logs and brush, in which eighteen men slept while three stood on guard outside. Nothing happened that night to disturb them. Next day they saw wild ducks and deer, and discovered a kettle and some fresh mounds of earth, which William Bradford wrote in his diary, We digged up and found a fine, great new basket full of very fair corn of this year, with some six and thirty goodly ears of corn, some yellow and some red, and other mixed with blue. The basket was round and narrow at the top. It held about three or four bushels, which was as much as two of us could lift up from the ground, and was very handsomely and cunningly made. But whilst we were busy about all these things, we were in suspense what to do with it. And at length, after much talk, we concluded to take as much corn as we could carry away with us. And when our shallop came, if we could find any of the people, we would satisfy, pay them for their corn. The rest we buried again for we were so laden with armor that we could carry no more. As they walked slowly on, noting all the strange things they met, they found a deer trap. One of their number wrote down afterward just what happened at this point. As we wandered, we came to a tree where a young sapling was bowed, bent down over a bow, and some acorns strewed underneath. Stephen Hopkins said it had been to catch some deer. So as we were looking at it, William Bradford, being in the rear when he came and went about, it gave a sudden jerk up, and he was caught by the leg. It, the deer trap, was a pretty device made with a rope of their own making, and having a noose as well made as any rope maker in England can make. Even those solemn pilgrims had to laugh to see Brother Bradford with one foot up in the air and his head on the ground. The men returned to the ship and reported what they had seen. When the shallop was completed, they sailed away in that and went farther on little voyages of discovery. But Cape Cod is a long peninsula, and they went back and forth several times between the land and the ship, which remained at anchor near the end of the Cape. One time they came back from their sight hunting and found that another pilgrim had been born on the Mayflower. This baby... William White was its father, was the first white child born in this part of America. They named the baby Peregrinus, the Latin word for pilgrim, so he was called Peregrine White. There was a mischievous small boy in the Mayflower, that Billington boy, the pilgrims called him, who found some gunpowder and proceeded to make trails of it on the deck, then touched a live coal to it and made it flash up. So young Francis Billington made the first fireworks in New England. He also shot off a musket. There were two kinds of musket, one called the matchlock, lighted by punk or slow match. There were no friction matches for 200 years after that. 
and the other kind called the snap hance or flintlock. While playing with fire, that Billington boy flashed a line of powder which ran back to the kegs of gunpowder and came very near blowing up the Mayflower and all on board. Another time, the home hunters had a hard day and, being tired and hungry, made their camp and went to rest after placing men on guard. Bradford wrote in his journal, about midnight we heard a great and hideous cry and our sentinels called arm arm so we bestirred ourselves and shot off a couple of muskets and the noise ceased we concluded that it was a company of wolves or other wild beasts for one told us he had heard such a noise in newfoundland about five in the morning we began to be stirring and two or three men who doubted whether their pieces would go off or no made trial of them and shot them off but thought nothing at all after prayer we prepared ourselves for breakfast and for a journey and it being now twilight in the morning it was thought meet best to carry the things down to the shallop anon all of a sudden we heard a great and strange cry which we knew to be the same voices though they varied their notes one of the company came running in and cried they are men indians indians and with all their arrows came flying amongst us our men ran with all speed to recover their arms as by the good providence of god they did in the meantime captain miles standish having a snap hats ready made a shot and after him another after they too had shot other two of us were ready but he wished us not to shoot till we could take aim for we knew not what need we should have and there were four only of us which had their arms there ready our care was no less for the shallop but we hoped all the rest would defend it we called unto them to know how it was with them and they answered well well every one and be of good courage we heard three of their pieces go off and the rest called for a firebrand to light their punk matches for their matchlock muskets one took a log of the fire on his shoulder and went and carried it unto them the cry of our enemies was dreadful especially when our men ran out to recover their arms their note was after this manner woach woach ha ha hatch woach this hideous and great cry was the first indian war whoop the pilgrims ever heard it must have curdled the blood of those quaint old puritans who had never heard a modern college yell the white men's matchlocks and snap hances seemed to have scared the indians even more than their war hoop and arrows tipped with brass buckhorn and eagle's claws frightened the white men so the red men ran away and lived to fight another day the indians who first fought with the pilgrims proved to be the nossets an unfriendly tribe living on cape cod the white men named this place the first encounter the lookout committee went on after this until they reached the mainland and soon found the site they had been searching for so long bradford's diary contains the record on the sabbath day we rested and on monday we sounded the harbor and found it a very good harbor for shipping we marched also into the land and found divers cornfields and little running brooks a place very good for situation so we returned to our ship mayflower again with good news to the rest of our people which did much comfort their hearts though bradford did not then think it worth mentioning there was a big boulder in the edge of the harbor upon which these men sprang out of the shallop this happened on the twenty first of december sixteen twenty and is known as the landing of the pilgrims on plymouth rock december twenty first is celebrated now more than three hundred years after that event as forefathers day this place was marked plymouth on captain john smith's map of new england and the pilgrims who had sailed from plymouth england were glad to give their new-found settlement that name four days after this landing 
the Mayflower sailed from the end of Cape Cod and came to anchor in Plymouth Harbor. The first thing the pilgrims did was to build a common house of logs to be used later as a sort of town hall. Then they erected a square cabin on top of the hill for both church and fort. On its flat roof, they mounted three brass cannon. Christmas Day came while they were building their first cabin, but they worked all that day, for they were too strict even to celebrate Christmas. While they were building their village of log cabins with thatched roofs, some of them stayed in their quarters on the Mayflower. It seemed a long time before they saw Indians again. But one day, while the grave and reverend pilgrims were holding a council in their common house, a tall red man came stalking up to their door, saying, Welcome, Yankees! Welcome, Yankees! Yankees was the nearest the Indian could pronounce Englishmen. From this, the people of New England are still called Yankees. This Indian's name was Samoset. He had learned a little English from some fishermen farther north on the New England coast. He came again to Plymouth bringing another red man named Squanto, who years before had been carried away with other savages by an English captain and sold into slavery. Squanto had been taken to London and learned to speak English. He was glad to stay with the pilgrims and talk for them to the tribes around Plymouth. For while he was away a slave in foreign lands, his own people had been taken with a dreadful disease called a plague, and when he came back they had all died, and poor Squanto was left alone in the world. The pilgrims elected Miles Standish, who was the only soldier in the company, their captain. But about the first work Captain Standish had to do was to take care of the sick, and he did so, according to the poet Longfellow, with a hand as gentle as woman's. In the spring, there were only 51 of the pilgrims, just one half the number that had landed on Plymouth Rock. Among the first to die was Rose Standish, the captain's beautiful wife. Although they were not attacked that winter, they knew the Indians were lurking about so the pilgrims did not make mounds of the graves in their poor little burial ground on the hill for fear the savages would see how few white men were left and attack them while they were all so ill at one time only two men were well enough to nurse all the rest and bury them as fast as they died in april the men were well enough to plant corn and do other work it was so hot that Governor Carver, the oldest of all the pilgrims, was prostrated by the heat and died. William Bradford was elected governor in his place. When the pilgrims had erected cabins enough to house all of who were left of them, they built a stockade, or wall of upright logs, around the settlement. In April 1621, the Mayflowers started back to England. Much as they had suffered through the long, dreary winter, None of the pilgrims wished to return home on their little ship. That plucky band of men and women had come to America to stay. They marched to their church fort on the hill every Sunday, led by their governor, minister, and captain. The men carried their muskets to be ready to defend themselves if the Indians tried to surprise them while at their worship. The pilgrims believed in watching and fighting as well as praying. After a long time, Massasoit, the great Indian chief, came with a company of his braves to see the pilgrims, and the white men and the red made a treaty of peace and friendship. Afterwards, the chief of a more distant tribe sent an Indian runner to Plymouth with a bundle of arrows tied together with a rattlesnake skin. Captain Standish promptly filled the snake skin with powder and bullets and sent it back. This frightened the Indians, for they thought the white medicine man had the power to send a plague among them, which would make them all sicken and die. After a time, the people of Plymouth were comfortable and at peace with their Indian neighbors. Then a lad, known as that Billington boy, disobeyed the rules by going outside the limits and was lost. The settlers were alarmed, and Captain Standish took a small company of men and made a search for the lad. They found him with the unfriendly Nossets, the Indians they had fought with at the first encounter. 
the indians around plymouth laughed at the little red-headed white captain because he was so small he was so quick-tempered that they named him little pot that soon boils over once when a tall wiry indian north of plymouth insulted him the fiery little captain had all he could do to control himself standish and three other white men had gone up to that place for the purpose of punishing the indians who were threatening the whole colony with death watching his chance the white captain sprang upon the big indian chief who had sneered at him snatched the savage's own knife and killed him with a single stab the other white men dispatched their indians the account of this brave deed of the captain of plymouth was reported among the indians far and near and the pilgrims had long years of peace because the red men had gained a wholesome respect for miles standish whose name they now changed to sword of the white man end of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine hero tales from history this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham, 1866 to 1947. Chapter 29. John Winthrop, a Puritan Maker of Massachusetts. John Winthrop cannot be called a boy's hero, yet he was a hero, and his life was strange and interesting. He was a son of a good Puritan family in England. When a young man, he met Oliver Cromwell, who became Lord Protector of England. He was acquainted with John Milton, the blind Puritan poet, who wrote Paradise Lost, one of the greatest poems in the English language. John Winthrop had also to transact certain business with Cromwell's cousin, John Hampton, the great English patriot who opposed King Charles when he sought to impose taxation upon the people without their consent. Young Winthrop was married the first time when he was seventeen, and his son Henry was born when the young father was eighteen. In 1629, the father decided to go to America, where he could worship God as he thought best. He and 400 men and women set sail from England in a fleet of small ships intending to join the settlement at Salem, started a year before. One of these ships was the Mayflower, in which the pilgrims of Plymouth had sailed nine years before. On their second morning out of England, they spied eight ships coming behind them. The captain of the Arabella, the ship on which Winthrop sailed, as he wrote in the logbook or journal of the voyage, caused the gun-room and gun-deck to be cleared. After noon, we still saw those eight ships to stand towards us. Having more wind than we, they came up apace. We all prepared to fight with them, and took down some cabins which were in the way of our ordnance, cannon, and out of every ship were thrown such bed matters as were subject to take fire. We drew forth our men, and armed them with muskets and other weapons and instruments for fireworks. To try it, our captain shot a ball of wild fire fastened to an arrow out of a crossbow which burnt in the water a good time. The women and children were removed into the lower deck that they might be out of danger. All things being thus fitted, we went to prayer upon the upper deck. It was good to see how cheerful all the company appeared. Not a woman or child showed fear. It was now about one of the clock, and the fleet seemed to be within a league of us. Therefore our captain, because he would show he was not afraid of them, and that he might see what was to be done before night should overtake us, tacked about and stood to meet them, and when they came near we perceived them to be our friends. So every ship, as they met, saluted each other, and the musketeers discharged their small shot, and so, God be praised, our fear and danger was turned into mirth and friendly entertainment. 
our danger being thus over we espied two boats fishing in the channel so every one of our four ships manned out a skiff and we bought of them great store of excellent fresh fish of diverse sorts the voyagers were seventy-six days nearly eleven weeks crossing the atlantic they had passed through storms but when early in june they sighted america winthrop wrote in his journal we had now fair sunshine weather and so pleasant a sweet air as did much refresh us and there came a smell off shore like the smell of a garden there came a wild pigeon into our ship and another small land bird in four days the arabella was anchored in salem harbor the poor little settlement welcomed some of the newcomers with a good supper of venison pasty in the meantime most of our people went on shore upon land of cape ann which lay very near us and gathered store of fine strawberries salem where we landed pleased us not wrote one of the men on board to a countess in england winthrop who had been elected governor of the colony they were to found looked about for a better place to settle and decided on a site they called charlestown on the charles river although they had left england because of their obstinate and foolish king charles i they named rivers and towns for him and one of their earliest churches was called king's chapel when no one was allowed to think for himself or even to wear such clothes as he saw fit it would have been regarded as almost a crime to speak a word against the king no matter how much he deserved a bad name when governor winthrop came back from charlestown to salem he wrote in his journal we went to massachusetts to find out a place for our sitting down by massachusetts he meant only that part of the country along boston harbor about fifteen miles south of salem just after his return his eldest son henry who had come over on another ship arrived at salem that very day the young man started with several of the ship's officers to visit some indian wigwams in his journal the father describes what happened they saw on the other side of the river a small canoe he would have had one of the company swim over and fetch it rather than walk several miles on foot it being very hot weather but none of the party could swim but himself and so he plunged in and as he was swimming over was taken with a cramp a few rods from shore and drowned my son henry my son henry wrote the bereaved governor to his wife in england ah poor child yet it grieves me much more for my dear daughter yet for all these things i praise my god i am not discouraged henry the son of john winthrop's first wife had been married in england he had come without his bride to the western wilds to build a little home before sending for her heart sore but not dismayed governor winthrop took his followers and tried to make the settlement at charlestown now part of the great city of boston but their sufferings were not over as at jamestown on the james river in virginia about twenty-five years before this the settlers were ill with malaria and some of them died then a strange old hermit who had lived about twenty years alone on a tree-topped hill on the other side of the river came to see the new governor and invited him to come over the river and build his town on the hill which had been named three mount tri mountain or tremont so winthrop and his people moved once more and named the new place for the city of boston in england the old hermit proved to be william blackstone a minister from old england on the three mounts he tilled a small farm which extended down into the now historic boston common he had brought from england his library and spent his time reading farming and raising apples he had left england because he would not worship according to the legal forms there but he did not like the way the puritans wished him to worship either 
so he moved away from Boston as soon as he could dispose of his house and other real estate. Blackstone also had been kind to the Indians. His influence did much toward keeping the Red Tribes friendly with the white settlers of Boston. On the highest of the three mounts was placed a sort of lighthouse or beacon which sailors could see far down the harbor. This gave the name of Beacon Hill to that part of Boston. On this hill the State House has since been erected. This building has a great dome covered with gold leaf which glistens in the sun and can be seen for many miles around. All roads lead to the dome of the State House in Boston as the spokes of a wheel come together in the hub. Because of this fact, a humorous writer gave Boston the title of the Hub of the Universe. Though the Indians gave the early settlers very little trouble, the wolves which howled around the settlement were alarming and sometimes dangerous to the little children. Sometimes a bear would come ambling into Boston town. The people's cows were pastured on the common. This made some people who wished to make fun of Boston claim that the narrow crooked streets of that city were laid out by the cows as they wandered down from the common to drink at a certain spring. Sometimes the town suffered from disease and famine. One day, when Governor Winthrop had divided his last cupful of cornmeal with a starving beggar, he appointed a day of fasting and prayer to God for food. On the very day set for this fast, a ship arrived from England with provisions, and the people had a feast instead. Another time, when the people did not have enough to eat, an Indian chief named Chickatawbut came and presented the governor with a great quantity of corn. As with the Indians, so with the white settlers at first, it was either feast or famine. The people of Boston were kinder to the Indians than to the white men who failed to agree with them in religion. They banished the Baptists and hanged the Quakers. Besides Roger Williams, they drove out a good woman named Anne Hutchinson because she argued too well against some of their beliefs. This gifted woman and her family were murdered and scalped by Indians in the log cabin in which they lived after they were banished from Boston. Governor Winthrop finally sent for his wife and his other children. One of his sons became governor of Connecticut. John Winthrop was twelve times elected governor of Massachusetts. More than once he was chosen deputy governor. He was good to the poor and unfortunate. In this he was far in advance of his time. It was said that he kept his private purse open for the public. Once, when he found that a man was stealing wood from his pile, he laughed and said he would stop that. He did so by inviting the man to come in the daytime and help himself to all the wood he needed. But the man never came again. Cotton Mather, one of the greatest of Boston preachers, said of Governor Winthrop that he was the terror of the wicked and delight of the sober, the envy of the many, but the hope of those who had any hopeful design in hand for the common good of the nation. End of chapter 29「Chapter 30 of Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Like Many Waters. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Roger Williams, a minister who lived the Golden Rule. When the Pilgrim Fathers left Europe in the clumsy little ship, the Mayflower, they came to America to have freedom to think and act as they believed right in matters of religion. Many men in England who wished to have their own religious beliefs were called Puritans because they wished to purify the Church of England. From the things which they thought were wrong. King James of England had announced that they must all worship in the ways of the Church of England or he would harry them out of the land. 
Puritans and other people who would not conform to the service of the Church of England were called nonconformists. The group of nonconformists who went away from their own country in 1620 to come as strangers to America were called the Pilgrims. They came to America in the Mayflower and landed on a big boulder in the edge of the harbor at a place they named Plymouth. Companies of Puritans sailed from England a few years later and landed on the shores of Massachusetts Bay, some at Salem and some at a place they named Boston, for another town in England. John Winthrop was the leader of this last company and was made governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony. The Puritans soon found that there were some of their number who did not believe just as they did. It seems strange now that those who had come from England just to find a place where they could worship God in the way they saw fit could not let others do the same. They came to do what their consciences told them was right, but they would not let others think that any other way was right. So when members of the Society of Friends called Quakers came, dressing differently and thinking it wrong to fight and treat the Indians cruelly, the Puritans sent them away. If the Quakers came back to Boston after being sent away, they were hanged on the common. A man who did not think what his neighbors believed was likely to have a hard time of it, for anyone to dress differently from others was considered a great offense. It was the same all over the world, especially in England. The first man who tried to wear a silk hat in London was chased through the streets. The mob battered his hat and tore his clothes, and he barely escaped with his life. Therefore, when Roger Williams, a bright young minister from England, came to preach in the First Church of Boston, the people soon found that he believed in a different form of baptism from theirs, and some were angry enough to wish to kill him for being a Baptist, so he left Boston and went to live at Plymouth. The preaching of those days was not so much about doing good and living by the golden rule as about certain fixed beliefs. This often led to angry arguments, and some good people became very violent. On this account, Roger Williams soon had to leave Plymouth. Then he went to Salem and built a little church there which is still standing, about three hundred years old. Here the young minister kept on preaching what the leaders thought were strange and wicked teachings. It was decided that such a reckless preacher should be arrested and sent in chains to England to be tried and imprisoned or put to death. But Roger Williams heard of this decision and did not wait to be arrested. When the captain and his men from Boston came to the Salem minister's house, they found that he had left there three days before. When the people of Boston, Salem, and Plymouth next heard of Roger Williams, he was settled on Narragansett Bay. The Indians there received him gladly, for he had been one of the few white men who treated them kindly. As William Penn, fifty years afterwards, dealt with the Indians along the Delaware River. Williams and his friends built a group of log houses and named their settlement Providence, because they believed that, in the providence or care of God, they had found a safe retreat among the savages from the severity of the pious Puritans of Massachusetts. Quakers and other religious people who were driven from the Puritan colonies came and settled near Roger Williams. Even here the people of different beliefs quarreled over religious matters, and good Pastor Williams had all he could do to keep them from fighting and injuring one another. Soon the savage Pequot Indians tried to persuade all the Indian tribes to join together and kill at a stroke all the white men who had come over the great water and taken from the natives certain parts of their country. When the white men of Boston and Plymouth heard of this, they sent and begged Roger Williams to use his good influence with his neighbors the Narragansetts, a large and powerful tribe, to prevent them from joining in the plot to murder all the white men, as the Indians could have done if all the tribes had joined together and attacked all at once. Here was a chance for Roger Williams to get even with those who had wished to kill or imprison him, and who had driven him from place to place. But the minister of Providence returned good for evil. Taking his life in his hands, he went to the Indian village. The Pequot braves were there in the wigwam of Canonicus, the Narragansett chief, trying to persuade him and his tribe to take part in a war against the Pale Faces. Roger Williams was a hero. He stayed with those Indians, sleeping with them at night without showing the least sign of fear, though he knew very well that a savage Pequot might stab him in his sleep. The Providence minister was successful. 
Canonicus refused to join with the Pequots. Because the Narragansetts stayed out of the war, other tribes also kept out of it. The Pequots went ahead, but the white men defeated and destroyed them. By his conduct at this time of need, Roger Williams set both red men and white men a noble example. He taught them by all his life that a true Christian loves his enemies and does good to those who treat him badly. The man who founded the town of Providence and the state of Rhode Island was the friend of both white men and red because he lived the golden rule. End of chapter 30、Chapter 31 Hero Tales from History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Chapter 31 Lord Baltimore, Calvert, and Claiborne, the Three Fathers of Maryland. George Calvert of Kipling, England, was such a fine man that he was beloved by king and people alike. King James gave him the title of Sir George Calvert and made him Secretary of State. As the king and the church in England were Protestant, Sir George felt it his duty to give up his royal honors when he became a Catholic. But King James' son, Charles I, instead of taking Calvert's rank away from him, made him Baron Baltimore. A baron is higher in position than a knight. Who was called Sir. A few years after the pilgrims came to America and settled at Plymouth in order to worship God as they thought right, Lord Baltimore asked permission to make a settlement for himself and the Catholics of England who were persecuted because of their religion. The first place chosen by him for a Catholic settlement was in Newfoundland. But though the climate was lovely and cool there in spring and summer, the settlers found it so cold in winter that they had to go back to England. King Charles then granted Lord Baltimore another great tract of land much farther south, between the English settlement at Jamestown and that of the Puritans at Plymouth in New England. Lord Baltimore named this region Maryland. In honor of King Charles' wife, the Queen of England. As all the other English settlements in America were Protestant, the party had great trouble in securing supplies and getting started for the New World. Before they were quite ready, the first Lord Baltimore died, and his eldest son, Cecil Calvert, who then became Lord Baltimore, inherited Maryland as part of his father's estate. But some of the land granted to Lord Baltimore had been settled years before and was claimed by the colonists of Virginia. On account of this, young Lord Baltimore had to stay in London to look out for his rights in America. Therefore, his younger brother, Leonard Calvert, was sent to act for him as governor of Maryland. At last, the voyagers sailed away in two ships. The Ark and the Dove. There were one hundred and twenty eight passengers, not counting servants and children. There were others on board who, not having money, bound themselves by law to work for a certain time in America to pay their passage across the sea. The two ships were caught in a terrific storm on the way, and the Dove was not to be seen anywhere. After many days of hoping against hope, those on the ark gave up for lost the dove and all their friends on it. Then the ark sailed on alone, stopping after many weeks at one of the islands of the West Indies. While they were anchored there, their sorrow was turned to joy, for the dove caught up with them. It had been driven out of sight by the fierceness of the gale. And had found refuge in a harbor nearby. The two sister ships now sailed northward and entered the mouth of the Potomac. Of this river, Father White, one of the company, wrote 
Never have I beheld a larger or more beautiful river. The Thames seems a mere rivulet in comparison with it. It is not disfigured by any swamps, but has firm land on each side. Fine groves of trees appear, not choked with bushes and undergrowth, but growing at intervals as if planted by hand, so that you might easily drive a four-horse carriage through the midst of the trees. Governor Leonard Calvert had heard so many stories of the fierceness and cunning of the Indians that he did not land at once. After the two ships had cruised about the rivers and the bay a while, he decided to settle at the mouth of a small river which they named St. Mary's, and built a group of cabins calling this place St. Mary's also. They were quite surprised to find their Indian neighbors friendly, bringing corn and provisions, and showing them all they could about planting and trapping and hunting. The settlers soon learned that the Indians were friendly because they wanted the white men to help them when they went to war with their savage enemies. The red men thought the strangers' fire sticks, guns, worked magic like lightning and thunder from above. The children of young Maryland saw much to entertain and sometimes to frighten them. When the Indians painted themselves with red, black, and yellow stripes, they looked even uglier than before. The white people had heard of the savages' war dances and scalp dances, but they now found the natives had also their corn dances, something like a harvest or Thanksgiving festival. The Maryland colonists were kind to the tribes and gained their friendship, as Champlain had done, and as William Penn and the Quakers of Philadelphia were to do about fifty years later. The Indians in and around Maryland learned to believe in the goodness of the people of the Baltimore colony. Most of the trouble Governor Calvert had in settling Maryland was with a white leader named Claiborne, who had settled on the largest island in the bay. He claimed that this land, which was named Kent Island, was part of Virginia. Governor Calvert visited Jamestown, and the governor of that colony said that the island was part of Lord Baltimore's land. Then Claiborne announced that Kent Island was not only separate from either colony, but that it belonged to him. He had made friends among the Indians far and near, and began to boast that he was going to drive all the other white people out of that country. The Marylanders went to work like so many beavers, building a fort and other defenses to be ready for an attack. When they heard that the people on Kent Island had fitted out a large sailboat as a man-of-war, Governor Calvert fitted up two pinnaces or small boats and mounted a cannon in each. Then the men of Maryland sailed for Kent Island and captured it, after a battle in which several persons were killed. After this there was no more trouble with Claiborne, and since that time Kent Island has belonged to Maryland. Lord Baltimore held the rights over Maryland by a grant from the king, somewhat as William Penn afterward came to own Pennsylvania. Although Cecil, Baron Baltimore, was never able to visit his property in the New World, his name was given to Baltimore, the greatest city of Maryland, and Anne Arundel County was named for his wife. The purpose of the colony was not all religious. Trading and business were also the objects of those brave settlers, and some of the most successful merchant princes have sprung from that old Maryland stock, the best out of old England. The women of Maryland have been far famed for their beauty. There is good reason for naming the loveliest of climbing roses, Baltimore Bells. The best thing grown in old Maryland was its patriotism. When the fathers were signing the Declaration of Independence, the chief man from Maryland was Charles Carroll. 
as there was another charles carroll the hero in independence hall signed his name charles carroll of carrollton the patriotic spirit of the colony still lives in that song popular in all the states maryland my maryland End of chapter 31chapter thirty two of hero tales from history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b hero tales from history by smith burnham william penn the founder of pennsylvania when william penn was born his father admiral sir william penn was sailing out to sea on an English battleship. Little William's mother was a lovely woman from Holland, and as good as she was, beautiful. While in college at Oxford, young Penn attended Quaker meetings, which had been started by followers of George Fox, the founder of a religious sect, the Society of Friends, or Quakers, as they were commonly called. The professors in charge of Oxford University did not believe in such meetings, so they turned out of the college those who attended them. When William Penn went home, sent away from Oxford, his father was so angry that he gave his Quaker son a beating and drove him from home. Young Penn would have had to starve or beg in the streets but for his good mother, who sent and helped him secretly. Even after that, William was found at a Quaker meeting in London and put in prison for eight months. William Penn's father was a great man, a friend of King Charles I. When that king was put to death, Admiral Penn became the friend of Cromwell, who had fought against the king. After Cromwell died, the admiral attached himself to King Charles II and to the king's brother, the Duke of York, who afterward became James II. Although these four rulers were different, even bitter enemies to one another, shrewd Admiral Penn managed to keep the favor of them all. He was ambitious also, to have his eldest son become the favorite of kings. He allowed William to come home after he was free from prison in order to send him away to Paris, as he hoped the youth would forget his queer belief in the gay life there. The father asked the son's friends, who were sons of English noblemen, to influence William while in Paris to do everything that was against the Quaker belief. One day a stranger met young Penn in the street and picked a quarrel with him drawing his sword and challenging the peace-loving young man to a duel with swords penn was forced much against his will to fight he had always been an active youth and fond of sports while at college he had been very good at fencing by skillful play he disarmed the quarrelsome fellow and ended the duel without hurting the stranger as if it were all done in sport this pleased all who saw the sword play and it did credit to the heart as well as to the skill of the young Quaker. When William returned home, he was so handsome and had gained so much in courtly manners that his father was thoroughly pleased. But the great plague broke out in London then, carrying off nearly 70,000 people in that city alone. This frightened even the most worldly into leading religious lives and made William Penn's conscience trouble him. Repenting of his gay life, he finally joined the friends for good and all, and became one of their most earnest members and preachers. His father ordered him out of the house and threatened to cast him off utterly. William was now imprisoned in the London Tower because of something he had written against the Church of England. While in prison, he wrote No Cross, No Crown, and other works in defense of the Quakers. His father, whose heart was touched by his son's courage and unselfishness, appealed to the Duke of York, King Charles' brother, and got William out of the tower. Admiral Penn died soon after this, leaving William a rich man. The royal treasury owed him immense sums of money loaned to King Charles and his brother James. But young Penn was again arrested because he was a friend and imprisoned in Newgate, where the worst criminals were kept. When he was again set free, he began to seek some good place outside of England where he and his Quaker followers could serve God and their fellow men without being treated like criminals. Learning of a certain region in America, he went to King Charles and asked for it in payment of the large amount of money Charles owed him. As the king was still unable to pay the great debt in money, 
he was glad to grant Penn a charter for the vast tract of land. When Penn came before the king and the council to have the state paper signed and sealed, he did not remove his hat, as Quakers think it wrong to show such reverence to any one but God. King Charles allowed Penn to keep his hat on, but removed his own, to the astonishment of all, and said with a smile, It is the custom at court for only one person to remain covered. Penn suggested calling the tract of country they were ceding to him Sylvania, which meant forest land, but the king insisted on naming it Pennsylvania, or Penn Forest. This name was written in the charter, so William Penn had to abide by it, though he thought it vain to have the land name for himself. The religious leader was now happy in having a country where he and his people could live and love God and one another in their own simple way. Sailing across the ocean in his good ship, Welcome, Penn bought the country from its rightful owners, the Indians. He made a solemn treaty with them, which was never sworn to and never broken. No Quaker ever hurt or wronged an Indian, and no Indian ever injured a friend, though the red savages murdered settlers belonging to other religious faiths. William Penn laid out a town which soon became the largest city in America. For this place he made up a name, Philadelphia, composed of two Greek words meaning brother and love. Grand as it was to own such a great country as Pennsylvania, and to found a large and flourishing city like Philadelphia, it was even grander to teach people to live by the golden rule, and to help along religious liberty. It was most fitting that the Declaration of Independence should be adopted and signed in the State House of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, the city of William Penn. End of chapter 32「Chapter thirty three of Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Patrick Henry, the Firebrand of the Revolution. Pat Henry's a good-for-nothing fellow, just lounges about his father-in-law's tavern telling stories and fiddling. This was the verdict of the people of Hanover Courthouse, Virginia, when Patrick Henry was a young man. When he was but a youth, he had married the tavern keeper's daughter. He had tried farming and failed, people said, because he was too lazy to do anything but go a-fishing but he was a great reader and had studied law in a random, listless way. The door of opportunity opened one day before this young man of whom the neighbors had so little good to say. There was a case in court called the Parsons Cause. This famous lawsuit arose in the following way. An old law required each church in Virginia to pay its minister 16,000 pounds of tobacco as his yearly salary. Later, the legislature of Virginia passed another law which permitted each parish to pay its minister a smaller salary of money. The King of England set this law aside, and then the Parsons, as the clergy were called, brought a lawsuit to collect the unpaid parts of their salaries. Young Patrick Henry's sympathies were with the men who were sued, and he offered his services in their defense. When the people of Hanover Courthouse heard of this, they laughed as if it were a huge joke. The good for nothing, what can he do with this low tavern talk, they asked in scorn. His stories may do for a bar room, but for such a fellow to speak in such an important case will be an insult to the court. The courtroom was well filled on the day of the trial. The opposing lawyers had promised to make short work of Patrick Henry and teach him a lesson he would not soon forget. There was a strange stillness when the young man rose to speak. At first, he seemed unable to control his voice, and some of those present nudged each other and whispered, He's going to break down. I told you so. He ought to have known better than to attempt a big case like this. Then young Henry's will seemed to come to his rescue. He straightened up, his face flushed eagerly, his eyes blazing with indignation. His words soon came in a torrent of eloquence. He declared that the people of Virginia had the right to make their own laws 
and that if the king interfered, he was no longer the father of his people, but a tyrant whom they need not obey. The jury, carried away by the young lawyer's fiery appeal, decided that the Parsons should have only one penny more money. The people who had come to sneer now began to cheer. They carried the young lawyer out of the courthouse on their shoulders. That success showed that the near-do-well was really a great lawyer. After that, Patrick Henry spent his time in his law office instead of going fishing or loafing about the hotel. He studied to improve his mind and practiced in correcting his errors of speech while learning to make good use of his newfound gift of speaking in public. Honors were showered, thick and fast, on the fiery lawyer. Other cases were brought to him, and he won them right and left. Soon he was sent to the House of Burgess, or the Legislature of Virginia. When other leaders hesitated to take the steps necessary to obtain their rights, Patrick Henry did not falter. He seemed to see farther than other men into the future. He made the halls of the lawmakers ring for liberty, beginning his great liberty speeches ten years before the colonies were prepared to meet and declare their independence. When Virginians were sent to the first Congress of the United Colonies in Philadelphia, Patrick Henry was one of those chosen to go with George Washington and Richard Henry Lee. Here, in a fiery speech, Patrick Henry exclaimed, I am not a Virginian, I'm an American. He had to leave Congress before signing the Declaration of Independence. But soon after, he became the first governor of Virginia, which is now no longer a British colony, but a new state. He was four times elected governor of the state. Patrick Henry was the firebrand of the revolution. That is, his burning words spread like a prairie fire from south to north and inspired the people with a burning zeal for liberty which cannot be quenched till all 13 colonies had gained their independence and had become the United States of America. It has been said that Patrick Henry rocked the world with his voice. The best known of his speeches was made just a few weeks before the Battle of Lexington, which was the first skirmish of the Revolution. Here are the closing words of that great speech. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are ready in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it the gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. End of chapter 33 Chapter 34 Hero Tales from History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham, 1866-1947 Chapter 34 Nathan Hale, who spoke the bravest words in history. Nathan Hale was a country boy, the sixth of ten children. When he was twelve, his mother died. It had been her wish that Nathan should study to be a minister. So the lad entered Yale College when he was only fourteen. Young as he was, Nathan became president of the debating society. He was a big, strong, handsome fellow, full of fun and fond of sports. He was best at what was known as the broad jump. For many years the hail jump made the record for the college. He was a strong swimmer and excelled in shooting at the mark. In going about the college grounds, Hale was often seen placing one hand on top of a six-foot fence and vaulting over it with ease. One of his chums has told how Nathan would stand in one hogshead with his hands on his hips and jump up out of that into the second hogshead, then in the same manner 
leap into the third hogshead, and from there out on the ground, all without touching. His athletic feats were so wonderful that the boys used to boast of the things young Hale did for old Yale. When he was seventeen, the young athlete also showed himself such a ready and eloquent speaker that he was chosen for the highest honors of the debating society. One address of his is still kept in the records of Yale University. One of the questions he proposed and took part in debating was, Is it right to enslave the Africans? Right after his graduation, at the age of eighteen, young Hale began to teach school and do tutoring besides, to pay his way while studying to be a minister. But early in 1775, when he had been teaching less than two years, the news of the first battles in the War for Independence fired the fervent soul of the young patriot, and he joined the army. Nathan Hale was appointed lieutenant in a company sent by Connecticut, his native state, to become part of General Washington's army, which was trying to take the city of Boston, then in the hands of the British. The army then was without uniforms, proper arms, or training. During the summer, Lieutenant Hale turned twenty-one and was promoted to the rank of captain. When the time for which the Connecticut men had enlisted was nearly up, the young captain was shocked and hurt to find that some of the men in his own company were not willing to serve a little longer. Here is a short signed entry he made in his camp book in November. 28. Tuesday. Promised the men if they would tarry another month they should have my wages for that time. Nathan Hale. The youthful Connecticut officer and some of his men were among the few who stayed till the British were driven out of Boston by sea. After this, the commander-in-chief, foreseeing that New York must be the next point of attack for the British, sent all his soldiers on ahead to that city. In the first brigade to go was Captain Nathan Hale, with as many of his little company as he could command. While officers like Hale were recruiting new soldiers and drilling the raw recruits, Washington went to consult with the Congress then in session at Philadelphia. During this visit, he designed the first American flag and ordered it made. It was the summer of the Declaration of Independence. Washington and his untrained troops, less than 14,000 in number, had to defend and hold New York City, Brooklyn, and the surrounding country against an army nearly three times as large. The British troops under General Howe were well fitted out and trained, and were aided by a fleet of warships commanded by the General's brother, Admiral Lord Howe. The Howes and their regular soldiers thought it would be an easy matter for their army, numbering three to one of their enemies, to capture the American army and carry Washington and the other ringleaders of the rebellion back to England to be hanged for treason. When, late in August, Washington learned that Howe was landing his army on Long Island, from Staten Island, he sent General Putnam to meet and hold the British back. As the British outnumbered Putnam's army five to one, this was impossible, and the Americans retreated to their defenses. This engagement was called the Battle of Long Island. At nightfall, the British encamped around the cornered Americans, and the commander told his staff that they would take that nest of rebels in the morning. A dense fog came in from the sea, and Washington, under cover of it, got as many boats together as his sailor soldiers could manage, and they rowed away from Long Island in the silent watches of the night. Next morning, when Howe came to capture the nest, the birds had flown. Washington was now forced to fly with his army from place to place, and the danger of being captured was greater than before. 
so he needed to learn, if possible, what General Howe's plans were. Captain Nathan Hale was selected for this dangerous service. There were some people in the colonies who believed that Washington was a traitor and that his men were rebels. These people called themselves loyalists, but others called them Tories. Because of Nathan Hale's frank face and sincere manner, it was thought that he could make friends with these Tories and find out what was desired through them and their friends, the British officers. Also, he was an educated gentleman. He could take a position as tutor in the family of a rich Tory. British officers visited these loyalists and often discussed plans with them. Captain Hull, a college friend of Captain Hale's, was now an army comrade also. When he heard that Hale was chosen, he called to beg him not to go as a spy. He argued, "'Your nature is too frank and open for deceit and disguise.' General Washington, nor any commander, has a right to ask you to assume the garb of friendship for the betrayal of others. Hale hesitated a moment at this, but when he spoke his voice was clear and firm. I think I owe it to my country to do the thing which seems so important to General Washington, and I know of no other way of getting the desired information than by assuming a disguise and passing into the enemy's camp. But, urged his friend, almost in despair, think of the disgrace of it. If you were caught, you would be hanged as a criminal. Dear Nathan, I beg of you, don't go. Nathan Hale could not help being deeply moved. He said gently, He took upon himself the disguise of the men he came to live among, for the good of many and the cause of the right. He was arrested and hanged on a cross. Who am I that I should set up my judgment against his example and General Washington's will? Still, Captain Hull could not give up. He has left on record his last attempt to persuade the young man whose love of country had become a religion. I urged him for the love of country, for the love of kindred, to abandon an enterprise which would only end in the sacrifice of the dearest interests of both. He paused, then, affectionately taking my hand, he said, I will reflect and do nothing but what duty demands. He was absent from the army, and I feared he had gone to the British lines to execute his fatal purpose. Naturally, very little is known of the spy in the few weeks that followed. Sergeant Hempstead has told of going with him to the point chosen for crossing on a wading sloop to Long Island, many miles from the British camp. Hempstead says Hale was then dressed in a brown suit of citizen's clothes with a round, broad-brimmed hat. When the captain and the sergeant wrung each other's hands in farewell, Nathan Hale gave into Hempstead's care his private papers and letters and his shoe buckles. The letters were to Hale's aged father and to the girl whom he expected to marry. At the end of several weeks, Nathan Hale had succeeded in carrying out General Washington's instructions, even to making a number of sketches. So far as he knew, he had not been suspected, this, he thought, was rather surprising, for there were Tories everywhere. It was late in September, in the dark of the moon, when Hale slipped away from the British on Long Island and strolled down to the water's edge where he was to meet the sloop and sail back to his own army. He waited some time for the ship, but it did not come. After some delay, a sailboat came in sight and made up to the shore. He was greatly relieved, for it did not occur to him that there was anything wrong. As the boat drew near, he hailed it with a happy shout. When it was too late, Hale saw that some of the men in the boat were in British uniform. In a moment more, he was their prisoner. He had been betrayed. It was never known by whom. He had a Tory cousin who was blamed at first, 
but his innocence was proven in time. He was taken to General Howe's headquarters. The tell-tale sketches and data were found in his shoes. He did not attempt to deny that he was a spy. It was not necessary to try him after he confessed. He was turned over to the provost-marshal to be hanged next day. Of course, no one knows what Nathan Hale thought that last night, but it may well be believed that he did not waste his last hours in despairing regrets. If he was permitted to write farewell letters that night, they were never delivered. In the morning, Hale asked if he might speak with a minister, but that was curtly denied him. "'Will you lend me a Bible a moment, then?' was his dying request. "'No,' snapped the marshal. A kind-hearted British officer, who noticed the pure, honest face of the young American spy, offered him shelter from the sun in his tent during a brief delay. The heart of this enemy captain was touched, and it was he who preserved Nathan Hale's noble words for future ages. If the young spy could have known that his death would strengthen the hearts of patriots to fight for liberty, and that what he was about to say would go resounding down the ages, it would have added to his joy that hot September day. A poet has described the moment when they came and led him out. To drumbeat and heartbeat a soldier marches by. There is color in his cheek. There is courage in his eye. Yet to drumbeat and heartbeat in a moment he must die. They led him to an apple tree near at hand. While they were fastening his arms behind him and tying a rope around his ankles, he gazed up into the tree. On his handsome face rested the resigned expression which is shown in the bronze and marble statues of Nathan Hale in the Yale yard where he used to play and in the park before City Hall in New York. "'Well, have you any confession to make?' asked the marshal. This called Nathan Hale's mind back. He smiled at the needless question, for he had confessed the night before, and had thus made a trial unnecessary. Hesitating only a moment, he answered the officer with simple courtesy, in the bravest words ever uttered by mortal man, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. End of chapter 34《Chapter Thirty Five of Hero Tales from History》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B.《Hero Tales from History》by Smith Burnham. Lafayette, the Boy Hero of Two Worlds. In a great stone building among the tree covered hills in the south of France, there lived a little boy who at birth received fourteen names and titles. He belonged to the noble French family of the Lafayettes, who had been knights for at least seven hundred years. The boy never saw his father, for shortly before the child was born, his brave young soldier father was killed in a battle with the English. The home in which this fatherless boy lived was a castle, but it looked like a great prison or a modern storage warehouse with a huge round tower at each end. Across its few small windows were iron bars. Out of all the Lafayette's boys' names, the family called him Gilbert. When he was eleven years old, Gilbert was sent to a school in Paris, where sons from French gentlemen's families were taught the things it was thought proper for young nobles to know. First of all, they studied heraldry, which explained the coats of arms of their royal and noble relations, and was really a sort of family history of France. The boys also learned to ride and to fence and to talk politely, even wittily, if they happened to be bright enough. Besides their own French language, they learned Latin, so that they could write and even speak it. Then the youths who had a taste for history were instructed in that study, not the history of the whole French people, but the records of the royal and great families, and the battles and schemes of the kings and princes. In this boys' college the rooms were very small, dark and narrow, like prison cells, 
and the pupils were locked in at night gilbert was never allowed a holiday if his mother came to see him she was permitted to talk with him in the presence of a tutor almost as if he were a prisoner the masters feared that a good motherly chat with their son would distract the boy's mind from his studies madame de lafayette wished to do all she could to help her son in his future life so she moved to paris and was presented at court that is she was introduced to the king and queen and the highest nobles of france when gilbert was thirteen his mother died leaving her son almost alone in the world he had a rich uncle who might have been his guardian but he also died leaving young lafayette another fortune and making him a very wealthy marquis boys and girls in french noble families were often betrothed in infancy and brought up expecting to marry each other when old enough marriage seemed to be rather a question of the family fortunes than of the young people's real love for each other when young marquis de lafayette was left without parents to plan a proper marriage for him a rich duke who was a great favorite with king louis decided to arrange for the orphan boy to marry his own daughter adrian in order to bring this about adrian's parents invited gilbert de lafayette to come and live in their palace where they all could care for him as a son until it was proper for him to marry their daughter there was a wonderful wedding when lafayette was sixteen and adrian fourteen years old from that time besides all the wealth of the lafayettes the riches of his father-in-law the duke gave the young marquis a splendid position at the court of france if the boy bridegroom only had enjoyed that sort of high life he might have been very happy but the things which interested the young nobleman were of quite a different sort while he was at a dinner in honor of a younger brother of george the third king of england he heard that the american people had started their fight for independence lafayette's sympathies for the unhappy people across the sea were so aroused that he began at once to plan to leave his palace home his lovely young wife and his baby daughter in order to help the american people in their struggle to find out how best to do this he went to see dr franklin and silas dean the agents for the united states in france knowing how much the american people needed lafayette's money and influence these statesmen encouraged him in every way the young marquis fitted out a ship and made ready to start taking with him several frenchmen of high rank who also expected to be made officers in the american army but lafayette's father-in-law did not reach the idea of fighting for the common people against kings and nobles so he persuaded the king to order the marquis not to leave the country in spite of king louis's command lafayette walked on board his own ship under the detective's noses disguised as the body servant of a stranger from another country who also was going to fight for american liberty the marquis de lafayette reached the american army near philadelphia after many dangers and hardships general washington could not help smiling at the earnestness of major general lafayette age nineteen who could command only as much of the english language as he had learned while crossing the atlantic though the marquis has every one learned to call him volunteered to serve anywhere without pay washington offered him a place on his staff once when the commander-in-chief asked lafayette how to improve the discipline of the american troops the noble youth replied i am here general to learn not to teach general lafayette received his first wound in the battle of brandywine where he fought hard to keep the british back from philadelphia while riding his horse at the head of his men he was shot in the leg he recovered from his wound in time to come to valley forge and suffer with washington the hardships of the long bitter winter there while at valley forge the young general was sent to keep the british from coming out from philadelphia and attacking the american camp lafayette took his station at barren hill near the schuylkill river when the british commander had word of this he sent out three companies to surround the boy general from three directions and make him their prisoner so sure were they of making this capture that they planned a dinner in honor of their noble french prisoner and invited their friends in philadelphia to be present and meet the marquis de lafayette but the boy general was too shrewd for them all quick as a flash he saw a way out of the trap they had set for him ordering the heads of his columns to stand in the edge of a grove where they could be seen as if in battle array 
he ordered a retreat by a secret path when the three british lines marched up the hill even the americans in the edge of the woods had disappeared and the companies only met one another and looked sheepish as they marched down again their game had gotten away and they had to eat that dinner without their prisoner guest howe and his men soon heard that the french were sending ships and men to help their american friends so they went away from philadelphia as quickly as possible on the way to new york washington met them and gave battle at monmouth new jersey he appointed general lafayette second in command but general charles lee was offended because that french boy was placed above him to relieve his chief lafayette gave up the command this was the battle in which lee disobeyed washington's command and prevented the american army from winning a real victory it was lafayette who saw that something was going wrong and helped to save the day for the americans hearing of his wife's illness and his little daughter's death lafayette asked leave of absence to go home to france he returned to america as soon as he could after persuading the french government to send more money more men and more ships to help bring the long war with england to an end soon after his return the marquis was sent with his regiment to meet cornwallis and defend virginia cornwallis laughed when he saw that the boy had been sent against him but the boy was more than a match for the british commander in the south he kept retreating and advancing up and down the james river one day cornwallis would think he was trapping lafayette but the next day he found himself only moving farther from his base of supplies the boy did this just to gain time for he had learned that the expected fleet was in american waters with the french army on board and that washington was on his way down from near new york to meet the french ships and men and surround cornwallis it was now the british general's turn to retreat he retired to yorktown where he was surrounded by the americans and french and was soon forced to surrender as soon as the fighting was ended general washington gave a dinner to the french officers and their english prisoner lord cornwallis the defeated general was so well treated by washington and his men that the two commanders became good friends when the americans had gained their independence general lafayette returned to france where he was received as a hero even by the king whose command he had disobeyed by running away to help america the people were so fond of the brave young marquis that king louis appointed him a marshal of france though he was only twenty-four the french revolution soon broke out but it was very different from the american revolution because the people of france had the wrong idea of liberty they killed the king the queen and many of the nobles in a savage and cruel way they even imprisoned and put to death some of their early leaders who loved liberty but who were not willing to do such savage deeds to obtain it lafayette was one of the lovers of liberty who suffered much from the french people during the revolution because he did not believe in going to extremes washington and lafayette did not forget each other they wrote devoted letters to each other as if they were father and son the french nobleman named his son for washington who during the troublous years in france received and cared for the boy as if he were a grandson nearly fifty years after lafayette's first coming to america he made his fourth voyage to our country bringing with him his son george washington de lafayette he came at the invitation of president monroe and congress as the guest of the united states because of the enthusiasm with which he was welcomed all over the country his visit was remembered as one of the brightest times in the history of the united states one hundred and forty years after the marquis de lafayette's first coming to help america four millions of american young men were enrolled to rescue republican france from her brutal enemy a million soldiers had crossed the ocean and another million were on their way when a company of americans visited the last resting place of lafayette as they laid a wreath upon the tomb of the friend of america general pershing the commander of the american forces exclaimed lafayette we are here End of chapter 35chapter thirty six hero tales from history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rita boutros hero tales from history by smith burnham 
1866 to 1947. Chapter 36 The Immortal Reply of John Paul Jones Of the millions of boys who have had sea fever, perhaps none suffered with it more than John Paul, a bright, sandy-haired Scotch lad. His father was a gardener on the estate of a noble lord. John went to school but little, yet he studied hard while he was there. He had learned to sail a boat quite well when he had a chance, at twelve years old, to go to America as a cabin boy. When the owner of the ship soon after failed in business, John Paul entered the Royal Navy as a midshipman. He learned all he could in the short time he was a middy, but as his father was poor, he saw no chance to get ahead there. He left the Navy and found work on a merchant ship running between Scotland and the West Indies. Coming back from a voyage to Jamaica, the ship's captain and mate both died, and John Paul, though still a mere boy, sailed the ship home so he became a captain before he was twenty. In those days shipmasters treated their men roughly, and once young Captain Paul had to flog the ship's carpenter. The man died some time afterward of fever, and, to spite the young shipmaster, he claimed that he had been fatally injured by John Paul's cruelty. After that, on another voyage, the sailors mutinied, or turned against their captain, and tried to kill him. In self-defense the young master knocked the leader downstairs, and he died of the fall. The next time John Paul was heard from, he was living in America with a wealthy man named Jones. It was just at the beginning of the War for Independence, and the young Scotchman was so in love with liberty and the new country that he decided to become an American. In doing this, he took the name of his new-found friend, Jones. Instead of John Paul, the British subject, he now called himself Paul Jones, American. He went to the Congress in Independence Hall, Philadelphia, in May 1775, to offer his services. He was promptly given command of several ships to defend the colonies against Great Britain. The next year, the Declaration of Independence was signed. On the 14th of June, 1777, the Congress appointed him to the command of the American ship of war, Ranger. On the same day, the Congress adopted a flag and made this record. Resolved that the flag of the 13 United States be 13 stripes, alternate red and white, and that the Union be thirteen stars, white in a blue field, representing a new constellation. Captain Paul Jones had a silk flag made at once and raised it on the Ranger on the first birthday of the United States, July 4, 1777. The first voyage of this ship was to France, and the young United States captain announced to the French admiral, in the harbor he was about to enter, that he would expect the French fleet to salute the new American flag. After some delay, the French officer consented, and the ranger sailed into port between two rows of French ships of war, which had French flags flying, and French sailors and soldiers manding the yard-arms, and cannon booming all along the line, in honor of the stars and stripes. That was a great day for the United States, for this was the first time a foreign kingdom recognized the new Republic of America. France not only treated the United States as an equal, but she went to war with England and helped the Americans win their independence. Captain Jones was a little peppery man, and had been an American only two years, but he was trying to make up for lost time. He believed so much in the people's right to be free, that he considered being an American citizen the highest honor in the world. 
he begged the high french officials and dr franklin who represented the united states in france to let him take the ranger out and fight england all by himself the british had taken american prisoners and treated them as spies and traitors instead of as prisoners of war captain jones wished to capture some british prisoners and teach the enemy how prisoners of war should be treated when the americans in paris and the french tried to convince the brave little captain that it would be dangerous for him to go out with but one ship he replied that he liked nothing better than going into harm's way and he finally went he waited outside an english port till the warship drake came out the british commander stared at the new flag for he had never seen it before what ship is that he asked it is the american ship ranger someone on the drake made fun of the new flag saying it looked like a patchwork quilt very well retorted captain jones we will cover your union jack with it then the battle between the ranger and the drake lasted just one hour and four minutes when it was over the drake had lost her captain and first lieutenant and thirty-eight men killed and wounded while the loss on the ranger was only two killed and six wounded when captain jones returned to the shores of france he brought with him the drake as a prize with a goodly crew of british prisoners to exchange for americans as he had promised the stars and stripes were at the drake's masthead over the british flag there was no trouble then about saluting the american flag all france and america went wild over this victory in fact nearly every nation under heaven excepting great britain was greatly pleased with the escapade of brave little captain jones of course captain jones had just had enough to make him long to be going into harm's way on a larger scale but france now had her own troubles with england she needed all the ships and men she could raise to make a navy able to beat the big fleet great britain was getting ready for a great naval battle still captain jones would not be put off with dr franklin's help the french found him a poor old ship which they told him to arm and man and go ahead with jones did his best but the foundry did not fill his order for cannon and he was obliged to take some old guns which were too heavy for the positions he had to give them it was bad enough to be forced to fight the whole british navy with a poor slow rotten old hulk with out-of-date guns but the men he had to take to do the fighting were worse among them were portuguese and malays who could not understand orders in either french or english but worst of all there were a hundred or more english prisoners who would watch their chance to stab or shoot the few americans in command and surrender the ship to their own countrymen dr benjamin franklin's poor richard almanac had been published as a french book under the title of bonhomme richard or goodman richard so jones in compliment to his genial friend and helper named his newly made over ship bonhomme richard before he got this craft ready several french commanders and crews wished to join him these men were not capable commanders but they had better ships and crews than captain jones the one man best able to use them to advantage when jones started out with the richard he was followed by a sort of private fleet among which were the alliance and the palace the commanders of the other ships refused to obey orders unless they happened to feel so disposed most of the other ships got lost or started off like pirates after prizes for themselves so that when jones met the leading ships of the british there were only the richard the alliance and the palace left when the three ships came round a high point called flamborough head and saw there the british men-of-war serapis and countess of scarborough commander jones ordered the palace 
to engage the countess while he with the richard tackled the serapis the commander had one lieutenant richard dale an american who had escaped in the most mysterious way from an english prison without the heroic aid of this officer jones might have lost the day or the night for the battle did not begin until dark there were hundreds of people on the shore watching the fight at the very beginning they saw and heard the old cannon on the richard bursting and killing nearly all the gunners and powder boys serving them meanwhile the serapis which was a brand new ship with twice the number and weight of guns that jones had was raking the richard fore and aft and shooting great ragged holes in her sides the sea came pouring into the ship and the british prisoners came running up yelling frantically we are sinking by sheer force of will and fear of eye paul jones and richard dale drove those excited englishmen back into the hold to work the pumps as though they would pump the north sea dry jones sailed his ship close to the serapis intending to catch hold of its side with hooks called grappling irons this made it possible for the men on both ships to fight hand to hand the richard came alongside with such force that a spar which stuck out at the side called the jib boom was driven into the ropes which held the mast nearest the stern of the serapis called the mizzenmast the grip which captain jones now had on the serapis was like that of a boston bulldog who has an english mastiff by the throat if one ship went down the other would have to go too well done my brave lads we have got her now shouted jones and he ordered the sailing master to haul the richard's cable over and tie the jib boom of the serapis to his own mizzenmast when the cable caught and became tangled the master uttered an oath don't swear said jones calmly in another moment we may be in eternity but let us do our duty the ropes and spars of the two ships were now so tangled that the men in the top of the richard scrambled across into the rigging of the enemy like monkeys in two treetops in spite of all the captain's efforts the richard was now on fire in a dozen places the people on shore cheered for it looked as if the english were burning the pirate ship the master at arms hearing a report that the captain and dale had both been killed started with two others to surrender to the commander of the serapis all three shouting quarter the commander of the serapis hearing the cry asked jones if he was ready to give up no shouted the american commander i have not yet begun to fight by this time even the masts of the richard were burning but an american sailor saw a chance to do great harm to the enemy seizing a hand grenade or bomb he crept across the yard-arms of both ships and threw it down upon the deck of the serapis the bomb fell and burst on a train of gunpowder scattered by broken cartridges the flame blazed along past several of the big guns ending in a terrific explosion this turned the tide of the battle the americans swarmed on board the serapis and took possession of it the english commander surrendered by pulling down the flag of his ship in giving up his sword to jones he said with a sneer it is painful to me that i must resign to a man with a halter around his neck the american captain seemed not to notice the intended insult every american boy and girl has a right to be proud of paul jones for his noble reply sir you have fought like a hero the palace had captured the countess of scarborough after an hour's fighting the bonham richard when cut loose from the serapis sank to the bottom of the sea before the rest of the enemy's fleet could stop them jones and the commander of the palace sailed away with the serapis and the countess to a safe neutral port in holland 
The British now offered a reward of more than fifty thousand dollars for Captain Paul Jones, dead or alive. The people of Holland begged him not to fly the American flag, as there were two British fleets waiting outside that Dutch harbor to capture him. But Paul Jones insisted on flying the Stars and Stripes, not only in that port, but when he came out and ran the gauntlet of more than forty British men of war. He passed them all with colors flying and reached a French port in safety. Captain Paul Jones was one of the heroes of the world. The French made him a knight, and King Louis presented him with a magnificent gold-handled sword. The United States Congress voted him a gold medal in honor of his greatest victory, and passed a resolution commending his zeal, prudence, and intrepidity, assigned him to the command of a new ship of the line then being built, and proposed to create for him the rank of rear admiral, until then unknown in the American Navy. General Washington wrote him a letter of congratulation in which he said, You have won the admiration of the world. Thus the son of a poor gardener became our greatest naval hero in the war of the Revolution. But above all, the honors he received at home and abroad, this was Paul Jones' proudest boast. I have ever looked out for the honor of the American flag. End of chapter 36「Hero Tales from History」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wayne Cook « Hero Tales from History » by Smith Burnham General Marion, the Carolina Swamp Fox a hundred years ago, when boys had but few books of any kind, The Life of General Marion was their favorite book of adventure, because of its short stories of rare bravery and hairbreadth escapes. General Francis Marion, of whom the book tells, was a southern man, born the same year as General Washington, and a commander of some of the American troops in the War for Independence. During that war, when the British found that they could accomplish little in the northern states, they decided to carry the war into the south. Lord Cornwallis was the British commander. Under him, Colonel Tarleton was a cavalry officer notorious for bullying and cruelty who became a terror to the whole region. Another commander of British troops in the south was a former American general, Benedict Arnold, the traitor who joined the British after he had failed to deliver West Point into the hands of the enemy. General Horatio Gates was sent by Congress to defend the South against the British, but General Gates was not a great or brave commander. He was defeated by Cornwallis at Camden, South Carolina. He lost 2,000 men, and the rest of his soldiers were scattered. Because of this terrible defeat, the worst in the whole war for independence, the southern people were deeply discouraged. What was to be done? In the South there were many Tories, as the people were called, who believed that those who fought against England for liberty were rebels. Besides fighting in the British campaigns, the southern Tories went about in bands, shooting and injuring all the rebels they could. So the southern patriots gathered together in small companies to defend their families from the British and the Tories, and to prevent the British from capturing the whole southern country before Washington could send down a better general and another army. During the months after the defeat at Camden, the fight was carried on in what was called guerrilla warfare, guerrilla being Spanish for little war. Small bands of Americans hid in the woods and swamps, and when they caught the British off guard, suddenly pounced on them, taking or rescuing prisoners. The greatest leader of this kind of warfare on the American side was General Marion. These southern soldiers had very poor weapons, 
Most of their guns were the kind used in shooting birds and were loaded with shot instead of bullets. For swords, they had wooden-handled saws with the teeth ground down to a smooth edge. They had but little to eat, often only potatoes, which they could bake in the ashes of their campfires. Their horses, however, were the finest and fastest in all the country. Although these men had to deny themselves food and clothing, their horses were well fed and groomed, for often the master's lives depended on the fleetness of their steeds. And the horses sometimes acted as if they understood and enjoyed the terrible game of life and death their masters were playing. Some of the bravest men in the South, seeing no other way to save or to serve their country, came and offered themselves to General Marion to fight under the greatest hardships and risks in the most dangerous adventures. Among these was the famous Sergeant Jasper, who was one of the first to risk his life for the flag. Nine British ships of war attacked a fort in Charleston Harbor. They shot away the staff on which the American flag was flying, but Jasper jumped out, caught the banner before it touched the ground, and climbed up and nailed it in place while the guns were aimed at him as well as a starry ensign. While Sergeant Jasper was under General Marion, he was often sent out on scout and spy duty. He had a natural talent for disguising himself. He went once to visit a sergeant in a British regiment. While he was there, a number of American prisoners were brought in. Taking it for granted that a guard of ten British soldiers with these prisoners would pass a certain spring, Jasper left the British camp to obtain help. He found only one American who could go with him. The two hid themselves near the spring, surprised the ten redcoats, disarmed them, and then, with the former prisoners, marched gaily back to Marion's headquarters with the ten captured British soldiers. Once, when General Marion came to a river ferry, he heard that a company of ninety British regulars were taking more than two hundred captured Americans to the prison ship at Charleston. The prisoners already in the hold of the ship were starved and neglected. Besides, smallpox had broken out among them, and many of the best men among the patriots were dying of that loathsome disease. So General Marion ordered his men to ride through the darkness to the ford where the British and their prisoners had crossed the river a few hours before. Here they learned that the redcoats and their charges were going to stay that night at a country tavern called the Blue House. The Americans approached this place with great caution. When they came to a wooden bridge, they took horse blankets and laid them down on the bridge to deaden the sound of the horse's hooves. Before deciding how to make an attack, General Marion sent several scouts to find out the lay of the land. With tread ashore and silent as that of moccasined Indians, the scouts returned and whispered this report. The officers are carousing in the house. Some of the men are outside. Many of them must be asleep, as we could not get a glimpse of them. A few sentinels are lounging about without a thought of being attacked. Marion told his men to lie down under the trees for a little rest. Very early in the morning, when all the British, including the sentinels, seemed to be asleep, he roused the men and ordered the attack. The odds were over three to one against them, but Marion's men were used to that. They were taking a great risk, but there was much to be gained. Guns, equipment, and British prisoners who could be exchanged so as to release Americans from the prison ship. Best of all, each man of the thirty might be the means of setting ten other Americans free. When the men were well awake, General Marion sent a lieutenant ahead, directing him as follows. Take a few men with you, make a wide circle, and come in behind the house. Get as close to them as you can and wait till I give the signal. Then close in on them and see that no one gets away. We must make quick work of this. See that your gun's all right. To the men waiting with him, he said, Are you ready? Ready, sir, they whispered back. Come on, then, he commanded. Follow me. Don't make any noise. Don't speak. Watch me. Don't fire till I say the word. They crept around the blue house like Indians, testing every twig lest it snap, and feeling their way in the darkness. Suddenly a shot rang out in the early morning air. 
A sentinel on the other side of the house must have seen the lieutenant's men. The British soldiers, roused from a sound sleep, jumped about, peering this way and that in the darkness. No one knew what had happened or what would happen next. The officers came tumbling out, swearing and yelling. As the Americans came rushing in from all sides, shouting and shooting, the British thought they were attacked by an army instead of by thirty guerrillas. Marion's men grabbed the rifles of the British soldiers, shooting some and knocking others down. Some of the British shouted, Quarter! And General Marion ordered his men to stop firing. And there was a wholesale surrender, and the hundreds of American prisoners were set free. Many of them joined Marion's men. When the British saw how they and the prisoners had been taken in, ten to one, they looked sheepish. But the British leader, the bullying Colonel Tarleton, had made his escape. His motto seemed to me, He who fights and runs away will live to fight another day. He ran away at least, though he did not do any fighting first. Five months after the Battle of Camden, there was another battle at Calpins. The British Army, commanded by Tarleton, was only a little larger than the American. The Redcoats were so badly beaten that they lost over 900 men, and the American loss was only 72. One day, not long after, Tarleton was bullying a southern woman in her home, where he and some of his officers were quartered. There was, on the American side, a Colonel Washington, a distant relative of the commander-in-chief. In his insulting way, Tarleton asked when the lady said this officer was a relative of hers, What does this Colonel Washington look like? I've never had the pleasure of meeting him. You might have seen him, said the lady sweetly, if you had looked behind you at the Battle of Calpins. This polite way of calling him a coward made Tarleton very angry, but he was no match in wit for a brave and brilliant southern woman. Though many of the wealthiest people of the South were Tories, some of them were true patriots. A widow named Mott had just built a beautiful home on a hilltop, and had furnished it elegantly when the British decided that it would make a fine fort, and promptly took possession of it. General Marion and his guerrilla band surrounded the mansion, and told Mrs. Mott, who was then staying at a neighbor's house, that if he could set her house afire, he could smoke out the British and capture them. That woman patriot was glad to sacrifice her lovely home for the good of her country. So Marion burned down the mansion and made the Redcoats his prisoners. End of chapter 37「Chapter thirty eight of Hero Tales from History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham. Wolf and Montcalm, the Rival Heroes of Quebec. More than one hundred years after Champlain returned from France to his beloved Quebec, France and Great Britain were at war. In America, this struggle was called the French and Indian War, because the English colonists had to fight against the French and their Indian allies, who came down from Canada to keep the English out of the country along the Ohio River. In Europe this strife, in which several other nations took part, was known as the Seven Years' War. During this war, young George Washington was first heard of. He was sent into the western wilderness in the dead of winter to carry a message from the English governor of Virginia to the French commander at a fort in western Pennsylvania. A few years later, General Braddock came over with an army of British regulars to fight the French and their allies in the region where the young messenger had been. Major George Washington was on the English general's staff and saved many of the British regulars after Braddock fell, defeated, 
near Fort Duquesne, where Pittsburgh now stands. The British attacked the French also at Louisburg in Nova Scotia and at Ticonderoga near the southern end of Lake Champlain. But the most important point to attack was Quebec, the Gibraltar of America, which Champlain had built nearly 150 years before. The general then in military command at Quebec was the Marquis de Montcalm, a true Frenchman, devoted to his king and to his mother, wife, and children, from all of whom he was separated because of his warm love of country. In his frequent letters to his mother and his wife, Montcalm told all his troubles with the governor of Canada and the Canadian volunteers. He had brought from France to Quebec an army of regular soldiers. They looked with scorn upon the French-Canadian raw recruits, who seemed about as rude as their Indian neighbors. The Canadian governor, on his side, saw with jealous eyes the French Marquis who had come from old France to command the Canadian companies along with his own French troops. It needed rare tact and true love of country for Montcalm to keep friendly with the Canadian governor, who pretended to be the friend of the Marquis, while secretly turning everybody he could against him. When the general won a great victory at Oswego, hundreds of miles away, the governor, who was not there, wrote to his friends and the men over him in France about my victory and what I planned and I did with such great success. But though Montcalm wrote about his trials and troubles to his wife and mother, he managed to keep on good terms with the governor and to prevent an outbreak between the French regulars and the Canadian soldiers and Indian warriors. General Montcalm knew that the British would attack the French stronghold of Quebec. To keep this fortress at the narrow point in the St. Lawrence River might mean the saving not only of all Canada, but also of the French forts and territory along the Wabash and Mississippi rivers, more than a thousand miles away to the southwest. The fortress at Quebec seemed impossible to take, for it was on top of a high, steep cliff looking over the St. Lawrence. The lower part of the town lay along the level of the river far below, but the town would be of no use whatever to an enemy that could not take the fort, frowning directly overhead. It seemed that the only way this fort might be reached by an enemy was by way of the St. Charles River just below the town. Troops might be taken up this river and reach Quebec by going a long distance around back of the city. Montcalm had logs chained together, making a boom, and threw that across the St. Charles where it flows into the St. Lawrence. Then no ship or large boat could enter there and land soldiers behind the fort. Not only was the St. Lawrence River narrow at Quebec, but there were many rocks in the swift channel below, so that no ship without a skilled pilot could pass up to the town. Montcalm, however, wishing to make Quebec doubly safe, posted most of his army below the town to prevent the approach of the enemy. Meanwhile, William Pitt, the British Prime Minister, decided, as Montcalm had foreseen, that Quebec must be taken. Pitt made up his mind, also, that a young British officer named Wolfe was the right man to place in command of the British Army to capture the Canadian fortress. Wolfe's father had been a general, and from the age of sixteen the son had been a soldier. As a colonel under General Amherst 
at Louisburg, James Wolfe had shown himself so fearless as to be even rash, and so devoted to his duty that he seemed not to care for his own life. He was so daring and reckless that someone tried to warn the King of England by saying, That young wolf is mad. Mad, is he? snapped King George. Then I only hope he will bite some others of my generals. Colonel Wolfe was as keen and wise as he was brave. So the king appointed him general and commanded him to capture Quebec. James Wolfe was as devoted to his mother as Montcalm was to his. Even more so, for Wolfe had neither wife nor child to divide his affection. He wrote home often about his army life, his hopes, and his aims. With all his successes and honors, General Wolfe was a very modest young man. He sailed up the St. Lawrence with a small army, only 9,000 men. Of these, he wrote to William Pitt, Our troops are good, and if valor can make amends for the want of numbers, we shall probably succeed. To the astonishment of Montcalm and the French army and people, the British ships sailed up to the Isle of Orléans opposite Quebec, as if there were no dangerous rocks in the rapid river there. Wolfe had taken some Canadian pilots on board farther down the St. Lawrence, and had threatened to hang them if one of the ships ran upon a rock. Still, Montcalm told the people that there could be no danger. The hated English had only run into a trap. They could go neither upstream nor down, and when winter came, their ships would be frozen in the ice and become an easy prey. So the French general refused to risk an attack. He decided to play a waiting game and let time and nature fight for France. On the day when Wolfe's fleet arrived, a violent storm came up, and several British ships and floats were dashed on the rocks and badly damaged. After that, Montcalm sent out burning ships to set fire to the English fleet and destroy it. But Wolfe's men bravely towed the French fire ships out of the way, and the only men lost were the Canadian captain in charge of the fire ships and six of his sailors, who were burned to death. Next, Wolfe tried to enter the country on the Quebec side of the river, near the falls of Montmorency, where the water falls 250 feet over high cliffs. These falls are so beautiful that some of the English risked being shot by the Canadians in order to see them. The region between the falls of Montmorency and Quebec was so well guarded by French and Canadians that Montcalm was sure the English could never get behind Quebec. He sent word to the British general, You will no doubt demolish the town, but you shall never get inside of it. Wolfe answered back, I will have Quebec if I stay here till the end of November. But every English attack failed, and even the brave young commander became discouraged. He had never known good health, and he was now quite ill. When he was urged to attack the English general, and capture or drive him back, Montcalm said with a smile, Let him amuse himself where he is. If we drive him off, he may go to some place where he can do us harm but the French made another attempt to set fire to the British fleet with seventy rafts, small boats, and schooners. Again they failed, and the French themselves explained that this was due only to the courage of the English sailors, who swarmed out in little boats 
to fight the fire before it could do any harm to their fleet. In August, General Wolfe was ill in bed, and it was reported in the British Army that he was not likely to live long. But even while he was so ill, the young commander's one thought was the capture of Quebec. On the last day of August, he said to his physician that he now had a plan to carry out, if he could only live to lead his army in person. I know too well that you cannot cure me, he continued, but pray make me so that I may be without pain for a few days, and able to do my duty. That is all I want. In his letter to his mother that day, he wrote, The enemy puts nothing to risk, and I can't in conscience put the whole army to risk. He has wisely shut himself up, so that I can't get at him without spilling a torrent of blood, and that, perhaps, to little or no purpose. The Marquis de Montcalm is at the head of a great number of bad soldiers, and I am at the head of a small number of good ones, that wish for nothing so much as to fight him, but the wary old fellow avoids an action. Early in September, Wolfe seemed himself again, though he realized that he had only a few days to live. The French saw the British fleet pass their fort on the way up the river at night, although the cannon of the fort belched lightning and bellowed thunder at them. Montcalm wondered what the English were going to try to do, after all. "'They mean to land somewhere,' he said. Wolfe did mean to land somewhere, and that somewhere was the very place Montcalm did not dream of, a steep cliff back of the town. When anyone spoke of the danger of the capture of Quebec, the French general would shrug and smile and say, "'But the English cannot fly.'" One night, when it was very dark, sixteen hundred British soldiers came floating down the river in their ship's boats till they came opposite the town. Wolfe was with them in person, as he had hoped and prayed to be. As they were slowly floating, the young commander repeated the familiar lines by Gray. The boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, and all that beauty, all that wealth e'er gave, await alike the inevitable hour, the paths of glory lead but to the grave. I would rather have written those lines, he said with deep feeling, than take Quebec to-morrow. As their boats stole into the shore, a sentinel called out in French, Who goes there? France! answered a voice in French. What regiment? The Queen's! Again in good French, by a Scotchman who had seen service in France. A little later, another sentryman challenged them. What is that? The Scotchman whispered, Provision boats! Shh! The English will hear us! In this way they reached a point at the foot of the steep cliff. Twenty-four men started to climb up where it seemed impossible. As they kept on, others started up after them. Then came others, General Wolfe among the number. In a short time, quite a large company in red coats and scotch kilts had reached the top and dragged several small cannon after them. The French felt so safe from attack that the small guard on the Plains of Abraham, as the level top was called, was taken by surprise and easily overcome. An alarm spread. A Frenchman on horseback came dashing over to Montcalm's headquarters, gasping, The English on the Plains of Abraham! There was a great fight on top of that cliff. 
Wolf was seen here, there, everywhere. But before the British drove the French back, the young general had fallen, shot three times. Shall I go for a surgeon? asked an Englishman. There's no need, Wolf whispered. It's all over with me. A little later a man shouted, See how they run! Who run? repeated Wolf, opening his eyes. The enemy, sir, they are giving way everywhere. Wolf roused up long enough to send a brief order to the next in command, telling him just how to go ahead and capture the fort. Then he lay down wearily, smiling as he closed his eyes. Now God be praised, I shall die in peace, he said. The French hero of Quebec also was shot through the body in that last short fight. How long have I to live? he asked. Not more than twelve hours, said the surgeon in charge. So much the better, said the dying Montcalm. I am happy that I shall not live to see the surrender of Quebec. End of chapter 38 Recording by Rick Rodstrom Chapter 39 of Hero Tales from History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marilyn Rakes Hero Tales from History by Smith Burnham Daniel Boone, the Great Indian Fighter of Kentucky Of all the great American hunters, trappers, and Indian fighters, Daniel Boone was the leader. He was born in Pennsylvania but while still a boy, he moved with his parents to North Carolina. Besides learning to do farm work and help his father at the loom and the forge, the Boone boy found time for trapping, hunting, and learning the arts of a woodsman. Father Boone, though of Quaker descent, encouraged this son to go hunting and to learn the woodcraft of the Indians. When the lad was twelve, his heart was delighted by the gift of a light rifle from his sensible father. Of course, Daniel did not have much chance to go to school, but he acquired mathematics enough to fit him for the business of backwoods life and to make him a fair land surveyor. But he never had the gift of spelling. For many years a giant beech tree was pointed out where he had had a bear fight. It was a kind of monument to Daniel's poor spelling. In the bark, high on its trunk, he had cut these crooked letters. D. Boone killed the bar on this tree in the year 1760. Yet, although he did not spell even his own name correctly, Daniel Boone was one of the best educated of all the pioneers, for he had just the kind of knowledge that this country needed most at that time. When Daniel was 21, a call came to North Carolina for men to help the soldiers of General Braddock, who had been sent by the King of England to fight the French and Indians. The English wished to keep control of the country north and south of the Ohio River. Young Boone volunteered and was in the Battle of Fort Duquesne, when Braddock was defeated and killed, and when young Major George Washington led the colonial troops, who fought Indian fashion and saved a small part of Braddock's army from being killed and scalped. This fight proved a turning point in the life of the North Carolina soldier for he met in the ranks a scout named John Finley, who had been on a hunting trip in the wild country south of the Ohio. Finley drew a picture of this wild region that warmed the heart of Daniel Boone. One of the chief beauties there for the born hunter was that the Indians did not inhabit the country. They only went back and forth across it, so that they did not kill or scare away the game. Daniel went home to North Carolina and married a beautiful girl of seventeen, and they kept house in a cabin the young husband had built with his own hands. He lived there several years with his wife and little boy near his father's family, 
but he was restless, going on hunting trips farther and farther from home, until he had followed the game over the mountains into the regions of the Tennessee River. The friend of the French and Indian War, John Finley, came to visit the Boones one fall, and they made him stay all that winter. The call of the wild was too strong to let Boone stay at home long after that. In the spring, he and Finley, with four other men, on six horses, with bedding and a small cooking outfit on six pack horses, started off early one bright morning on their wonderful shooting and trapping trip. They were armed with hunting knives, tomahawks, and their trusty rifles. When they had crossed the mountains, they hunted the bear, buffalo, elk, and deer, and trapped little fur animals with such success that they soon had quite a fortune in furs. As they prepared to start east with these, a band of Indians appeared on the scene, broke up their little camp, and captured everything they had. The savages spared the white men's lives, but they made signs that they would kill them all if they found them there again, and they took Boone and another man prisoner. The rest of the party, badly frightened, took up their weary march for home, empty-handed, Boone and his companion, when they escaped, only went far enough to make the Indians think they were also afraid. Then they came back and hunted alone in all that wild region. After long, lonely months, Boone's brother came and brought gunpowder and supplies, and the Boones hunted and trapped there two years longer. They started home with a rich store of furs, but some Indians came along and robbed them again. The red men afterward killed the brother, but Daniel after hairbreadth escapes, reached North Carolina safe and sound, but poorer than when he went away. Still, Daniel Boone was rich in wood lore and Indian craft. He gave such attractive accounts of the beautiful country and the chances to get rich quickly that quite a number of heroic people were persuaded to go back with him and settle in the land. He started over the mountains again with ten in his own family, besides neighbors and friends. No one could have followed the way but a cunning scout like Daniel Boone, to whom every leaf, every sound, every mark in the earth had its own secret message. During the journey, the party were attacked by Indians, and Boone's eldest son, a lad of seventeen, was killed. This experience discouraged the others, and they tried to induce their leader to go back with them. He sturdily refused, saying, There are nearly a hundred of us. We can beat the Indians yet. Nevertheless, it seemed wiser to wait a while before pushing on across the mountains, so they went back a little way and settled for a year or two on a little mountain river. By this time, many people in the Carolinas and Virginia had heard about the promised land of Daniel Boone. He was engaged to mark the way or blaze the trail through to Kentucky. This trail was afterwards traveled so much that it was called the Wilderness Road. Taking thirty men with him, Boone once more set out on the way to settle Kentucky. They came to a halt in the heart of that country and built a stockade on the Kentucky River. This enclosure, a little longer than a square, with a fort at each of the four corners and eight smaller cabins in the space inside, was surrounded by a high fence of sharpened logs standing upright. To this strong stockade the rest of the party gave the name of Boonesboro, in honor of the Kentucky pioneer. Later, Boone returned for his family and brought them to their new home. Many and exciting were the adventures of the settlers. One afternoon, two girls went out canoeing on the river with the daughter of Daniel Boone. When the three girls had passed a bend in the river and were too far away for their shrieks to be heard at the fort, a fierce-looking Indian sprang out from the bushes on the farther bank and pulled in their canoe. Other savages stifled the girls' cries and plunged with them into the darkening forest. Before long, the absent ones were missed and the alarm was given. The empty canoe was found and a search party was formed, led by the fathers of the missing girls. The hunt lasted two days and two nights. On the morning of the third day, the anxious fathers saw smoke rising from an Indian camp. As the camp was over fifty miles from Boonesboro, the savages had become careless. Boone and two other men crept up near the camp and shot the two Indians guarding their three white captives. The other red men jumped and ran for the woods. The happy fathers and their friends returned to their anxious families at Boonesboro with the daughters unhurt. While Washington and his little armies were waging the war for independence along the eastern coast, 
Daniel Boone and his pioneers were fighting just as bravely for their country. Though they did not realize it then, the backwoods territory formed by far the greater part of the future United States. Boone was the leader who remained on guard while others did the things which are often described in the history of the country. He helped the pioneers with his advice and defended the families of the men who went out and fought in the historic battles. One reason why the Indians feared and revered this white chief was that Daniel Boone, as if by magic, had often escaped death at their hands. But once his good fortune seemed to fail him. Near Boonesboro was a salt lick or a spring of salt water, where salt was left spread around the spring like frost or a white powder on the ground. Deer, buffalo, and other animals often came there to lick up the salt, and pioneers often hid nearby and shot them. Boone and thirty men had come from the fort to gather a supply of salt to have on hand in case they should be attacked by Indians. Boone and his men were surrounded and captured, and as this was during the War for Independence, they were taken to Detroit to be dealt with by the British Governor Hamilton. On the way through deep snows and zebra weather, they were all in danger of starving. At a solemn council, some of the Indians proposed to get rid of their prisoners by torturing and burning them to death. There were one hundred and twenty of the savages, and the vote stood fifty-nine for the killing to sixty-one against. There was no doubt that the Indians' regard for Daniel Boone saved the lives of all those white men. Though this seemed to have been done by a single vote, it was a strange thing that sixty-one hostile savages were willing to keep alive and feed their prisoners at the risk of starving themselves. At Detroit, Hamilton offered the Indians five hundred dollars if they would let Daniel Boone go free, as he wanted to use him as a British scout. The savages refused and took him to their cheap village in the Ohio country. Boone knew their language, but he pretended not to understand a word they said among themselves. He seemed to be very fond of their mode of life and acted pleased when they told him they were going to make him a chief. He won their goodwill by not wincing when they tortured him to see if he could prove himself worthy of that great honor. The white chief was the best marksman in all the tribe. When they let him go off hunting by himself, they counted the bullets and measured the gunpowder they gave him. But he cut the bullets in two and used very small charges of powder, thus saving nearly half to use when he should find a chance to escape. Hearing the others talking of an attack they were going to make on Boonesboro, he slipped away one morning while out hunting, when he would not be missed till night. Not daring to shoot game for food, nor wishing to waste time to dress and cook it, he was nearly starved when he reached the Kentucky Fort, after going 160 miles through a region full of hostile tribes. The Indians must have wasted many days searching for him, as it was six weeks before his adopted tribe and other savages arrived at Boonesboro. Daniel Boone held the fort for ten days, with fifty white men and boys and twenty-five women and children, against four hundred and fifty red men. Several times the Indians set fire to the fort, but the brave white men put out the fire at great risk to their lives. The Indians tried to tunnel under the log fence, but the cunning white chief met and beat them back at every point. At last the savages gave up the fight and slunk away. Now that so many settlers had moved to Kentucky, the old hero found that country too crowded to suit him, so he and his family moved to a wilder region on the Missouri River, to find elbow room, he said. After hundreds of thrilling adventures and narrow escapes, the Indian hunter died in bed with his wife and three children around him. A friend who was near him in his latter days said of Daniel Boone, Never was old age more green, nor gray hairs more graceful. End of chapter 39